introduction. Um, we'll do a quick round the room of the uh, round the room and the virtual room for the COSA members introductions, uh, and then I will ask speakers to introduce themselves uh, when they present. And I will also ask any participants that are not on the agenda, <coughs> excuse me, to introduce themselves the first time they speak as well. So with that, Scott and Rod, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Stacy, uh, and welcome everyone, uh, both those of you joining us online and those of, you, those of you in the room. We have a big turnout today, which is very gratifying. Uh, after not getting together for so long during the COVID period, it's it's great to see so many old friends and and uh, and new ones, and and we have a I think an exciting and important agenda to tackle the next two days. So it's it's great to have folks here together for that. So uh, my name is Scott Cameron. I'm a geologist. Um, I've been uh, uh, volunteering, I guess for COSA since its inception. Uh, and and uh, first as uh, an observer for the Board of Earth Science and Resources, and then as a member for the last six years. Uh, this is my swan song. It's my last meeting. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, enjoy the chance for interaction with you all. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to some uh, productive, constructive conversation. So over to my good friend, Rod. Hi, everybody. My name is Rod Mather. I'm an a underwater archaeologist at the University of Rhode Island, and I'm also co-chair of COSA and also leaving um, COSA, um, sadly. <coughs> of, uh, and this is my last meeting. Um, I, too, would like to welcome everybody and thank you all for joining us. And I'd uh, particularly like to thank the folks in Boehm who have helped put the meeting together, of course, particularly Jennifer Bravo, and thank you all to, uh, also to the National Academy staff, and particularly Stacy and Jonathan Eric, for all your hard work um, in organizing the meeting. And thank you to the fellow COSA members um, for all your work and insights. They are um, very valuable, and we know your time is very valuable, so, so thank you all very, very much. Um, uh, we're particularly grateful to um, our, the colleagues from NOAA that's going to be joining us today and tomorrow and invited yeah. expert guests yeah. um, for assisting us with your knowledge and with your wisdom and, of course, to everybody else that's joining us as well. Um, we are looking forward to two days of very interesting um, meetings and discussions. Um, we've got a kind of um, mouth-watering series of dis discussions lined up. This are, um, today we'll spend much of our time talking about De Boehm's new jurisdictions and expansions into US territories and what that means for science and assessment. And this afternoon we will hear about the connections between science and assessment with, in Boehm, and that's a subject that COSA has been interested in for, for several years. Um, Boehm funded a study to help better understand that relationship between and the feedback loop between the studies program and the assessments program. So we'll be looking forward to learning a lot about that. Um, a number of us on COSA have been very keen to um, get an update on DEI and JEDI um, initiatives and progress in Boehm. And we will hear about those important subject matters this afternoon as well. And then very briefly tomorrow, we'll discuss multiple uses and spatial conflicts within Boehm and have experts from inside and outside the agency to help us. And at the end of the day tomorrow, we will um, uh, have a presentation on Boehm's mechanisms for science coordination and funding. So again, um, it sounds like a very interesting couple of days and welcome everybody and particularly thank you to those folks that helped put this together and to get us where we are now. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and um, get us started with some committee introductions. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and do it in alphabetical order by last name for those that are in the room and on the line at the same time. So um, we will start, we've heard from both of our chairs. Thank you, Scott and Rod. We'll turn to Jack next. Hi, everyone. I'm Jack Barth. I'm a physical oceanographer at Oregon State University. Thanks, Jack. And then we'll go to Rona. Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm Rona Cox, and I'm a geologist and coastal geomorphologist at Williams College. Thank you. Jeremy? 
good morning, Jeremy Firestone. I'm a social scientist from the University of Delaware, and just would like to say, Rod and Scott, you're welcome back, as far as I'm concerned, anytime. James? I'm James Flynn. I'm an atmospheric scientist at the University of Houston. And Katrine, for whom it's still quite early. <laughs> yeah, hi, I'm Kitchen Eichen. I'm with the University of Alaska Fairbanks and I'm a marine biologist. Thanks, Katrin. Les? I know we had Les on the line. Les, are you on the line still? Yeah. All right, we'll come back to Les if we are able to get him. Um, is Kelsey on the line? Let me see. All right. Carrie? <laughs> I remembered this time. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, Carrie Pomeroy, uh, University of California at Santa Cruz Institute of Marine Sciences. Uh, I am a research social scientist and adjunct faculty with the Coastal Science and Policy Program there. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, Kevin? Hi. Good morning, everyone. My apologies for not being able to uh, attend, but uh, COVID had a little something to do with that. So uh, I'm Kevin Stokesbury. I'm uh, the Dean of Science, uh, uh, the Dean of, for the School of Science, uh, Marine Science and Technology at the University of Massachusetts, uh, Dartmouth. And I'm a, by training a fisheries oceanographer and marine biologist. Thank you all. Thank you, Kevin. And for those that don't know, Kevin will be um, elevating as our next chair. For COSA once our uh, two fearless leaders rotate off at the end of this calendar year. Um, and last but certainly not least, Lori. Morning, everyone. I'm Lori Suma, um, geologist, retired from ExxonMobil, uh, currently adjunct at Rice and UT Austin. Thank you, Lori. Excellent. So I think we'll um, go ahead and get started with our program today then, and um, really appreciate those that are on the line to join us and in the room as well. We're gonna start um, by a discussion of BOEM's recent expansion of jurisdiction into the territories. Um, and uh, Ariana, do, are we ready to kick off? Excellent. So we'll start with Ariana um, and then we'll also be hearing from Mike Rasser, Brandon Jensen and James Morris today. Um, and if you'll just introduce yourself before you start speaking. Absolutely. So my name is Ariana Honeycutt. I am in the policy group in the Office of Renewable Energy Programs. Um, I have worked with some of you in the past in my previous role when I was known as Ariana Baker. So uh, if the name sounds somewhat familiar, that's because I have engaged with some of you folks at the National Academies before. So um, my uh, presentation will be rather brief because the science is far more interesting on this. I'm just going to be speaking essentially to Boehm's process. So if we can go ahead to the next slide. Uh, so because I'm a policy person, I'm starting with jurisdiction. Our jurisdiction comes from the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act and the Energy Policy Act of 2005, which essentially states that for the Outer Continental Shelf, we do have the authorities to conduct offshore renewable energy leasing, the focus of which commercially worldwide for a long time has been wind. So you can go ahead to the next one. So the big news and the reason why we're here today is because the Inflation Reduction Act did give BOEM new authority to issue leases, easements, and right-of-way offshore the U.S. territories, expanding the definition in the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act of the Outer Continental Shelf to include those territorial waters. And just for a quick rundown of what that specifically means, it is the territories of Puerto Rico, Guam, American Samoa, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. So it gives us the authority to lease in those listed territories subject to several conditions. The first of which is that a sale in the area is feasible. A sale can actually occur um, there is sufficient interest in leasing the area, so that is commercial viability of that lease, that if we do send it up to auction, there is a good chance that that lease will sell. 
and also that the secretary has consulted with the governor or governors of the territory or territories regarding the suitability of that area for wind leasing. So that is more of the process part that I'm going to focus on today before the other folks get into the science. All right, next slide. So I did list out all the US territories that we do have the authority to do leasing with. And as you'll note, most of them are fairly small populations. And for commercial scale offshore wind leases, such to the point that BOEM looks at them, we do look at larger plots of the outer continental shelf generally. So there does need to be a sufficient energy demand to provide for that offshore wind resource. Accordingly, in the Caribbean, we also have two U.S. territories that directly neighbor each other in the Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. So that expands the realm of the area that we could look at for potential offshore wind leasing, in addition to knowing that we have a certain demand. So there you see the combined outer continental shelves of Puerto Rico and the United States Virgin Islands. I will note um, that our authority does not begin uh, at the seaward boundary, it begins at the territorial waters boundary. So for Puerto Rico, that is three marine leagues or nine nautical miles. And for the US Virgin Islands, our authority starts at three nautical miles. As I said, I'm moving through this pretty quickly. <laughs> so this is what we casually refer to as our rainbow graph. It is an overview of the entire offshore wind leasing process. So one of the specific items that's called out in the Inflation Reduction Act is that it does give the Department of Interior a mandate to investigate leasing options, specifically to publish a document known as a call for information and nominations, and to publish that initial call no later than September 30th, 2025 that the Secretary of the Department of Interior will issue that call. So you'll see within our process, that is very, very, very close to the beginning of the timeline. It's a very early stage process that we have to complete within the next about 22 months. All right, uh, next slide, please. This expands our commercial lease sale process a bit. Uh, so you can see a bit more of it. The request for interest is something that we may or may not do depending on the feedback that we see with the government. Uh, but for the most part, where our process begins is you'll see in the bottom left corner there in very small text <laughs> is potential task force meeting. So it does begin with the formation of a task force, which includes the consent and engagement with the governors of those territories previously with the governors of the states that we've engaged with. And it's a intergovernmental renewable energy task force. So it is focused more on government parties as members rather than um, non-governmental entities. But that said, they are invited fully to participate in the process, any NGOs or academies or any other uh, relevant parties that want to have their voices heard. They're welcome to attend the task force meetings. Um, and we try to make our public process as accessible as we can to make sure that those voices are incorporated into the process. So this is just a very, very broad view of what our process looks like. And you'll see everywhere where there's a group of um, disembodied people at the bottom, that is a comment period that is associated with a Federal Register publication. So there's a request for interest, call for information and nominations, area identification, and proposed sale notice. Those are all include public comment periods. That said, as I said earlier, we don't always decide to do a uh, request for interest. It depends on how we want to approach the leasing strategy, but we will do a call for information and nominations should we proceed to this area. So you can see it's a long process, but finally at the end, which um, my colleagues will get to, if we can go to the next slide, there is a parallel process that goes on to it. So of course, we're not just seeking public comment on whatever we publish. One of the major things that we look to for the public is marine spatial information. So 
Brandon and Mike and James can all talk further in depth as to what the meat of that process looks like in processing and soliciting marine spatial information, but it is built in to go along that whole paperwork exercise that I previously demonstrated in the rainbow chart. So that is all I have for the moment. I told you it would be quick, uh, but thank you for having us here today. Thank you, Ariana. And um, I think after each person speaks, we'll have time for maybe one or two quick clarifying questions, but we will also have time um, following this session for a more open discussion. And um, maybe I can take uh, the prerogative here just to ask a quick clarifying point. Uh, your presentation laid out the process for wind energy leasing uh, and um, I just want to be clear that the actual expansion of jurisdiction includes the authority to create easements, right of ways, leases for not just wind energy, but can you kind of draw the distinction for us about where um, and how that sort of maybe priority got uh, established and whether that's in the IRA or Yeah, otherwise? so it's it's offshore wind. It's actually not specific in the IRA to um necessarily offshore wind leases, but it is where our focus is. So, and it's offshore wind leases and all appropriate right of ways, easements, appearances necessary to get the power from the lease on the outer continental shelf into, ooh, I'm sorry, into shore. So that does include the cable routes. And thank you for that question. That is a really important clarifying point because one of the things that we very often solicit information on is, are there any features that are incompatible with cable laying between the lease and shore? Just as a follow-up, and then I'll turn to you, Scott and Rod, because I know he's got his hand up as well. Um, hypothetically speaking, would marine minerals or traditional oil and gas development also be within your expanded jurisdiction? So I cannot speak on that as not my specialty. I do not believe it is within that definition, but that is outside of my expertise. Excellent. Thank you. Bill, is that in response to my question? Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Let me try to help. And uh, well, first of all, the uh, uh, the amendment to the definition of the, the Outer Continental Shelf is is broad. It's it's territories. They're EEZ, and uh, I th I, th I personally think the more straightforward reading of it is it covers all the U.S. territories. There are fourteen that are undisputed, but there's some discussion within the Interior Department about about that. Um, there is, as Ariana said, there's a mandate uh, to move forward with offshore wind for the five. Uh, territories that have basically that have populations, civilian populations and governments. And in the Pacific, in addition to the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, it's American Samoa, Guam, and the Northern Mariana Islands. The uh, the uh, IRA specifically prohibits inclusion of the, the five uh, in the, the oil and gas leasing program, but otherwise it's silent. <laughs> So if, if 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 the final sort of conclusion is that all the territories are uh, are included, then uh, then critical minerals would potentially be included, and actually so would oil and gas, except for those five. Although there's doesn't appear to be any oil and gas resources that are significant in in, in the other nine. And and uh, as Ariana said, the uh, BOEM is focused like a laser basically on offshore wind for those uh, those five and and uh, and also this focusing the science program you know largely on that as well oh and I'm Bill Brown for the uh, the chief environmental officer bone thanks for that uh, excellent overview of, of, of uh, how the uh, IRA impacts what you're going to be talking with us about today uh, I have a question about Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands in particular. You showed us a map as I, uh, of the area. Can you put that back up again? That as long, is that possible? Uh, as I as I recall, um, the uh, 
territorial waters of the Puerto Rico extend out to the three league line or pretty close to that. So it's it, 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 different than the rest of the, the other states in the U.S. Uh, that who's who's going to be actually responsible for that very shallow water uh, part of the uh, um, territorial waters in terms of potential wind development? So I can actually provide a direct example of that. Um, I cannot speak. I know that the territories do uh, operate slightly differently jurisdictionally with engagement with the federal government. But uh, in Rhode Island, for example, the Block Island Wind Farm, that was built within state waters. So for there, the lead permitting authority for the federal government was the Army Corps of Engineers. Boehm had a extremely limited role, and the only location where Boehm did have a role is when a offshore wind cable went between Block Island and mainland Rhode Island and passed through federal waters. So okay. if the territories did elect to build within um, their own territorial waters, that would not be our role unless it did exit that three marine leagues. So, so the, re the reason I'm asking about, uh, in case of Puerto Rico, as this bathymetric map shows is that uh, on here, you got some bathymetric contours, is that most of the shallow waters, in fact, essentially all of the, almost all of the shallow waters mm -hmm. are in the territories, territorial limits. The, air, the, the stuff that is uh, proven conventional development technology right now, less than 60 meters. Everything else, I think, uh, is in, in deeper waters or look an awful lot of it. So does that mean that uh, you're not you're not going to be holding lease sales in the territorial waters? The only or in, in the state in the yeah. Commonwealth administered waters, only in the in the stuff beyond the three three league line. That's correct. We do not have the authority to okay. hold an offshore wind lease unless any um, activity is occurring right. outside of those territorial waters. Okay. That it would be our only tie into the project. And to further that, one of the first listed conditions that I did state in the Inflation Reduction Act is whether or not a wind lease sale in that area is feasible. And that does include technical feasibility. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So we are Got still it. evaluating floating as okay. technical platforms for feasibility in the future. And that would need to be what it would need to be here, most likely. Um, I can't envision bottom founded foundations to that water depth, but uh, Very expensive. Yeah, yeah, it, it'd be quite a quite an activity. Yeah, and just to reinforce what Ariana said, that the 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 Inflation Reduction Act expressly uh, does not uh, 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 provide authority to the secretary for areas that have been transferred to the territory. So it's you know it's their job. Thanks, Ariana, for that overview. Um, I, I I don't think I heard it, but maybe I just missed it. I want to go back to the task force just very briefly and talk about the intergovernment um, consultations. Do, does does that include consultations with tribal governments? There is a formal consultation process that we do have with tribal governments, um, and. I'm not the administrator of that, so I don't necessarily want to speak inelegantly as to what that process looks like. But yes, we do. Um, we do. So from a legalities perspective, um, the tribal governments of Puerto Rico are not listed tribes that the Department of Interior does engage with. Um, I believe actually it's limited to the lower 48 is the listed tribes, isn't it? <laughs> yes, please, Bill. You are, you're <laughs> yeah. the better speaker on this. No, item. it's not that. I was the tribal liaison officer myself for a few years and and uh, and, and, and still involved. The uh, But it, I think it's, Ariana was getting there. It's, uh, we have a formal responsibility, as I think everyone knows, for government to government consultation with federally recognized tribes. There are 574. Uh, they, they, there are quite a number of them in Alaska as well as the lower 48. But there, but as Ariana was saying, there's there there are no federally recognized tribes uh, um, in any of these territories, actually. Uh, but having said that. Uh, you know, the general approach of BOEM and the department as well is to consult with, uh, you know, a broad array of 
of, of uh, those who are the groups that are interested in communities and certainly including indigenous people in the uh, uh, in the territories and and Guam and the Virgin Islands. I'm not an expert on what's there. Maybe Rod is, but uh, but there are uh, like there's the Taino, for example. Uh, there are certain groups that I that I'm I'm sure we'll take a look at and try to reach out to. Sorry, I thought the Taino had a a, a government. I thought that they was a. Oh, well, that's good to hear. So it'll make it it'll make it easier to reach out if they do. Excellent. Thank you, each. Thank you, Ariana. We're going to keep moving, um, and I'll turn next to Mike Rasser. Mike, if you'll introduce yourself. Um, and I don't know if uh, you and Brandon and James are planning to uh, present together or separately, um, but if you'd each like to introduce yourself first, um, that's fine. Or if you'd like to um, introduce yourselves between your separate uh, speaking, that's fine too. Whatever makes the most sense from your perspective. Yeah, can folks hear me okay? We can, thank you. Great, so I think uh, we could start, I, you know, interruptions first makes a lot of sense. So. Um, hi, folks. Some you know me. I'm Mike Rasser. I'm a marine ecologist in the Office of Environmental Programs, and I'll hand it off to uh, Brandon. Hey, good morning, everyone. It's nice to be here. Thanks to the committee for allowing us an opportunity to provide an update here. I'm Brandon Jensen, fisheries biologist with the Environmental Branch of Renewable Energy within OREP, Office of Renewable Energy Programs in BOEM. Um, I largely work on um, essential fish habitat and benthic fisheries interactions uh, uh, as my day job. Uh, part of it also includes uh, quite a bit of work with our partners at NCOS on planning that we've done in the Central Atlantic, Gulf of Maine, um, and now in the U.S. territories. So, uh, James, maybe you want to introduce yourself and then we can get into our presentation. Yes, hi, everyone. Uh, James Morris with NOAA's National Ocean Service. And I look forward to sharing more with you today. Uh, thanks, James and Brendan. So I could uh, I can get started here. So um, yeah, so uh, Ariana gave a great overview of the jurisdictional changes that have occurred, and uh, you know my goal here I only have three slides is to give just a high level overview of um, some of the science in general and uh, some of the challenges that we have as a program. So um, as I think all the committee members know that you know BOEM has an environmental studies program that, that's where I sit, and we provide information to predict, assess, manage, mitigate impacts for things like renewable energy. And so with the new jurisdiction under DRA, uh, the ESP will be, will be leading research um, in the US territories um, to support renewable energy projects, uh, specifically offshore wind. And um, we've been given the guidance that, that initial focus is gonna be on the US Caribbean. And so we're, we're currently uh, working on identifying research needs and developing approaches to best address those needs. We'll talk just a bit about that. And we're also um, beginning a collaboration with uh, with NOAA and COS for a biogeographic assessment. And um, later, James will provide some more detail about the noaa bohm relationship for marine spatial planning and, and, and a bit about what that biogeographic assessment involves. It's kind of a first step. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, you know, I, We've been uh, communicating among our scientists, and there's obviously a long list of science needs. And this is so this is not comprehensive, but um, just some ideas about things we've discussed. Um, social science research. We know that fisheries and tourism are going to be really important, as well as um, storm impacts, things like hurricanes. Um, the view shed is always important. Uh, you know, especially when it comes to things uh, like cultural resources and tourism. Uh, socioeconomic impacts. So hopefully, for example, renewable energy could provide employment, it could provide uh, greater access to reliable, accessible energy. Um, I already mentioned tourism, uh, just sort of knowing where, where the important areas are for tourism and, and, and uh, how, to, how to address that. Uh, physical oceanography, so things like um, hydrogenic modeling of uh, impacts for larval dispersal, um, cultural and traditional properties. And um, of course, distribution of the marine resources. So things like where the sensitive habitats or where are the avian uh, resources, where are the birds, is there any hotspots? So, so in general, those biological and physical resources, as well as the human use of the ocean. Uh, next slide, please. 
So uh, one of the challenges that we have is that, um, you know, BOEM, we need to rapidly gain knowledge of bell capacity. So the, uh, the Caribbean and the U.S. Territories in general is an area where we don't have a lot of, we haven't worked before. And so we're um, working on some different approaches, thinking about how we can better do that. And I'd love to hear ideas from uh, the committee on, on if they have any as far as how to approach this and uh, how to collaborate with local scientists. Um, just some of the things we've discussed. Um, one of them is uh, we're really keen to use cooperative agreements with local institutions. And so um, we're considering using, uh, issuing a notice of funding availability to do studies through the South Florida Caribbean Ecosystem Studies in CESU. And so that would allow us to really uh, you know, put a call out for, for studies and information that would uh, that could engage uh, a lot of local universities. I think the University of Puerto Rico, universities in Virgin Island, they're, they're, all, they're all part of that. Um, we've also discussed the uh, possibility of using workshops to identify existing information. Uh, that's really um, you know, uh, important to us. Uh, James will talk about a workshop in a bit that looked at some of the spatial data that's out there and what's available. But I think more broadly, we need to know about um, what research has been done, who's doing the research, and how we can work to fill any data gaps or associated research needs. And um, you know, last but certainly not least, um, we plan to continue to collaborate with our NOAA NCOS partners on research spatial planning. So a lot of the data that I mentioned in the previous slide that goes in directly uh, into uh, working with um, NCOS on that on that marine spatial planning piece. And so uh, with that, um, I'm going to hand it off to, uh, to James. Sure, thanks, Mike. Um, hi, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here today and to talk with you about some of the marine spatial planning partnerships that we have underway. Um, again, I'm James Morris. I work in NOAA's National Ocean Service and the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science, or NCOS. And we've been working um, to provide coastal and ocean intelligence uh, for conservation and blue economy work for, 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 a, for a, a long time. I want to talk a little bit about sort of how marine spatial planning has been evolving rapidly in the last few years and some of the work that we have going on with BOEM. So just to kind of, you know, reorient folks, um, I know we're talking a lot about BOEM's work today. Um, but NOAA's role in offshore wind, you know, also is important in terms of, you know, protection of coastal and marine resources, interagency engagement and in supporting the administration's goals, um, environmental intelligence. And we're going to focus a lot on environmental intelligence in the next few slides. And then, of course, research and operations to understand and monitor impacts and those kinds of things. Um, I'm excited. We're excited about the partnership, um, this interagency partnership with BOEM on marine spatial planning. Um, this is a relatively new partnership, although NOAA and BOEM have been collaborating for, for decades. Um, the, the, uh, being able to work in a marine spatial planning process together is relatively new. Um, NOAA has been providing data and intelligence to support BOEM's mission um, and, the, and, and various other federal agencies' missions uh, for, as I said, for, for decades. However, we only have recently come together and been working on developing marine spatial planning processes that are across the federal agency, federal agencies. And I'm going to share a bit more about that with you today. Here's a snapshot of all of the wind planning, wind spatial planning activities that are happening around the nation. Um, you can see that you know they, they, they are um, there's various levels of planning underway, whether it be using marine spatial planning and specifically spatial modeling, which we want to talk about in a second, um, to site call areas or wind energy areas or inform cable routing. Um, at each step of the planning process, there is now an, a partnership underway um, and an interagency agreements that are, that are established to work together um, be, um, uh, between NOAA and BOEM on marine spatial planning. NOAA, of course, our agency does not get to make the decisions. Um, the, uh, Bowen may, are, is the decision maker here when it comes to offshore wind. Uh, we're very much in a supporting role in, in terms of providing ocean intelligence and providing spatial modeling capabilities. I want to um, go to the Caribbean for just a second, to the U.S. Caribbean. Um, we just completed a, a couple of workshops where we were working to establish baseline um, uh, data uh, at baseline data inventory. And I captured this quote from 
uh, Nicole Angeli, who's the director of the U.S. Virgin Islands um, Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I thought it really captured sort of our goals um, in terms of why we are so serious about developing better and more comprehensive marine spatial planning uh, approaches. The quote that she shared at the end of the workshop uh, basically says this, that, the that they are hopeful that the territories are hopeful. And I think any and all coastal communities are hopeful that the results of marine spatial data will bring us closer to respectful, sustainable uses of our natural resources. But what, but, um, but just that better understanding and respect for those is purposeful in that it can elevate the quality of life of our friends, families, and neighbors. And, um, and that's the purpose here is to work to create community uh, through that marine spatial planning process and to everyone to be able to rally around the process and the spatial planning um, models to be able to um, better understand the ocean and the interactions of these new pioneering ocean industries. Um, here's, some, here's a brief overview. We held two workshops, one in San Juan and one in uh, St. Croix um, in, um, in late August, early September. These workshops were, were very well attended. The purpose of these workshops was to uh, begin to build a community for marine spatial planning. Um, we, we work to bring in subject matter experts across various ocean sectors and began to inventory the data um, and be able to talk about and to better understand the data in terms of its shortcomings and opportunities for data improvement and to collect information that would feed into the environmental studies programs, um, uh, Bones Environmental Studies programs, as well as NOAA's uh, programs and support the state or territorial governments as well. There you can see the members of the steering committee uh, that was involved in planning the workshops and the local workshop participants included um, government, territorial uh, leadership and, and staff, environmental organizations, scientists from various academic partners and, and uh, territorial and, and federal agencies, um, the Fisheries Management Council and, and such. Um, the format of the meeting, uh, the workshops um, was essentially we went through each ocean sector, including national security, industries, fisheries, natural resources, cultural and social resources, and med ocean data and other. And we went through a facilitated uh, uh, process where we, we, we basically dissected each ocean sector. We talked about the data that we knew existed, which we had harvested and, and gave presentations on that data. And then we asked the community, um, what were their concerns or questions about those data? And if they are aware of any additional spatial data that we were not aware of in, the, in our geodatabase. And then we worked to prioritize and better understand uh, um, the needs for acquisition of new data. And we were impressed with the, the community that came together um, to be able to uh, look at what the available data and interact with each other. And certainly we saw many uh, instances where um, ideas were generated uh, by the community that would not have been generated individually um, as that community worked to come together. Um, we're serious about uh, increasing our ocean intelligence endeavor um, in, in NOAA, of course, and we're going to um, continue to uh, work towards this. We've been uh, working in biogeographical assessments, as Mike mentioned earlier, uh, for, for over a decade, working with BOEM to do habitat mapping and, um, and developing these sort of these holistic and comprehensive biogeographical assessments. Uh, we have one underway in partnership with BOEM for the U.S. Caribbean to help create a better baseline of, en of environmental data to support uh, BOEM actions uh, going forward should they move forward. Um, this, uh, our biogeographical, biogeography work, biogeographical branch, not only has been working in habitat modeling but also and habitat mapping, but also marine bird distributions and social science uh, surveys to be able to um, work in various aspects of the offshore wind um, uh, sector and, and science and data challenges there. Um, I want to touch briefly on what's newer in terms of marine spatial planning and spatial modeling. Um, Previously, marine spatial planning efforts uh, did not utilize regional ocean models. They worked to, to essentially manually inspect data layers and, not, and, did, and did not work to bring a, a model together for the entire ocean region. And we've been working towards being able to have the capacity 
to, uh, to execute regional ocean models now for a few years. And we have, in fact, built those for a number of the wind planning efforts around the nation. Um, we've, we're gaining a lot of experience in this field. And, and, um, and I think uh, later in the meeting, there's going to be more discussion specifically on the Gulf of Mexico. But I want to touch on a couple of things in terms of how spatial suitability modeling works and why it's a game changer in helping coastal communities and stakeholders and federal agencies work together to, uh, to understand, to better understand conflict and more importantly, understand relative suitability for what might be possible uh, going forward. Um, the, the goal of spatial suitability modeling is to build a heat map, like the one you see there on the right hand side. And what we will do to do that is we will um, we'll, we'll at first identify the study area, and this could be the, for example, the call area boundaries, or just an ocean region like the Gulf of Maine or the Gulf of Mexico, where BOEM is interested in doing uh, planning and eventually leasing. We will subdivide that entire area um, into, we use a 10 acre grid cell. Um, and then we're essentially working to calculate a suitability score, a unique suitability score for every 10 acres of that, um, of that ocean region or that study area. Um, the next step is to compile all the data that um, is relevant to that particular study area. So we will work through a planning process and stakeholder engagement process. Um, we generally convene a NOAA BOEM collaboration team uh, where we will work together with our subject matter experts in both agencies, as well as in the private sector and state and government um, agencies and, and just work to, to assess and inventory all of the available data that we can. After we have compiled data, we will organize that data into categories or submodels um, that reflect the, the ocean region, such as national security data, industries, fisheries, and those kinds of things, and natural resources. Ultimately, we want to be able to uh, assign each one of those data layers a compatibility score. We generally are able to utilize a, a fairly simplistic scoring approach. We think of it as a bit of a stoplight approach where we will assign uh, data layers that have low compatibility closer to a, a zero score, whereas data layers that represent uh, high compatibility will be closer to a one. We're then able to average essentially the scores across all the um, all of the uh, data layers and submodels for each unique ocean space. Uh, again, back to that 10 acre um, uh, resolution. And that's how we then can assign those scores to, to colors and produce those heat maps to give us a better understanding. So for example, just looking at the Gulf of Mexico, this was our first um, spatial suitability model for siding of offshore wind. We have since built suitability models for the Central Atlantic, the Gulf of Maine, for Oregon. We have a few others underway as well. This is the first thing that you look at in terms of what's actually constraining or what are those things that are happening in the ocean that it's incompatible with offshore wind development. We then want to look at the green areas and better understand within the green areas, areas that are potentially suitable of the green areas, where are the areas that have the highest um, suitability. And to do that, we're able to look across these ocean sectors. And, and this is, it's really a wonderful experience to be able to, to, um, to bring the intelligence, uh, all, of the, all of the ocean intel together and to be able to look at it by ocean sector. And you begin to see the geometries and the, and the, uh, the hot spots of sensitivity and, and hot spots of conflict that emerge as you look across these sectors. We then are able to average uh, the scores across all of these submodels and eventually come up with a suitability uh, map or a heat map for the all, whole entire study area like the one you see there on the left hand side. Using um, cluster analysis and be able, now that we have scores for all these grid cells, we can ask the models, show us where the highest suitable uh, clusters of space are based on the math and calculation of all those suitability scores. Again, we're looking at this many times across 50 to 100 plus data layers that represent the most authoritative, best available data for the ocean region. And that's essentially how we work with BOEM and BOEM ultimately selects and makes decisions based on this spatial intelligence and these new spatial modeling runs. So we're excited um, for that collaboration and how it has uh, grown around the nation and in the, particularly in the U.S. territories and in particularly in the U.S. Caribbean, we're working to just now begin to build the spatial planning infrastructure 
to be able to understand the, these, uh, this ocean region, be able to bring it into a spatial modeling context such as this. Um, the work in the Caribbean was um, co-funded by the NIMS Southeast Fisheries Science Center. Um, our agency certainly um, appreciates the ability to work and collaborate with BOEM as early as possible in the planning process. We know that the best conservation and the best deconfliction for industries such as fisheries and such happen early in the process, happen early in the marine spatial planning, and, um, and we appreciate that, uh, that collaboration opportunity. So with that, I'll, I'll stop and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, should we go ahead and turn it to Brandon next? Or um, Brandon, did you have any prepared remarks? Yeah, I think I just wanted to add to this, and it's a great presentation that uh, Mike and James were able to provide here today, that uh, really this process uh, was uh, the adopting of the process and working with NCOS as a partnership was really in response to a lot of comments we received from other engagement with uh, various stakeholders in, in planning meetings and um, even in, during the environmental review process. Um, I'll just add that it's um, a process that's easily followed and widely uh, understood now across many different regions, allowing for some transparency within BOEM's modeling process and just really facilitating um, uh, very focused engagement, uh, looking through the data layers, understanding how certain values were incorporated in, in the modeling process is something that's uh, understandable. We provide uh, white paper documentation on the entire process that um, various folks are able to track. And it's amazing coming into meetings now when we talk about planning with task force members or members of the public uh, or specific fishery sectors that people do their homework and they, they bring very focused questions. And so I just want to um, really applaud this partnership and um, I guess we're open for questions now. So thank you. Thank you. Just a reminder for those in the room, if you'd like to use your tent cards, um, otherwise I'll be looking for the raised hand feature on Zoom as well. Um, and if I could go ahead and start while we're waiting for folks to uh, raise their cards or hands. Um, one question I had, I think probably this goes mostly to Mike, um, but maybe Brandon to you also, is uh, I know in our conversations as a committee and um, on some of our calls, we've talked about uh, the need for consideration of, in distinct categories, uh, the social science and also the outreach um, that's going to take place in these new areas, particularly given um, the nuance of them as a territory quite being quite different from the other uh, states and regions within which BOEM currently operates. Um, and I'm wondering if you can just shed some light quickly on how you all are thinking about approaching those two topics. We've heard quite a bit, I think, actually about engagement between the workshops and the um, public comment periods and the like. But in addition to you know some of the natural science that's been put forth, I'd be interested in hearing more about plans uh, to conduct social science in these regions and any similar leveraging that's being done with partners um, either in the regions or otherwise uh, on those points. So I'll start with that and I'll continue to look for raised tint cards or hands. For... I'll actually go ahead and start with that one. Thanks, Ariana. Um, so with regards to the process for soliciting social science engagement, culturally relevant information, um, anything that is more, and I hate this term because soft sciences are still sciences on the softer sciences mm -hmm. side of the discussion. Um, the actual functionality of it, I don't think will have much of a difference from the way that the state process has operated. Um, as we said, with the state process, we've set up a task force where we're working with the government and bringing in all those responsible governmental entities, and then also working with the uh, aside outside of the task force process with other relevant groups who are very important voices in the conversation. That, same thing can be applied to the regional planning process with the states or to the regional planning process with Puerto Rico. So I'll let uh, them speak on more of the science gathering and information gathering side. But in terms of the engagement, we approach every area we go into with an understanding that each area has its own specific needs and we need to be responsive to that. 
Thank you, Ariana. I just wanted to add that, um, you know, I'm not a social scientist, I don't pretend to be one, but I have had some conversations with our social scientists, especially um, Sean Primo, I don't think he'd be here today. But I think um, one of the things we discussed was, was, was having a workshop to sort of get the people that are doing the research in social sciences uh, together to identify what research has been done, um, what research is being planned, and uh, how we can best uh, all data gaps and work with local scientists. Thank you. Scott? Uh, thank you. Thank you all for very helpful presentations to sort of set the set the stage for us for not only today's discussion on the territories, but tomorrow's discussion on the bigger topic of uh, marine spatial planning. And I'm going to withhold any comments about the, uh, the the materials on the Gulf of Mexico till tomorrow, because I think that's a rich and deep subject to dive into on its own. But I want to uh, turn back to the Caribbean example here and and uh, observe what I see as a significant gap in your uh, data collection and participation from uh, other agencies that could help you. I didn't see anybody from the US Geologic Survey in your consultation, nor did I see anybody from the Tsunami Warning Center at NOAA. Uh, the reason I, I note that's a gap is that the Northern uh, Caribbean, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands was in the top five of the seafloor hazards area identified in the White House report on the uh, uh, key uh, science needs for the uh, uh, EEC. Uh, wasn't mentioned at all. Uh, there's a, I've got a couple of papers I'm glad to share with you, and one of them by a, a local scientist in, from Puerto Rico. Uh, but uh, the, um, this is that area is has is an area that has has a history of earth major earthquakes on related to the plate boundary that occurs there. There's a major uh, subduction zone with a strike slip motion on the north side. There's another big thrust boundary on the south side of the island. Uh, these things move. They've moved within the last several hundred years. They've generated earthquakes that have killed a fair number of people and tsunamis. In addition, on the north side of uh, 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 Puerto Rico, the whole margin is tilted seaward. That's th probably the main area I would think you'd be looking for a uh, floating wind to go in. There are landslides that occur along there. The failure to include um, folks with expertise in seafloor hazards, both the potential risks and the timing of the events and the magnitude of what could occur in your assessments, I think is a significant oversight. I would strongly encourage you to uh, rectify that. I'll retain, my, hold off on my comments about how that might apply in other areas where you've already leased until tomorrow. But I would like to say that uh, it, it does have relevance to the territories more generally. As you go into the Pacific, you're gonna also be needing to deal not only with uh, uh, earthquakes, uh, tsunami issues, but uh, both near field and far field, but you're gonna have to worry about volcanic hazards as well. So um, it, it's some different stuff that's gonna come into the mix. And I think it's it's only prudent for BOEM to make sure that they have talked to their other colleagues, for instance, in the USGS and other parts of NOAA uh, that can help you address some of those natural hazards uh, exposures. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, is your hand raised in response to that? Yes, it is. I just wanted to say, Scott, please, uh forward along those papers. And I just wanted to mention with respect to the Caribbean and Puerto Rico, we're in the process right now of scoping, for example, what could be included in that biogeographic assessment. And certainly um, you bring up a very good point. And we have worked um, closely with USGS on that same issue in other areas, like the Gulf of Mexico, for example, where, you know, mudslides and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I'll be so, glad to send, send that material on to you. So I think I know how to reach out to at USGS as well. So thank you, Scott. Excellent. I'm going to turn Jeremy, Kevin, and then Carrie. Go ahead. Just real quick. It, um, I also want to add that the team has not necessarily been formed yet as to who we are soliciting information from, who we decide we need to in get information from. We are still so early in the process and in the process of communicating with the Puerto Rican government and the US Virgin Islands government. There's not been an establishment of a task force by any way, shape or form at this point right. yet. Just just a follow up comment. The reason I, I, I brought this up here, because I, I suspect that you're in the early days, I would hate to, uh, I, th we, we already had an example where this, uh, gap uh, occurred uh, in the leasing off the Pacific coast for wind. Uh, and I'm worried that's going to happen again with the 
call for or, or leasing off of Oregon. I, I want to alert you early on that you've got same kind of exposures here in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Let's not uh, let's let's nip that in the bud if we can by engaging some experts. Jeremy. Uh, yeah, so I, I've got a couple of points. Um, I mean, the first, I, I agree that Bohm tries to tailor things to to local conditions, but we also have to recognize there's a fundamental difference between the territories and the states. And, and what worked there uh, may not work at all uh, in the territories. We also have to be cognizant that they don't have represent representatives in Congress. They didn't participate in drafting this legislation or, or moving on this legislation that expanded your jurisdiction. So things are different. There are different cultural sensitivities. Um, I mean, you know, there, there, there's a, a legacy of a, a different kind of colonialism um, in say Puerto Rico than there is in the United States proper. So we, we need to think about that. And as well, islands are different than the states in that um, the only place you can connect to the grid is to go to the island. So if we you've got you know a wind energy area off the the state of Maryland, they can go into Delaware. So there there there's just different. It, it's a different game, uh, and I think you know you need to be thinking about that uh, as you're moving uh, as you're moving forward. Um, on, on the the issue of the uh, the mapping, uh, I, I guess I was glad to see that it was only sort of broken into low, medium, and high versus sort of these these the, the, when we try to break it into ten groups and um, and we're really often going more into the data than we can really be comfortable with. Uh, but I would encourage you to to think about. Um, uh, sensitivity analysis. Um, uh, it, it's not clear uh, what you, how you're weighting things when you do trade-off analyses, and th those are obviously going to be critical. Um, I didn't really see much on the on about how you're incorporating social data into that, uh, other than uh, to the extent that that would be incorporated into the context of uh, commercial fishing. Uh, there's obviously a social and cultural context there, but otherwise not clear. Um, and then it also wasn't clear on on this how you're looking at the land based grid. So um, where you're going to locate wind energy areas also has to do with uh, the grid. So um, there's a big difference between having to cable uh, 100 miles versus having to cable uh, just sort of direct to to shore. So uh, all of those, you know, there's different ecological, there's uh, different expense economics. So uh, it wasn't clear to me how those those aspects were being incorporated either. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Brandon, did you raise your hand in response? Yeah, I'm going to try here. Jeremy, thanks so much for your statements there. Um, I, I just want to reiterate, and I, I love that you're already getting into sort of the mechanics of the modeling and wanting to see probably a little bit more under the hood. Um, what James was able to present today was really sort of a high level overview of other um, um, uh, MSP examples uh, around the nation that we've employed uh, within our partnership. So, um, you know, if you wanna kind of have a better sense for the way things are weighted and, and the way the model is, is has been set up for other regions, we'd be really happy to share some of those white papers I'd mentioned earlier, and we could probably drop those um, in the chat. but. Um, I think that you you bring up some really interesting points in that um, there's really this uh, very protracted process for collecting these kind of data and engaging with public, and it's a very iterative uh, process. And some of the uh, the comments that Scott had made up front with, you know, uh, it'd be nice to have some of the social science data or some of the USGS data with respect to geohazards. I mean, this is all the kind of information that we're trying to get our hands around really early in a process such as this. So. Um, I think that really the purpose today is for us to share with you a bit about that process, but not necessarily get into a great number of details with respect to like the technicality of the model and the way that it's run. And, but we're certainly happy to maybe join another conversation at some point to, to do that, or if there's time to really dive into the weeds on some of those. But uh, you, you bring up some great points. And I think from a social science perspective, 
Um, there, there is actually a lot of overlap too with some of the other resources that we have been discussing here today with respect to fisheries, fisheries, um, uh, commercial fisheries, uh, traditional fisheries, su sustainable ones. So these are the things that I'm really keyed in on too. And so um, I'm excited to understand a bit more about these regions. Um, certainly from the workshop that we were invited to participate in with uh, NOAA NCOS in the Caribbean, it was quite eye-opening in, in terms of the sort of the differences in the way the um, uh, these working groups work together or not, uh, who sort of who's who, who are the data holders in the regions, and really just kind of getting a flavor for that now. And I got to, I can't emphasize more how important it is to establish his, these relationships and to maintain some consistency with the people that are involved all throughout the process. Um, something that we've definitely learned uh, through our planning work in, in the Central Atlantic, as well as the, the Gulf of Maine, is that um, it's very important. And, and so is engagement, building that trust to receive that information. So um, I don't know if there's anyone else of my colleagues or James that want to add to that, but um, just wanted to follow up. Thanks. Thank you, Brandon. James or Mike, did either of you want to respond? Otherwise, I'll turn next to Kevin. Okay, Kevin. Oh, Lord. go ahead. Rodney's coming to the table. Just a minute, Kevin. Sure. Yes, yeah, so I'm Rodney Cluck with the Division of Environmental Sciences with the phone. Uh, I just wanted to respond to, to Jeremy uh, briefly, um, just to say that uh, we would uh, love your advice uh, to help identify and and how to incorporate some of this data, you know, into the the modeling. It is it is challenging. I totally agree with you. There's there's differences from what we've done before with regard to, you know, working in states and now with working in the territories, it, it's a shift. Um, and we're, you know, definitely thinking through uh, those challenges. Um, and we have social scientists, you know, uh, as you know, people like John Primo and others that are kind of documenting what, what information needs are, but I think it's, it is going to take a dialogue and, you know, having that back and forth with COSM and with the committee and throughout the National Academy of Sciences would really be valuable. We're at the very early stages now. Now's a really good time to actually, you know, in, in, engage and work this out because this could really kind of, uh, you know, set the bar, you know, on, on, on what information we need to collect as, as we're moving forward. So, and, and ensure we get it right. Thanks. Thanks, Rodney. Kevin and then Carrie. Thanks. I, my my question is really fairly quick. I think I I was wondering. I didn't see in the spatial maps. I didn't see a uh, reference to endangered species. Is that uh, and like uh, the um, uh, endangered species group in in NOAA? Are they? Are you pulling that in? The reason I say is that it just driving in this morning. There was a uh, NPR story on the rice whale down there, which. Uh, I guess there are only 50 individuals left and, and, and they were playing the set, you know, the, the, the songs of the whale and you could hear the uh, seismic um, uh, uh, surveys going on and back for oil and gas. So it was a pretty, pretty pointed uh, um, uh, news presentation yeah. on it. And so I was wondering if, uh, if you're taking into account um, and working with the, that, you know, that part of NOAA to, to pull in those in, in endangered species issues. I can take a stab at that. Thanks, Kevin, for that question. Uh, definitely in our process, again, going back to some of the examples James was able to share, um, within the cult, um, sorry, the natural resources submodel is where we incorporate um, typically like what we would call a combined data layer, which would uh, incorporate a number of uh, endangered species and respective weights in terms of their um, you know, distribution and potential for conflict in these spaces. So that is certainly nested within um, within the model. And we can share a bit more about that. And again, I probably need to drop in a in the chat here a link to those white papers. Thank you, Brandon. And thank you, Kevin, for the question. I'm going to just um, take a quick moment before I call on Carrie to note there, there has been a dynamic chat going on. Um, and I encourage folks to make use of the chat in Zoom if they'd like to. Um, I will not be referencing it for the sake of um, incorporating questions into the discussion, uh, primarily because a lot of them are getting responded to in the chat. Um, and also it's it's there and available for folks to check at any point. But, <clears throat> um, but I do encourage folks to use it. Um, you're welcome to do so. So with that, I'll turn to Carrie. Thank you. And, and thanks for all of this really thought provoking um, dialogue and the information you all have shared. Big picture, thinking about the social science, which always seems to be like, what about the social science? 
Um, I think, uh, I don't know if this is appropriate to offer up, but I, I think about forming a task, you're forming a task force or whatever to, to pursue these ideas and, and so on and how potentially, um, useful it could be to identify. So social sciences is sort of like the natural sciences, how, how much diversity is there, right? But to identify two or three individuals in particular that cover maybe a broad spectrum of that, or at least some portion of that spectrum of expertise and engage them in an advisory capacity or some other relevant capacity, obviously not as decision makers, because that's not their job, right? But to engage them to broaden, but also hone the attention to the human dimensions of these processes and uh, the activities that will follow and the impacts and ways of mitigating or making the most of these opportunities, whatever that may be. So I, I too often, I think we say, well, where is the social science data? Data is just one part of it. Data becomes information and eventually maybe you get some understanding. And so um, by engaging with that in a very deliberate and transparent way from the get-go, especially in these more complex contexts in some respects, I think that would be really fruitful. Um, so I just put my two cents in there. Uh, and then the one other thing, sort of drilling down into the spatial modeling um, discussion, and, and I'm, I'm thinking about fisheries in particular because that's the primary area that I work in, but I've been involved in a number of these different efforts. And I think, and, and obviously we're at the, you know, 10 or 15,000 foot view right now, but in, even at that point, and then moving forward, I think <clears throat> um, transparency on the assumptions that are being made about what those data do and do not represent and vetting with the people who are sort of behind those data. And by that, I mean, the people whose activities you're capturing, um, as well as, as agency folks who monitor those activities and so on, is really important and really valuable. I recall a, um, a project I worked on a long time ago where uh, it was for the Channel Islands Marine Reserve Working Group process in California. And we were working with fishing community members to map the fishing grounds and then assigning value based on a procedure we had outlined and, and had shared with people and so on and so forth. But one of the biggest issues was the time period we had chosen to represent in that information. And so those are the kinds of things. What what fisheries are represented and how? Um, what are the time periods being used? What are what, what, what else was going on that might influence what you see there? Um, how might those activities vary and change over time? How have they done so? How might they going forward? Climate change, other activities emerging and things along those lines. And I, maybe I'm stating the obvious, but anyway, this became really important. And we actually adjusted our choice of the time period to represent in those static maps um, with fishery participants and the analysis that followed. But we were really explicit about why we were making those choices. And we were really trying to choose a breadth of time that would capture a lot of that variability. Um, you lost the detail, but you captured that breadth of variability. But then being able to speak to that, right, and explain how that might influence things moving forward. So anyway, just a, a bundle of thoughts there. Uh, but thank you for the opportunity to weigh in a little bit. Thank you, Carrie. And I'll just um, make note of the time because of the agenda that, that we have already moved into the open discussion. I hope we can continue that. If we do wrap a little bit early for lunch, that won't be problematic, but um, encourage folks to raise their hand and participate in the conversation. Brandon, uh, I saw you raised your hand, I assume in response, go right ahead. Yeah, just a bit of a follow-up and I really appreciate those uh, comments, Carrie. It's uh, really spot on with some of the observations I've made through our process uh, in working with NCOS and engaging with this particular model, kind of going back to my comment earlier, um, how this platform really offers uh, a very tangible opportunity to engage with folks, again, sharing data and, and you know, spatial things and, and trying to collect some of that information. But as you say, there's context that need to be uh, incorporated as well in, in some of that uh, fact finding or data finding. 
And we we really um, we explain that quite a bit in our process while we're engaging that it's not just a point on a map or a polygon. Um, it's really trying to get a better understanding of what actual activities are happening happening here. Which are you know what are the trade offs? Uh, what are the time periods that are most most relevant? There's some really good good examples that others might speak to with the the Gulf of Mexico planning and working with shrimpers um, and and really taking a hard look at the availability of data and and focusing in on particular time periods where. Um, you know, for example, I think COVID had a big, big impact in some of their productivity. And so the idea was to use a different uh, year class of data in order to really best represent um, some of the phenomenon out there and, and you know, potential constraints. So, um, you know, I think that the engagement process actually is something that we're really looking at next or kind of evolving as well, uh, just again, through um, this very hands-on tangible process we've uh, initiated with our planning in that um, we're going to be able to you know, tie in things like fisheries ecological knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge, and setting up really meaningful ways to engage to collect specifically that type of information. So, um, but your point's well received. Thanks, Brian. Go ahead, Ariana. Yeah, and I'd like to expand on that uh, just slightly. I, my previous role was as a subject matter expert in the navigation field. So I did do a lot of this engagement and data collecting and there, you can't separate the two processes out from each other. Um, the We need to share information with the affected groups for them to understand what our process is and what information would be most useful for them to give us at a given moment. And then we need that information, not just from them, but also we need that information contextualized so we can understand what it means when we start putting it in maps and doing the mathematics with that exercise. So I completely concur with your comments and I thank you for them. They're, they're good ones, uh, especially as we move into this new area. Thanks, Ariana. Looking around the room, uh, Rod. Um, so thank you, um, Brandon, in particular, for those last comments you brought up the subject that I was going to raise, which is, um, you know, including people and data that are important and at the risk of being a broken record. I'm going to say it anyway. Um, so in terms of the workshops, including tribal members is often well, is, is essential, of course. And then um, in MSP efforts, um, including indigenous traditional knowledge and also thinking and considering spatial, I'm sorry, sacred landscapes is, yeah. is important. Um, when we were involved in the uh, in the ocean SAMP, which is the special area management plan up in Block Island, uh, we heavily engaged with the local tribes early and that helped a lot with um, understanding some of the aspects of traditional knowledge and also sacred landscapes, which had caused a lot of problems um, in other areas before, so. Sorry, go ahead again. Yeah, and thanks, Rod. Points appreciated here too. Um, you know, the one other thing I'd like to add is that um, these are human and ecological systems and they're dynamic and there are connections um within and among people within and among groups of people um and activities and one of the things that i think is um really valuable and i you may be addressing this but i just want to I'll, I'll give an extra plug for it which is um if something changes different people change what they're doing in different ways. And that depends in part on how they use space now, but it also depends on a lot of other factors that influence their opportunities and constraints and the way they think about the world. And so with the, one of the, I think one of the challenges to modeling and a great opportunity in engaging with people, both with the social and natural scientific expertise and with the other forms of knowledge, the local knowledge is to um, sort of brainstorm scenario considerations, right? But a practical look at things, ah, you mean if you're gonna do something there, well, these kinds of activities are occurring here, these kinds of activities are occurring there and this is what it means for them. And you're not gonna get down to the very fine scale that would be unrealistic impractical, but understanding that there are these different ways that 
again, back to marine space use, it's really dynamic and it's not always predictable. And to get people who have different kinds of expertise engaged in that, um, to avoid unintended consequences, if nothing else, is, and by that I mean social, cultural, and economic consequences, as well as for energy development and ecologically, um, it's really worthwhile to get that conversation going and build the trust and shared understanding of what it is you're actually talking about, because we all come at this with different lenses. So anyway, thanks. Thanks, Carrie. Um, I'm going to just take a moment to encourage folks around the room to um, really enunciate when you speak because uh, the room is big enough and empty enough that it's not uh, necessarily easy for everybody around the peripheral to hear. Um, so just the mics do a little bit of amplification, but not that much. Um, it's mostly for the folks on the line. So just encourage people to really speak up. Uh, I'm going to ask Mike if your comment is in response to Carrie's. <clears throat> Yes, it is. Sorry. So we'll turn to Mike and then Les and then Scott. So I just, um, Carrie, just want to ask if um, you could have, it's out, obviously it's, it's a really important thing you just said, obviously to understand the, um, the people, the places, um, their connections. Um, have you got any further thoughts about um, what guidance about how best foam should sort of um gather collect sort of approach that problem given that you know um you know we're sort of uh totally new to the area so when we come in to the communities we're, we're outsiders um we're from the pro government so i just want to be sort of um just spend a little bit about methods and approaches that might be useful it might be a conversation for sort of a, a broader group uh like you mentioned late, later on with a with our social scientists and maybe a couple people you know um I don't know if that's within the scope of what the COSA can do. Um, I'll leave that to Stacy and others and Jessica to figure out, but it sounds like that might be useful. And I'll, 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 I'll sorry, 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 hit the wrong button. Um, <laughs> I'll respond briefly. Thanks. I appreciate that, Mike. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a longer conversation and I think it's worth, and I think it's a focused conversation. I think it's really worthwhile. And there are, uh, I wouldn't be the only person on COSA, although I am cycling off. Um, and then I definitely can think about, uh, I think of a few people I know in those in that area who, um, who would be really appropriate to engage with for some, to think this through out loud and then, and then proceed however you determine. So yeah, thanks. And Mike, uh, to your point about the appropriateness of COSA as a venue for this, um, let me just say that we are a committee established to be of service to BOEM. And if this is a, uh, a need or a want uh, for the agency, we would love to find a way to support it. Um, and so certainly it's something we can chat about. Uh, and, um, you know, I think to Ariana's point, what you described is very much similar to this committee as well, which is we need enough education to be able to provide you all the support um, <clears throat> that, that you need um and we also uh it, th it would be nonsensical for this committee to be stood up just to be educated so we need to provide value back to you as well and if there's a way that we can convene a group um to assist with that that is within our charge so um i'm going to turn next to les and then to scott uh hi everybody i just want to mention that in, pursuant to James's presentation and Carrie's comments just now about uncertainty. Uh, when I was watching James do his show, it, it struck me that we're still at a very early stage of uptake in marine spatial planning, and that there are two giant leaps that we have to make in getting the groups we're working with to understand what this modeling is all about. The first is to understand what James presented basic data overlays and exploration of potential interactions. The second great leap is one that we're working on now to get people comfortable with scenario exploration based on theory-based models. And that's a huge, that's a huge ask. 
much bigger than we realize. When we try to work with people using dynamic models, it's too much of a black box for them. They don't understand what's going on under the hood. And it's really hard to explain it because it's like several hundred equations. So I'd like to see us make this jump first to broad acceptance of basic MSP approaches, and then make that second jump to being willing to think about the future, knowing that what comes out of models is just a thinking tool. It's not an actual prediction of what's gonna happen. Thanks, Les. Scott? Uh, uh, two, two, two more comments here about uh, the first one really about the, the territories, which is uh, the focus of this discussion this morning. And the second one will be about marine um, marine spatial planning a bit. Um, so on the territories, there is a, a document that the uh, White House put together a couple of years ago, uh, the NOMEC document, which I know Bohm has 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 taken a look at, uh, looking at the strategic priorities for ocean exploration and characterization of the U.S. E exclusive economic zone. It, it, it characterizes um, <clears throat> key uh, science uh, and not only physical science, but social science gaps um, uh, and, and uh, white space, uh, you know, kind of across the EEZ. It includes in it the territories. So I, I would commend you to take a as, as you contemplate going into other uh, new ter new 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 areas. Take a look at that in terms of it potentially identifying some opportunities for for uh, uh, other insights that could or programs that you might want to uh, uh, you know, encourage to address some of those gaps. I think they did a, they did a nice job. I also note that. In their emerging priorities, which I assume is going to be tackled in the next round of this, they flagged uh, some key additional themes that they want to work on, uh, which include uh, uh, impacts of climate change, biodiversity issues, and environmental justice. So it's it's not just in the physical sciences; it's also uh, uh, in the social sciences as well. So uh, I, I would encourage you, and I know Mark Mueller's. As your representative there, so so uh, you've got a seat at that table, and and it's it's got folks from NOAA and USGS and other agencies, so it's 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 a useful uh, group to to deal with. Um, the second thing um, I think Les just touched on it, but Jeremy brought it up in, initially uh, as well, uh, and I think we'll I don't know if we want to get in, start in, into it today, but or, or really wait for this until tomorrow when we get some more tangible examples from the Gulf of Mexico. But marine spatial planning, I uh, I think it's going to be uh, one of the biggest challenges that BOEM is going to face in your in your mission. I think uh, it's and the reason it's going to be one of the biggest challenges you face is because your program has gotten mighty complicated. You know, it was so easy when it was just oil and gas and a, and a few sand projects and you were limited in where you were working. But now you've got this huge waterfront. Uh, you've got you still have oil and gas. You, your, your marine minerals program is getting bigger. Your uh, um, your renewables program is getting bigger. We've got wind now. I'm sure at some point we'll talk about potential of float is floating solar in the game. I don't know. We'll hear more about what they're thinking about that in the in the North Sea tomorrow. Um, CCNS is coming and it's huge. Uh, and, and, and I just read the latest from uh, Exxon that they were upping the, uh, for, the, the forecast or their assessment of what the storage capacity was for CCS and the, and the Gulf of Mexico shelf from 300 gigatons, which is what we heard about a year ago at a National Academy meeting, to 500 gigatons. That make, would make the US Gulf of Mexico the Saudi Arabia of uh, CCNS storage capacity. Now think about that. When you realize how much uh, how many how much greenhouse gas ha volume has to be removed, even if we do all the mitigation stuff we we're talking about, we're still going to have to take some of that stuff out of the air. It's a huge huge resource. So you guys have all these, and you're going to have some. You're going to have blue hydrogen, green hydrogen. You're going to have all sorts of. You'll have aquaculture in place. You're going to have all these things to sort out. We're going to hear some great examples tomorrow in the North Sea about all, what they're trying to sort. Well, you guys are going to be at the forefront of trying to sort this out, for at least for the federal waters, and somehow figuring out how to make the trade-offs. Jeremy said said the word earlier, but the trade-offs between these different kinds of programs, how we're going to make those assessments is going to be important. Scenarios, I think Les is right, is going to be a key element of that in terms of guiding how we assess 
you know the different the different trade offs. You know, is 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 uh, uh, a, a square kilometer in the Gulf of Mexico more valuable towards uh, uh, reducing greenhouse ga gases for use for CCNS, or is it more valuable for putting wind farms out there? I don't know the answer to that. I have a suspicion, but I don't know the answer. And and uh, I think these are uh, coming up with a logic for how we do trade off analysis on 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 your multi program uh, system um, that you have to look after. Energy systems you have to look after is going to be a critical challenge. So I, I'm going to look forward to that discussion tomorrow. But I I think it's going to become even uh, uh, equally pressing in the in the territories. And uh, enough said. Thanks, Scott. Brad, I'll turn to you next. Yeah, let's look at real quick. So I'm, I'm Brad Blythe. I'm the chief of the biological and social sciences branch and, and headquarters uh, uh, for BOEM. I'm also a scientific integrity officer, which isn't super relative to this conversation, but does tie into to some of it. Um, I think this is really an important conversation for us. And, and right now, you know, the COSA is is getting in on the, the ground floor with Boom! Right now, on these on these discussions, um, and just talking about the the science side and the research side, um, you know, there are a couple things that um, I know we've been talking about internally that that are a little. I mean, concerning is not the right word, but the considerations we have to to take in. One is that um, when Congress gave us this new authority, they did actually give us some money, which was nice because that doesn't usually happen. Uh, but the other side of that was that that money is time limited, right? So that has to be spent within a certain amount of time. So that puts us under a little bit of, of a clock. Uh, and while uh, doing research in, in the Caribbean and the territories is new for BOEM, it's not new for other people, right? But we don't necessarily know who those people are. And so having those conversations with you all and you know, noting where like where we should be finding those things is, is really critical because the last thing we want to do is to be seen as, you know, parachuting in white knight scientists to solve all of your research questions because <clears throat> nobody knows anything. Like, well, we know that's not the case, but we are absolute novices in this area for the most part because we haven't been there in 50 years like we've been in other places. Um, so I just really want to say we're grateful for this. Um, and even just beyond the, the science advice that you all are giving, um, ideas about where those connections are, who we should be reaching out to. We're starting to piece those things together. And the earlier we can figure those out, the better. Because you don't want to like, so inadvertently leave somebody off or leave some critical aspect out of the conversation just out of ignorance and, and being novices in those areas. So um, just wanted to put that out there, that the intent, like Mike said, is not, you know, you know we want to engage with the local research communities. Um, we just need to figure out who and and how, right? Thanks. Thank you, Brad. I'm gonna quickly just respond to what Brad said and then I'm gonna turn to Jake as well. Um, I think that was a, a part of the motivation for the talks today, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, in particular, after lunch, we'll hear from three people that are serving um, in NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program as liaisons. Um, and in some of the informal planning conversations we had for this meeting, uh, one of the topics that came up was um, how do you start to identify um, both the academicians and the holders of local or traditional knowledge or the uh, other agencies, organizations, institutions that have been active in these areas. And I'm hoping that um, the folks we have participating after lunch that have served as liaisons can shed some insight on what has worked really well in developing those relationships and building on the um, existing knowledge um, and not looking like you're parachuting in. Um, so appreciate that question. It gave me a nice opportunity to sort of set up what I think we're hoping to hear after lunch as well. With that, Jake, I'll turn to you. Push this. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm, oh, there we go. I'm uh, Jake Levinson. Uh, I'm a biologist uh, in headquarters under Brad's group uh, in the studies program. Uh, I wanted to mention one quick thing because there was that exchange between Les and Scott earlier. Um, and that's the difference between thinking tools versus policy needs. Um, uh, one of the things that Les and I have been working for a long, long time on, or not a long time now, but a few, seems like forever, but I think it's probably only been a year. Um, uh, on this ecosystem-based management uh, uh, tool uh, 
to develop this national framework um, uh, for BOEM. Uh, the challenge has been uh, communicating, and Les, feel free to tell me if I'm wrong here, but communicating what is a thinking tool to something where we need a actual policy decision need, where lines on a map have to actually be drawn and, and things needed for NEPA and, and hard concrete things uh, that are not just thinking tools. And so one of the things I would in encourage COSA and 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 folks at Boehm and others, if we could maybe have that discussion about how to how to incorporate thinking tools about projecting the future versus something that is actually a line on a map uh, uh, decision. And so Scott and Les, I just wanted to chime that in. That that that's a a challenge on our end when people are asking us for you know lines on maps and and make certain determinations um, as opposed to things that are largely thinking tools. Go ahead, Les. Uh, yeah, I just want to thank Jake's for for bringing that up, uh, and I think that 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 it'll be impossible to engage with um, local populations the way we would like to until we solve the problem that Jake mentioned, and and it's it's not. I mean, we invested heavily in the technical side of how do you do it, how do you model it, but this business of how do you get people to understand how to use it. It's just absolutely critical and really, really challenging. Ariana, were you going to say something? <laughs> I'll talk. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, good things coming out here. And I there is one plug I do want to make to share, which is we have put a lot of time and effort and energy into our website. Every project that we're working on has its own project page, which goes through the status and also has all the past documentation, also has all the previous meetings associated with that project on there uh, that have been recorded. So presentations associated with the project, the NCOS reports are published to that website as well. So uh, we we do try and make sure that we do have access for people to suss out those resources in the best way possible. Um, and we do have some historical examples there in terms of information sharing. But as always, we're very happy to try and improve. We do have a communications team that wants to make sure that people are being accessed in the way that's most functional to them and we're talking to the right people. So if anyone has any suggestions based on those examples, we'd also very much welcome that. Um, as well. Thank you, Ariana. All right, I'm looking around the room. I don't see any additional tent cards, but looking around the peripheral, any anybody holding back? All right, and, and one more opportunity for folks on the line to chime in. Excellent. Well, let me just say, <clears throat> Pardon me, excuse me. Let me just say thank you um, to Ariana, to Mike, to Brandon, and to James. I uh, really appreciate the time. I know that COSA has been very intrigued and interested since hearing about the expanded jurisdiction um, into what sort of Bohm's current thinking is and recognizing that it's very early in your process, um, that there's still a lot to do. I think um, as much as anything, we appreciate the opportunity to, to shed some um, insight and also to gain some understanding at the early stages. Um, so while I know it can be uncomfortable to to say much um, when things are still in so much flux, we we really appreciate you um, offering us this opportunity today. I am, as I mentioned, really excited to continue the conversation after lunch. I think one of the things that I've heard come up in the conversation a few times today um, is the need to capitalize on. Uh, existing information, knowledge, uh, networks, et cetera. And uh, again, um, the speakers that will be coming after lunch, I know one of the important caveats they wanted me to share with this group is that um, they are not experts in the energy field, that their focus is in coral reef conservation and fisheries. Um, nonetheless, <clears throat> I thought that they would add value to this meeting by being able to share with us their experiences serving as a liaison um, between NOAA and the communities uh, within which they operate. Um, and again, some best practices or thoughts or reflections on developing networks, 
um, engaging in a territory different than necessarily another state or region within which you all have operated before. So, um, you know, recognizing their limited focus um, in terms of subject matter, I think they'll be able to offer a wealth of uh, input in terms of, um, again, best practices, lessons learned, and some um, connections in these areas as well. Rod? So I have a quick question. I understand, of course, that much of the focus is on wind and Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Um, and um, so my question is about the other uses and the other territories is, and I'm not quite sure who this is directed to, but is uh, the other areas of the other uses being folded in at the same time and considered or is that is this going to be a kind of sequential kind of process? Yeah, I'll just start with we're focusing on the Puerto Rico and uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands and the Caribbean U.S. territories right now as a matter of resource prioritization. That is the most likely scenario where there will be commercial demand for a commercial scale project. And accordingly, we're doing that. We're not foreclosing that option, but it is where we're, our efforts are focused. <laughs> if I could add, I guess, Rod, um, I don't know if this is getting to part of your question, but uh, in some of the planning work we've been doing in the Central Atlantic and Gulf of Maine, we're certainly consulting with other folks within BOEM, like from our marine minerals groups to make sure that we're, you know, not potentially impacting some of the resources that they're concerned with. Is, does that get at all what you're also act, uh, asking about in terms of sort of overlap with other programs within BOEM and how we apply some of this, the planning tools? Yeah, a little bit, but I was also thinking about expansion of U.S. territories, the other territories and the other uh, uses and the other programs, yeah. Jeremy? Yeah, this is just a quick question about uh, the money that you have. So uh, how much, um, and then someone mentioned that there was a deadline by which you needed to spend it. So uh, is it, when is that deadline? Is it an allocation or is it an actual spend out? So it'll give us, you know, as a committee, some, some thoughts about maybe how you might go ahead and use it. Thank you. Well, let me let me try to help it. Actually, I, I, I'd look to Jessica Bravo to be make sure we got the number of years right on these statutes. But I mean, since you mentioned it again, Rod, I, I, I thought what Ariana said is um, uh, there is some discussion about the the actual scope given the amendment, but uh, but uh, but I, I think the amendment's pretty clear that it's all the U.S. territories. But the but the administration has decided right now the focus is the Caribbean, and probably next would be a look at Americans to Guam and the Mariana. Um, and and very few resources are being applied elsewhere at this point. And then it's three or four years. Uh, Jessica, do you recall? We have to have obligations made by uh, the end of the fiscal year 2026. So that, that's not expended, that's obligated. Yeah. So it can, we can spend past that, but it has to be yeah. and, uh, assigned and, to a project. By, and how much is it? I think it was seven and a half. Is that correct? It's uh, just, just over $7 million. And yeah. that was correct. So we're in fiscal year 24 right now. So, so we have the rest of this year and then 25 and 26. But to be honest, we don't like to wait to the last fiscal year because sometimes projects don't get, you know, don't launch as expected and there's delays. So I would say that really we want to spend that money within the next uh, two, two years. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, go ahead. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's nice to see some new faces around, some old faces. I've been away for a while. My name is Jeremy Potter. I'm the Pacific Region Studies Chief. Um, I was overseas for a year, so I've been kind of out of the loop on the discussions within COSA. It's good to see you, Scott. Um, wanted, I think there are a couple things being 
intermixed right now related to the IRA funding and the territories. It is worth noting that the Pacific region and the studies development plan that you would have reviewed maybe a couple of years ago, maybe two years ago, we had some work in the Pacific territories, cultural marine heritage. Geneva Wright, who I am ecstatic, has joined the Pacific region as a marine archaeologist just two months ago, was online, can speak a little bit about the those two studies in the territories, which are completely separate from the IRA funding um, and happened. So it's been two years in the process. We're through in those procurements now. But Geneva, are you online? Hello, everyone. Thanks for the introduction. Yes, I can speak briefly to the, the two studies. And I think that it goes in alignment with a lot of what we've heard from the other discussions that you know, we really recognize the need for baseline information. And for these two studies, that data gathering is focused on cultural heritage. So specifically looking at, um, at gaining some archival um, information and desktop um, based based information on historic properties, on indigenous communities, um, but also trying to think through um, not only how those would be utilized in terms of bombs activities, but also trying to develop some best practices and protocols for our engagement and consultation responsibilities with indigenous communities in American Samoa and the CNMI. And happy to gather more information as needed for this group. Thanks. Thanks, Jeremy, and thank you, Geneva, as well. Mike? That was legacy and apologies. Oh, no worries. Jeremy, is your card still up? No, nope, that's okay. Excellent. Bill? I think to sort of put a, maybe a little bit more of a cap on it, we do have a significant expiring funding under the IRA and it's seven something for the studies program. But there's nothing that, that to stop BOEM from uh, using other funds with the same kind of flexibility we have now. And and the work that, you know, the the cost of what Ariana is doing is not not the studies program. Just a quick follow up, though, is is it is it all going to be restricted to wind only or can other uh, resources be considered in those program. I'm thinking about some of the Pacific territories. Uh, do you remember for sure? I would say, and Mike, please add on if I if I capture this incorrectly, but the the intent behind collecting a lot of this biogeographical data, this social sciences data, is broadly applicable for other programs if we are pursuing that in the future. Yeah, I mean, that's for sure the case. Much of what we're looking for is broadly applicable, as Jessica said. Thank you. Thanks. Brad, were you coming to the table to speak? You're good? Excellent. All right, Les, your hand. Um, yeah, I just want to point out that we're starting to define areas of major challenge that have to be brought together into one puzzle to be able to do ecosystem-based management. And another thing that's going to cause a communication frenzy is when we start using AI very heavily, which is coming. Um, and we use it to pattern search to identify processes that could impact human well-being or, or the benefits and costs of any particular project. So I really think that some help with communicators would be great um, to define these areas of novelty, that it would be really great for BOEM to integrate into its practices, but along with that, a plan to help explain to people how it works and why it's useful. Thank you, Les. All right. I'm not seeing any more tent cards. I'm not seeing any more hands. Yep. We will um, go ahead and break a little bit early for the lunch. Um, and for uh, COSA members, Eric, can you tell us what they're doing in terms of lunch? Uh, yeah, lunch is right across the hall in room 010. And for our guests in the room, um, apologies that you had to come a little bit further because I know this facility is not nearly as nice or accessible as our uh, NAS building, but it is more food friendly. <laughs> um, so there are lots of options for dining around here. We also have an atrium that has uh, 
a step up from vending options. It's a small cafeteria without uh, live service um, on the third floor, um, but it does have access uh, to things like microwaves and coffee and <laughs> other things you may seek uh, on our third floor. Uh, and if you have any questions about what's available around here, don't hesitate to approach me or Eric. Um, we'd be happy to point you in some directions. And we will reconvene uh, after lunch at one o'clock. Thank you. We are moving to cars and receipts. So I think we will be getting underway here in just a moment. All right. Thank you for your patience, those on the line, and thank you all in the room for coming back promptly. We are going to get started by continuing our conversation about uh, BOEM's expansion of jurisdiction into the territories. And as I mentioned um, in the discussion session of our last uh, conversation, one of the things that we heard in our planning calls uh, before this meeting was about a mechanism that NCOS has used in their coral reef conservation program to uh, you know, help with the development of networks. Um, and that's been tapping into a liaison program. So um, again, that's one mechanism that they've used. And I thought we would reach out to some of the liaisons in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands to see if they could share with us a bit about their experience, um, some sort of best practices, thoughts about how a, an agency uh, operates in the territories, builds networks there, earns and gains trust. Um, what are some considerations as Bohm embarks in this uh, new jurisdiction that, you know, um, based on their experiences are best practices? Um, and I've asked them each just to give a, a few minutes of informal remarks um, and uh, we can really create more of a conversation over the next hour. Uh, and I'll turn first, if I could just ask each of you to introduce yourselves before you speak, um, that would be very helpful. We did round the room introductions this morning. Uh, so I apologize, we won't go through the full committee again. Um, but if you, if folks have questions on who we are, feel free, feel free to ask and we'll, try to remember to introduce ourselves uh, when we're speaking also. Um, so on that note, I'm Stacy Karras, Senior Program Officer and uh, Director for the COSA Committee from the National Academies. Leslie, can I turn it over to you first? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Leslie Henderson, and I am the U.S. Virgin Islands Coastal Zone and Coral Management Liaison. Um, so I'm funded through Office for Coastal Management, and I handle both coastal and coral um, liaisoning, liaising with um, the territory. I, I sit in St. Croix, so I have a small office here in St. Croix that I share with Denora. Um, I mostly work from home. So I'm going to pass it to Denora next to introduce herself. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, nice to meet you. My name is Dinara Chassin, and I am the NOAA National Marine Fisheries Service liaison for the USVI. Um, I don't know if I should give a little bit of background on my position, but essentially my position is funded by the Coral Reef Conservation Program, but is housed by NOAA Fisheries under the Habitat Conservation Division. <clears throat> so I'm involved in assisting coral restoration activities in the USVI, I sit in St. Croix, like with Leslie, and uh, my position also implements the provisions of the Magnuson-Stevens Act, which involves essential fish habitat consultations for um, regulatory projects that have a federal nexus. And so for these projects, I work closely with uh, NOAA Protective Resources Division and uh, usually the U.S. Army Coast of Engineers, who is the main permitting agency. Uh, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll stop there, but, you know, some aspects of my position have already been established, such as the regulatory component, while others uh, 
fall within like the general topic of habitat conservation and whatever the need is in the territory. And uh, here in the USVI, there's uh, a lot of need related to coral conservation, restoration, and disease response. And so uh, I work with Leslie and many others uh, on those topics. I'll pass it on to Elena. Thank you, Dinora. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having us. Um, my name is Helen Antoon. I am the NOAA Fisheries Fishery Liaison for Puerto Rico. Uh, like Denora, I am funded under the Coral Conservation Program, but I sit in the NOAA Fisheries Line Office and I am in the Protected Resources Division. So as Fishery Liaison, I provide jurisdictional support uh, to the Puerto Rico uh, Department of Natural and Environmental Resources. And I also do Section 7 consultation. So I also work um, with permitting in the consultation process. Um, of section seven and um yeah so if you have any other questions <laughs> i'll be more than happy to answer it later on uh, thank you leslie did you want to provide any initial remarks <clears throat> initial remarks that sounds really fancy yeah. um <laughs> sure sure yeah thanks for having us i think I, I mentioned the other day like i think it's it's really good that you guys are asking this question and asking how best to approach local community um, one of the things to keep in mind as you are starting to work in an area like the Virgin Islands and, or Puerto Rico is that the staff capacity of the government agencies that you're trying to tap into is very, very low. And many of those folks will be being asked by not just you, but lots of other federal agencies, private industry, nonprofits, everybody's coming to the same people. And so they have limited bandwidth and limited time. And sometimes it can seem like, oh, this person's not responding to me, but maybe, you know, emails varied. So little frequent reminders can be can be really helpful. So that's one overarching thing that as you're coming into the territory that I like to tell people, everybody's very busy because they are very busy. Are there any like specific questions that you want me to just kind of go over a few tips and tricks or are there specific areas yeah. that? No, I, I think this group's particularly interested in, at least in starting the conversation with um, sort of some best practices for developing networks and inroads and, and trust um, among the, the communities, the institutions and the organizations uh, within the territories. So if you have any feedback on that, um, starting there and, and um, sort of pose that question to all three of you as well. Okay, sounds good. Um, well, the first thing is, if there is any way to have local staff, that is night and day um, makes a difference. Having someone here or there in Puerto Rico in the island that is um, living the same challenges and is able to meet with people uh, in person, that is very valuable. And that's obviously Coral Program saw the value in that, which is why we exist. Um, and I think, I, I mean, I like to think our jobs are very worthwhile and usually the territory is very, very happy um, to, su to support us. So having local staff not only located in the island, but if you're able to hire a local person, that's even better because they're going to really understand the intricacies of uh, the community that you're trying to tap into. Um, obviously, if if you can't find a local candidate that that fits your fits your criteria, you know, hiring off island, but bringing them down here um, is is really really important. Um, one other thing that I definitely usually will recommend to people who are trying to get in touch with uh, local partners is, I know we like to email a lot, but a phone call will work a lot better with some of these agencies. There are quite a few. Um, agencies and people that I work with that almost never answer my emails. But if I give them a phone call, like they're like, oh, yeah, what do you need? I'll do that right now. Uh, so keeping that in mind that email is not always the best method of communication. Um, that's one thing. Another common courtesy thing to just keep in mind for the VI is always start every conversation with good morning or good afternoon. It's considered very, very rude to just start hey, I need this from you, or hey, can you do this, or anything else? It really needs to be good morning, good afternoon, or good evening if you happen to be working uh, later. Um, let's see, I'll, I'll pass it to Denora if she wants to say a few things, and I'll think of a few more. 
Thanks, Leslie, although you already covered some of what I was going to say. <laughs> um, yeah, so in general, I, I would say uh, tap into uh, your connections, see if you already have uh, their existing networks that have been established, uh, use them to your favor as a way in. So I, I'm definitely involved in the conservation world, so that's like... Um, you know, what I can think of, but I, I do know, for example, some things, uh, some, I guess, connections come to mind. Like there's a Caribbean community of practice that was started by the Southeast Conservation Adaptation Strategy. Um, this is a group of biologists, conservations, uh, resource managers, all in the Southeast region. And uh, they have been working on, on a blueprint and expanding here in the Caribbean region. There's a lot of, uh, people involved there from, you know, the local folks. And so there's already connections uh, being made there. I, I think we talked briefly the other day um, about the spatial planning workshop that took place earlier this year. Um, I think Jennifer Wright from ENCAS was the U.S. Caribbean uh, person uh, coordinating um, this event and and there's a lot of folks that attended this meeting which includes some from BOEM and um the local government dpnr department of planning natural resources um there's people from the caribbean fisher management council in there there's like a whole list of of folks that were here all talking together communicating on uh, specific you know related to this uh topic of bringing um, you know, energy and whatnot into the territory. So tap into those connections that you may already have. Um, I, I work a lot with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and Tilly's regulatory office. So that covers both Puerto Rico and uh, the USVI. So um, I think Jose Alicia, who is the new chief, if I am correcting his position, but I work a lot with Karen Aurelius on, you know, all the permitting for projects here. Um, so they're, you know, they're already working with the local government uh, here and in Puerto Rico. So I highly suggest to uh, talk to them and they may be able to facilitate, facilitate some connections too. Um, a few comments, uh, let's see, already touched on the capacity in Caribe in, here in the Caribbean is, uh, limited. The folks wear many, many hats. Everybody's maxed out. <laughs> so I, you know, I um, repeat, basically, just reach out more than once if the first time doesn't work out and uh, find other ways to communicate. <laughs> Leslie suggested a phone, so that may be a way. Um, cultural etiquette. So good morning, good day, good afternoon. Leslie was kind enough to let me know about that pretty early on when I started. And it seems like a small detail, but goes a long way. Um, let me see what else, so what I can think. Yeah, the USVI is very small. And uh, like I said, folks wear many hats. And so everybody works in, in collaboration a lot. And so one folks may know someone else, even if they may not be the one person you're looking for, they'll be happy to connect you uh, as a small community. And, and everybody, I, I'd like to think that works well together. So. Um, and has been very welcoming at being only two years here in the territory and has been a pleasure working here. Um, I think I'll, I'll stop there, maybe pass it on to Elena, see if she would like to add some, some other thoughts. Thank you, Dinora. Yeah, um, definitely everything that Leslie and Dinora just said also applies um, to Puerto Rico in terms of capacity and you know, people here are wearing many hats and it is uh, very difficult sometimes. DNER, they, the Department of Natural Resources, they outsource a lot of their work because they don't have the capacity <clears throat> to do it themselves. So yeah, that is a big, big issue. Um, in terms of recommendations, um, working in the territories, just to add on to what has already been said, just, you know, fostering good working relationships with local and state, uh, local, state and federal partners is really important. Um, you know, just having that one to one conversations with DNER, with um, C Grant is a really key component here in, in Puerto Rico. Caribbean Fishery Management Council, they're also very, um, those are key people. Um, 
Other things that I would say is stay engaged and up to date on current events, uh, specific to the topics or areas that are of interest to you. So if you're interested in doing some energy expansion into the Caribbean, <clears throat> to Puerto Rico, stay up to date with what is happening here in the island in terms of what people are looking for and what they what their perceptions are and you know where they want to go. There are a lot of people that are in that are looking into the wind energy. Um, as we know, there was that, that workshop. My recommendation would, would be, you know, keep those uh, connections um, and, you know, engage, engage with them a lot as much as you can. And hold regular check-ins with people, um, really important. Out of sight, out of mind. If you don't, you know, keep those um, check-ins, you kind of get lost <laughs> in the background. Um, and in terms of community, this, this part gets a little tricky. Uh, you need to get to know the community. Um, this is really, really important. And I was listening in a little earlier to the conversation, and I think you guys are all pretty, pretty well. You know, you're pretty down on what what you need and what you need to do. And uh, was it Carrie? She gave a list of people, um, names of people. I, I don't, I'm not familiar with the USVI ones, but she was spot on with the ones in Puerto Rico. I would just add Juan Agar to that list. Um, yeah, get, get involved, um, you know, stay connected with the community, um, get to know who can help you connect with them. And the list that Carrie provided is an excellent list and understand the community's needs. That is, that was my first thing going into the, when I first started as before, no, I was the fishery liaison for the Caribbean fishery management council. And I did a lot of outreach to commercial for, you know, commercial fishing communities and it was really, really key understanding what were their needs and what were their perceptions and listening to them and addressing that before coming and bringing in whatever other thing we had, in, you know, in our agenda, you know, putting the community's needs first and, you know, prioritizing it. That was really, really important and be very transparent with them. That I learned is, you know, it may not be easy. I mean, you there's you know especially in my case you know we are the face of the government so we get a lot of the frustration and anger and you know from you know things that they go through and just understand it's not personal um but once they see that you know that you're coming in with their concerns and interests in mind and you know something that you you are concerned about and when, you, when they see that you're being transparent with what your intentions are and what you want to do, start building the trust. Um, very, but it's also very important um, to connect with the community with key people. Uh, at least that was my experience. Having you know, community leaders or people that already have a well-established trust within the community, you know, have them help you do all the connecting, and then from there you can you can snowball. Sorry, you can snowball it. If I may add, I just added something in the chat, but if I may speak for Puerto Rico, someone who speaks Spanish, you need to have someone who can handle the language and can communicate effectively with the you know, local government and the community. Yes, thank you, Dinora, very important. Yes, that is, that's a must. With the agencies, it's not so important. Everybody pretty much is pretty much bilingual in the agencies, but yes, if you are going to be out in the communities, it has to be fluent in Spanish. Thank you each so much. I think this has been sort of a wonderful catalyst for some discussion. Um, and I want to uh, give folks an opportunity if you're in the room to either use your, your tint cards or your actual hands uh, to raise your hand if you're online to use your raise hand feature um, to, to start some um, conversation in this regard and really about um, thinking about how BOEM might uh, tap into some of the existing resources in these territories. Maybe I can uh, start and then I'll turn to Jeremy. Uh, one question I'd like to pose to the three of you is um, what, what um, in thinking about sort of the uniqueness of the territories relative to other regions that BOEM uh, has operated in and, and perhaps uh, NOAA before um, they were there as well, uh, the sort of 
democratic differences, the representation on the Hill, um, the history of the areas, et cetera, how do those shape or does that shape how you mm -hmm. all approach um, communicating with local people, <clears throat> local institutions, um, other uh, territorial government uh, departments and agencies? Um, how does that shape your communications with them or does it have any influence at all? I'll jump in and I'll just say, I try to keep politics out of everything. Great. <laughs> All right, I'll turn to Jeremy, Les, and then Jack. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, all three of you. It was really, um, I think, imparted some quite useful uh, information. I've got two questions. Uh, one is in the territories that you're working in, um, is there a different conception of time um, than, than we all have sort of in the lower 48? Because I know that's true of a lot of other cultures and then that has to then go into how, what our expectations are and how we, we, we interact with different, different cultures. So that would be one. And then um, obviously things like transparency are going to be really important in, in building up these trust relationships. Um, it, how important, though, is, is sort of moving towards, you know, somewhat towards the model that the administration is moving towards with indigenous people of, of moving more towards a sort of co-management model? And, and is that becoming uh, something that's being discussed in the in the territories, even in the um, in the uh, the federal waters? Thank you. I can try and answer that one. Um, island time is definitely a real thing. Things take longer, everything takes longer. Um, so whatever you think you can get done in two weeks, double it, it'll take four. Uh, we usually, I usually deal with that by making sure I give like early deadlines that leave wiggle room, uh, but also Hard deadlines are kind of setting yourself up to fail. So um, yes, time time moves slowly, and um, and yeah, you have to you have to account for that. I also will say, in answer to the previous question, that church church groups are really really important down here. So there's a very strong religious component. Um, so I also stay out of politics and and kind of like try not to talk about that with, with folks, but it's very religious in, in the VI. And then the second half of your question was, um, can, you, can you repeat the gist of that? Or did somebody else hear it and want to answer? It was just going to the issue of, is there becoming some sense that there should be more co-management co in the territories, oh. in, in, in the federal waters? I would say, not necessarily. Uh, I think that the local community is definitely focused on the jurisdictional waters. Um, we also have National Park Service that has those federal waters. They do co-manage specific areas, but things outside of the three, the three mile limit um, don't usually come up in a lot of conversation unless there is a spawning aggregation. There are a couple spawning aggregations out there with uh, lots of reefs and fish. And so that would be of, of significant interest to the local government, but a lot of the open areas, um, we don't have challenges with like large shipping vessels coming in to, to ship just outside, just outside there. So we don't have that challenge that I know the Pacific Islands do, but uh, I'll pass it to my colleagues if they have a different answer or a, the same answer yeah i just i just wanted to briefly add on to like the timing question um something to keep in mind you know the us via and puerto rico are part of the us but they're also in terms of shipping and traveling considered like international so you need to think about you know when you're shipping or everything takes longer you have to do customs you have to do all these processes so for operation purposes if you're shipping equipment or whatever you know all that you need to maybe think about that and um 
while folks here uh, you know are very busy and and very efficient at their at their jobs there's also other things that are out of their control that kind of do um roll into that you really need to be flexible with time if you can and deadlines just because they're just things that everybody's maxed out and some things are out of out of their control so um yeah i think that's all i wanted to add about that the questions so puerto rico same thing island time same issue um i would just say regarding the co-management no we we haven't moved in that direction definitely something that i think we should aspire to um in many areas and for many reasons um what i will say is there is you you can you can notice a difference in how at least when it comes to federal man management even you know even though it's in the, there isn't really any co-management happening but there is definitely an effort to have more community engagement um and providing more opportunity for the community to engage in management uh and and discussions and management decisions at a state level it is very top down it's not easy for the community to get engaged with the local government and that has been one of the challenges that we have always had in terms of outreach and um and management per se in fisheries thank you each uh les jack katrine scott and bill yeah, uh, thank you guys. It was great. Um, I have two quick questions. The first is, um, has uh, the big push for coral reef restoration and stewardship in the territories been of any help as a catalyst in engaging more with local communities more directly? And the second question is, uh, we have very little site-specific data on the mesopelagic, the reef faces, the drop-offs, and on the uh, bathyal habitats at the base of the reef at in excess of 400 meters. I'm just wondering if the local people include those zones in their conception of the ocean that they're relating to. That's it, thanks. Um, I can start by saying that one of the challenges we do have is getting locals involved in coral restoration and and that is largely a uh training gap right it's expensive to be a scuba diver but we have a lot of initiatives that are focused on how to engage them in other ways or how to help them get certified and trained so we're trying to address that but because it is an issue so i think restoration itself um I don't know if it's been a catalyst. It's just the latest thing that we are trying to engage the local community in. I know the University of the Virgin Islands does a great job in tapping into the local community and youth groups and getting them trained in things like the water tables or mangrove um, outplanting right. where they're not, they don't have to go swimming because swimming is not um, innate for the local community. A lot of people do not swim. So it's hard to go from not swimming to scuba diving and doing restoration. Um, anybody else want to want to chime in on on that one? Um, I will say yes. A short answer. <laughs> um, I would. Uh, I mean, as an example, one of the things that we have. I mean, local. It's usually the local NGOs that do a lot of the coral restoration work. And they have made it, you know, one of their key uh, priorities to engage local communities and to hire um, the local communities of the area to be more involved. And one great example I can give you is Sociedad Ambiente Marino. Um, they have a lot of coral restoration projects in Culebra, and they work with the with the people in Culebra and they bring those young kids and you know they have you know and they train them they take care of everything so I, I would say yes I, I would agree I forgot what the other question was oh the benthic um I'm not sure <laughs> I mean it's just I'm not sure 
like in, in terms of what I would say the fishermen are very well um, uh, knowledgeable, very knowledgeable about the, the benthic that, you know, the, you know, their fishing grounds and like they understand, you know, what is where and deep water fishing and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I'm not sure if that is the direction that you were you were going with the question. Yeah, I agree. I think just just like what you're saying, it depends who you ask, right? Some people are going to be very aware of, uh, I think you called it mesobenthos, but you pull the average Virgin Islander and and no, they're not going to know what's beyond what's beyond the surface of the water, much less what's down what's down deep. But our managers, Fish and Wildlife, CZM, and fishermen. You know those folks there they are going to include that in their thinking yeah and there's there is i mean definitely more in the shallow <laughs> will have more you'll be able to find more data um but there's definitely data available i don't i don't know specific areas that you're looking in that you may identify as, as, as there's a, you know, a gap um but there's lots of efforts to um, survey and um, you know quantify, categorize as, as much as possible in you know in both jurisdictions. Um, and NOAA hosts a lot of those um, platforms. Thanks, Jack, Katrine, Scott, and then Bill. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for joining this conversation with with us. I'm Jack Barth. I'm an oceanographer from Oregon State University. And I'm just wondering about another NOAA group, the Integrated Ocean Observing System, Caracus, in your region. And I'm wondering, do you participate in that? And could it be a framework for BOEM as they enter into this area? I would think Caracus is a very important, um, a very, uh, they are very important to include in the conversations. They are, you know, they have their buoys, they have their oceanography oceanographic data. Um, so I, yeah, definitely. Agreed. Thank you. Katrine? Yeah, uh, thank you. I really appreciated the contributions um, that were made from the island perspective. And as maybe odd as it sounds, it really resonates with me. I'm located in Alaska, and so we do have a lot of tribal entities in Alaska, um, particularly in the Arctic, where I mostly work. And uh, so a lot of the things that were, that were being said in terms of respect and, and those kind of things resonate very, very deeply. Um, and I actually was about to take my hand down because uh, Jeremy asked the two of the main things that I was interested in, the time frame as well as the co-management approach, but then left it up um, also to, to say and, and wonder if that's similar um, uh, for um, the, uh, the, the territories. Um, here, if we go and we try to engage with uh, the, the Alaska you know, indigenous tribes, um, there's that fatigue that, that I think was mentioned before. Um, again, everybody wears 58 hats in the communities and they just don't necessarily have that capacity. So it does require a lot of patience, but also one of the things I think that, that, that feeds into this fatigue is that a lot of the um, community members feel that um, Western scientists come in and they they bring this idea forward, and they basically overpower any any <laughs> any um, you know um, uh, local knowledge or whatever. They don't take that time. It's not only response time, but also the time to develop a relationship, the time to to give people to respond. It's not you know it, it's not a conversation that you would typically have as if you have, let's say two Western scientists in a room that just bounce back and forth. But there is oftentimes a time to think and to, to, to collect thoughts and to just be there and listen to these things uh, is very important. And then the one thing, uh, long, long winded uh, story short is to also then bring back to the community. So, um, here in Alaska, at least, and again, I wonder if there are similar experiences uh, in the in the islands and the territories. 
you can't just go and say, okay, listen, this is what we want to do. Does that sound good to you? And then never show up again. Uh, relationship means you need to come back and you need to bring back um, results or, you know, inform and uh, the community about what was done, what, you know, how it's being pushed forward or, or whatever, and engage them in, in those um, in those processes as well. Thank you, Katrine. Scott? Hi, uh, I, I, my name is Scott Cameron. I'm a geologist from the Olympic Peninsula of Washington State. Uh, I have really appreciate your perspectives on on uh, trying to implement your program there at the local level. Um, you know, Bohm is is looking at uh, you know a fairly ambitious effort to uh, install you know wind capacity and uh, power capacity you know throughout the U.S. in the offshore and and. I think the the, the look at at uh, the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico is a relatively recent one. I'm wondering how uh, how much information has been shared with the communities there. How aware is the community, um, are the local communities about what's involved with offshore wind? That's my first question. And and how and relative to that, how important you, would you suggest to Bohm that uh, having a consistent communications package on that would be helpful? And then my second question has to do with uh, cl clearly the areas of, of interest overlap both with federal jurisdiction and, and state uh, or territorial jurisdiction. Um, you know, uh, and, and to what degree in your projects, uh, um, you know, have you uh, handled engagements uh, jointly with uh, state or territorial representatives uh, or not, and and any kind of lessons learned you have from that experience. So those kind of two questions there. Thank you. So I'll jump in and start with, with um, saying in terms of how aware is the community on the projects that are being proposed. Honestly, I have no idea. Um, a good, but, but then again, it goes back to my, what I was saying earlier, like stay connected with the community. So there are NGOs that I do know, like environmental NGOs, um, El Puente is an, is an NGO here that we have in Puerto Rico. They are very, you know, focused in getting that outreach and education on renewable energy and, you know, sustainable energy. So they would probably be a good, uh, contact to get you know get in touch with to disseminate that kind of information and then again c grant um would also be like another source that you could you know help disseminate all that community information um very good question um it, it and it has to do a lot with communications like what is the best way to get the information out there um but i think if you start with like the local ngos and um some of the the uh, other programs that we have, like the Sea Grant program, I think that's a good start. And then from there, you can you can snowball it. Um, and not Leslie. Yeah, I'll just say for the VI, um, folks are very aware of wind energy, right? You know, like it's a very sailing is very popular. That's wind energy, and a lot of boats have little wind turbines, and there are a few folks with small windmills. Um, I don't think that the view, the viewscape of a wind farm would be uh, palatable to most people. I think looking out and seeing the horizon, like you're gonna be fighting that whole viewscape thing that I think you're probably used to fighting. And so messaging, maybe, you know, <laughs> I don't know if you wanna say propaganda about beautiful wind turbines um, and how they, they don't really take up your, your skyline would be, would be important. I, I don't think the community is aware of, of this initiative and this project. For the VI, solar is, is king. Everyone is investing in solar. Um, we understand very well the importance of not relying on the power grid. You know, we've had lots of months without power. And so people have really turned to solar as the solution. So maybe tapping into some of the inroads that solar has already made to be so accepted the one the one um hurdle for solar is just the cost not everybody can install panels on their on their house but 
um, that's that's what I would say for the VI. Yeah, I, I think the only thing I would add is that uh, I'm sure you're well aware, but power here, the cost of electricity is very expensive, mm -hmm. very, very expensive. And so um, it's my personal view, but I would like to think that the VIs would be open to consider or happy to have another option that may um, help with that. Uh, you know, challenge of, of really paying your bill every month that is astronomical. Um, and uh, what was it? I think there was a second yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and the st thank you. Thank you all. That was all extremely helpful. And then the, the second kind of question was, um, you know, you have joint jurisdiction out here between the, uh, the territories, the states, if you will, and, 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 and the feds. BOEM, how how would you, based on your experience uh, in having dealt with some of those uh, over overlaps, uh, trend, you know, boundary issues, how would you recommend uh, BOEM uh, aim to work with the uh, uh, the uh, local agencies uh, on engagement? Well, I don't think you would have a problem with the engagement. I think the, the engagement will be there. The only thing I would just caution is be sensitive to the local uh, government. But sometimes, you know, we feel like the federal government is encroaching over us. So I would just, you know, say just be, you know, sensitive, sensitive to that. Um, like, don't don't automatically assume that something that the federal government would implement in their area will be automatically adapt you know adopted in, in state waters you know there 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 are the differences <clears throat> so you know, I just sorry yeah go ahead yeah no I didn't mean to cut you off I, I was just trying to think of I don't know if I worked in a project yet where there's like an intersection there but I I mean a lot of the projects for that are regulatory in terms of and, and we do essential fish habitat consultations because uh, there's a, you know some federal nexus. We work closely with, most of the time, is the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, but also um, the local government in terms of like the permitting and, and all that. So there's there's a good connection already established and system um, of yeah you know what what's you know what 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 are sort of the different um, checkpoints that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers needs, needs to work on, depending on what the work is. Is it is it on the land? Is it close to the ocean? Is it in coastal water? Is it like, you know, where is the project located? And there is that intersection, depending on the project location of like, the agencies involved in that. Um, but my experience so far has been always, uh, at least here in, in USVI, um, Good relationship between the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and you know the permitting aspect of the coastal zone management. Um, yeah, I don't know if that helps. I don't. <laughs> I'm gonna call on um, Bill and then Jim and then uh, myself. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, I'm Bill Brown with BOEM, and you know we're we're interested in potentially. Uh, uh, leasing offshore uh, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands for wind, and uh, and I'm interested. We, we've we've sort of we've touched on issues of uh, indigenous peoples, but actually we've uh, it's not clear so far from the conversation whether the uh, what what we're talking about are particular indigenous peoples, our communities, you know, versus the broader community. So I, I would love to have. You know, you, you know. I'm sure you appreciate that it, it, that the, the federally recognized tribes here were making a huge effort to connect with. Are there particular indigenous groups in VI or Puerto Rico that we should be sure to make sure we approach early and engage in if we can? Are there? No, in Puerto Rico, we don't have indigenous tribes or or that sort or such, um, such groups. What I would just say is we do have communities. And of course the coastal communities will be more, you know, affected than the inner communities or those that are living in the city and don't really have any 
um, don't have it, don't are not affected by what happens off offshore. So it would be similar in the sense that you would want to identify what the what communities uh, you know which communities are there and which ones will be impacted in any sort of way um, by any potential project. And um, and yes, I mean you would have to. I mean I would recommend that you do try to engage them and get the information and do a lot of outreach with them. But look at it in terms of communities and not tribes, because we don't have that um, sort of separation here. But let me just follow up. I, I don't mean tribes. I mean, like Taino or any other uh, mm -hmm. any other communities that were there before colonization. I, I, what I hear is no. Oh, no. Well, well, I mean, yes. I mean, there were in the Indian uh, the Indian tribes, the Taino Indians that were, that were here. Él está hablando de los Taínos, Elena. Exacto, sí. Sí, o sea, yes, there were Indians, but when in the U.S., I mean... I know, my, my question is, are they still there and we should no. reach out to them? Yeah. No, no, yeah, that's, that's what I understood, that, no. Okay, uh, my name is Jim Kendall. I'm the regional director uh, for BOEM in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, just recently, I just moved there about this time last year and took over in February. Before that, I spent 11 years in Alaska. And listening to the conversation here, the islands, I've been hearing terms very familiar to me with Alaska. And uh, our colleague, your colleague there from Alaska, sort of connected it for me. I heard terms like the integrated ocean observing system, um, you know, co-management, uh, relationship building, benefits to local communities, et cetera. Um, my very last meeting in Alaska was in Yukdiagvik, formerly known as Barrow, where we met with the community. In that case, the community was basically the whalers, but that included anybody on the North Slope who wanted to join us for three days at the museum. And we did something that is one step beyond using indigenous and local knowledge, and that is the co-production of knowledge, involving the local people in the design of a study. In this case, the Ayuses, or the Uses as we call them, from Alaska, uh, the North uh, Pacific, and the Pacific Isles visited with some of us who were on the board to talk with the community on if we're gonna put wave buoys out there, where do you think they should go? I mean, after all, if you're going to put something in their backyard, you ought to ask them. Lo and behold, that was probably the best meeting I've attended, and it was my send-off. I even got an Anupiak name there. But the whalers agreed to install the buoys for the Uses, in this case, AUs, where they thought the measurement should be made. And in return for that, the Uses were developing an app for the whaler's iPhone so they could get the data and use it. So the USAs, in this case for Alaska, AUS, got observing data in the offshore in the Arctic for the general US system. But the community immediately got the data for their own safety and use. And so that was the co-production of knowledge, one step better than the use of indigenous knowledge. And that was a relationship that was absolutely fantastic. So um, I know we're talking about projects for bone building wind farms and stuff, but we're also talking science. So if you can get the local communities involved in the decision making for the science, like where do you think we ought to make measurements, you'll probably learn some things that you didn't think about, especially if people that have lived there for generations, they've got 50, 60, 70, 100 years worth of information, and you've got data for maybe 20 years from a mooring boy. So anyways, that's just sort of what I got from this, that there's so much you can get from communities, but you got to go one step further and let them invest in what you're doing. So I'll try to end it there. Oh, thank you, Jim. That actually is a great segue to the question that I was going to pose, um, which I, I heard the feedback earlier um, about opportunities and mechanisms like Sea Grant um, and local NGOs for communicating information to the populace, but what about tapping into uh, the knowledge that exists there or the science that's being conducted there, whether 
traditional knowledge um, or otherwise. Um, and I guess I'm wondering if there are some uh, outlets or um, opportunities for tapping into that and sort of what are the best practices for attempting to do so? Uh, are there sensitivities about sharing information with the government um, or anything of that nature that they should be aware of and trying to um, capitalize on and also engage and involve the knowledge of others um, that are already present in the area? Um, I'm not sure if I can answer this question, uh, but do something did come to mind uh, while hearing the question, and um, <clears throat> and it's just cultural resources uh, and, and and sensitive areas, and you know for that um, you may need to tap into the cultural resource uh, specific. I guess agent or groups here. I, I I can think that the Nature Conservancy, for example, uh, who's here in Sincroy, they have a partnership with or a relationship with the Society of Black Archaeologists, um, and uh, they work along with them. And and I mean their their location, their uh, inland nursery locations are, uh, you know, in a plantation, located in a plantation of, you know, very historical importance. And so, um, you know, there is ways to communicate with, with you know, the people that are, have knowledge on cultural resources and that they also conduct um, outreach to maybe tap into um, communities that you may be seeking to reach out. Um, I'm not sure that answers your question, but it's what has come to mind. I don't well, know. If Maybe I can provide it like an example or I'm thinking um, as one potential example, things like uh, really productive fishing areas or fishery resources, you know, is that something that they are um, eager to share information about or perhaps reluctant to share information about? Um, are there ways to um, build the trust so that their knowledge of those resources can be more readily shared is the um, is your role as a liaison for NOAA has that helped to um, lubricate some of those channels? Okay, sorry, I got disconnected for a second, but I think I caught um, what you were saying uh, just before. Um, they okay, so speaking from the fisheries point of view, um, they they will you know. They will provide you some information, but yes, there's definitely like they will not give you the specifics of you know where they go fish. That's that's you know those that's that's a taboo. You don't you don't try to know what where the fisherman where his exact spot or site is. That's you know very top secret information. Um, this is I'll just say it just goes back to talking with you know engaging with the community and building building that trust they, they can provide I mean you can get like pretty good engagement with the community and get you know very you know valuable local information as was mentioned before it's we've done that before there have been workshops before and they have been very successful um but yeah it is just getting that that connectivity with with the people and that's where getting to know who you need to connect with that will help you connect with that community that's where you know yeah and i think our role as fisheries liaison for example like my role always people say oh you work with the fishermen and and actually that's that's not true i i don't really work directly with fishermen i my role connects the habitat conservation aspect of you know NOAA fisheries with the the local government here now, within uh, the Division of Fish and Wildlife, um, they have their own liaison, I think, with the fishermen and um, liaison with the Caribbean Fishery Management Council. And so, you know, there, there are different liaison roles to make those connections um, 
with the group that you need to tap into, I guess. Yeah. Rona? Hi, I'd just like to come back briefly to the issue of uh, Indigenous peoples in the Caribbean, um, the Taino, and there are Taino people on Puerto Rico. Um, they're a very small group, um, but they have been vigorously fighting for recognition uh, within the Puerto Rico government over the past uh, decade or so. And the Taino tribe uh, within the Virgin Islands was uh, officially recognized by the US Virgin Islands government in 2021. So those people are there. Um, they have national pride. They have a strong sense of colonial oppression. And although they might not um, be large proportions of the population, I do think it's important that BOEM and other agencies reach out to them and talk to them and get their perspectives and input on any matters going forward. I'll say that is news to me. Thank you for that. I, I did not know. Yeah. Yeah, and, and thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, but it, it was also very interesting. Uh, I, I think the conversation we had before probably, probably is a comment on sort of the profile uh, of indigenous people. And, and of course, one thing we want to do uh, is to uh, uh, help those whose profile has been diminished and try to make it stronger. But I have a separate question, which is, uh, so I, so in addition to uh, in, uh, a special place for indigenous people, the, administ the administration is keenly interested in pursuing what's called environmental justice. And there is a, a recent uh, executive order from President Biden, other orders, and actually the beginning really with an, an order from Bill Clinton when he was president. And so whatever Bohm does, uh, uh, in the Virgin Islands of Puerto Rico, environmental justice will be something that it, it'll be in our mind and we will need to uh, try to live up to those orders. And and so I'm curious about uh, any insights you have on that, you know, if whether any where people have actually heard of the term more widely or are there are there uh, groups that are pursuing it or are there uh, you know, what's the story on environmental justice? May I ask? I'll jump, I'll jump in really quick because I do have another call I have to uh, go to. But I think it's just for the VI, it's important to keep in mind that 90% of our population is identifies as Virgin Islander or Black. And they were brought here from Africa and are descended from those peoples. We do have mixing up and down um, the island chain. There are small portions of Indian and there's uh, like Indian from India and there's small portions of white, but it's majority descendants of slaves. So when you talk about environmental justice, like the entire island could be considered underserved. Um, and so we do have um, black locals and I would not use the word indigenous when referring to the local people at all. They just they don't like it. It would, it would apply to, um, the small group of Taino Indians that are still here, but the the locals, they do not use that word. They call themselves locals or Virgin Islanders um, and they're not indigenous. So I think that's why they don't like it. But um, I forget where I was going with that, but yeah, definitely anything that is, all the funding here goes to an, an underserved community. We are an underserved community. Unfortunately, there are a lot of, you know, what we might consider one percenters that hold a lot of land and a lot of power, but you will find a lot of uh, Black Virgin Islanders in roles of power in the judges, in the um, policemen, and the, you know, school system, the teachers, like we're 90% Black. So just wanted to make sure that that was um, understood, but I do have to jump to another call, and so I don't know if if Denora um, can stay on. Um, oh no, she can't either. So it was nice to talk to you guys. If anyone has questions, you can follow up. Yeah, I'm also on the same call that we have now at the um, 
Yes. And I want to just take a moment to thank you each. Um, it is 2 o'clock, so we will um, move to our next session. But very much appreciate the time you've all given us. Um, and uh, I hope you don't mind if we do reach back out if we have any further questions. But really helpful for the session today. No problem. Thank you. Our pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you all. All right. So we're going to um, switch gears a bit, yeah. and I appreciate everybody um, and the participation in that last session. Um, we're now going to switch to a topic that is uh, near and dear to some of us that have been with COSA for a really long time. Um, we're very excited to hear an update on the evaluating connections work that's being done uh, by BOEM. Uh, I've sort of briefed the um, newer committee members on this, but for others in the room or online, uh, the history of this is that COSA um, several years back had some meetings with BOEM in which we discussed the feedback loop um, between their science program and their assessment <clears throat> program and the transparency of how uh, the assessments program is driving some of the needs for science, as well as how some of the science being conducted and funded by BOEM is ultimately getting integrated into the assessments. Um, so we're really excited to have Daniel Hoffman and Maura Flight with us. Um, and I see they're online to share some updates on uh, the work that has resulted from those discussions, uh, which was a, I believe, SDP funded study uh, on this feedback loop. So um, without taking up too much more time, uh, the same goes, um, Daniel and Maura, for each of you, if you don't mind just introducing yourselves before you jump in. Certainly, uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Daniel Kaufman. I am a principal with Industrial Economics uh, or IEC for short. Um, and I was the IEC project director for the Evaluating Connections study with BOEM. Hi, I'm Mara Flight. Um, I'm also a principal at IEC. I'm an applied economist with a focus in natural resource economics by trade. Um, and I've been working with, IEC, uh, with BOEM um, for about 12 years on various um, studies and assessments. And I served as the deputy project manager for this work. Thank you each. We'll turn it over to you for your presentation. Yes, great. Uh, well, thank you all. And um, just a quick check. Can everyone uh, see our slides? We can. They're presented well. Thank you. OK, great. Thank you. Um, so I'm excited today to be uh, talking about the results of our Evaluating Connections, BOEM's Environmental Studies and Assessments Project. Um, and uh, as you mentioned in the introduction, this is um, the culmination of a significant effort which uh, took place over uh, more than three years, which was designed to test the linkages um, and the effectiveness and reach of BOEM science and assessment work. The COSA provided very helpful input into the uh, concept and initial design um, for the study. Um, and COSA members have also provided really valuable input along the way, including uh, the methodology and some of the preliminary study findings. So we're really excited to share the results with you today. Um, this project really took a systems level approach that looked at science across various BOEM programs, different operational phases, and the relationships between these phases, as well as relationships across BOEM and between BOEM and the science community um, external to the Bureau. As we go through the evaluating connections findings, um, you may hear some resonance with some of the findings and recommendations of the first in class report as well. Um, although this uh, study was conceived before the first in class report, there are some, um, some, some nice synergies there. So I'll give a, uh, a brief recap um, over the next um, hour or so, starting uh, with, with it, briefly with what the project sought to accomplish, why BOEM initiated the study. Um, I'll also be recapping what we did uh, throughout the study, our methodology, and then we'll spend the majority of the time uh, talking about the results and the recommendations from the evaluation. 
So overall, the study aimed to answer four main uh, research questions. Um, the first was the extent to which study results are incorporated into BOEM's environmental assessments and informing policy decisions. The second was what information needs are being identified through the assessment process that can inform future studies. Third was how well BOEM is communicating information needs and study results across different parts of the Bureau. And finally, to what extent are studies and assessments used externally by the broader science community outside of BOEM? And underlying these four uh, research questions or study objectives were uh, this ultimate goal of identifying recommendations to strengthen uh, the studies to assessments feedback loop, um, as well as to identify metrics and a repeatable process um, that BOEM can actually repeat in the future um, to continue to evaluate and strengthen the feedback loop going forward. Uh, the feedback loop is um, the sort of shorthand term for the Evaluating Connections Project, which is encompassed um, in the diagram on these slides here. So the study, as I said before, was conducted um, over a period of uh, three years. Um, the first two years focused internally on the feedback loop within BOEM, and the third year uh, focused externally on um, BOEM's impact on the external environmental science community. BOEM initiated the study um, really to test the assumptions that underlie the feedback loop that we showed on the previous slide. Uh, and it will be helpful to give a brief recap of some of the processes and feedback loops that BOEM aimed to evaluate through this project. As you are familiar, study ideas are submitted as short study profiles um, as part of the annual studies development process. These profiles are prioritized according to seven criteria, um, the first and foremost of which is the relevance and importance to BOEM decision making. The results of BOEM studies are meant to inform assessment documents, consultations, and other environmental work products uh, that BOEM produces. And BOEM's environmental assessments, consultations, and work products identify additional information needs, which are then intended to shape the future studies that are funded by BOEM's uh, Environmental Studies Program. Uh, these connections are uh, assumed, um, but up until this project, BOEM had not quantitatively, qualitatively, or categorically tested these linkages between assessments and studies. And with input from the COSA, BOEM initiated this project to really test and understand those linkages. This was a significant undertaking and it was a really collaborative effort. Um, it involved multiple uh, points of engagements with BOEM um, as well as uh, with the COSA or COSA members at various times throughout the process. Um, and within BOEM, there was really a lot of great participation um, that made the study possible. There were multiple opportunities um, where BOEM provided input um, throughout the development of the methodology, um, the preliminary findings, and discussions of the conclusions and recommendations. Um, there was a cross-agency team with representatives from every program and region, uh, and um, each program and region started by providing an overview of what they do and what was unique about their processes. And then as we developed the methodology and implemented that methodology, um, the study team continued to have opportunities to review the information um, and to provide their feedback, which made sure that the study was relevant uh, and rigorous um, to meet BOEM's needs. So the scope of the internal evaluation, um, looking within BOEM at BOEM's uh, processes was significant. And it was significant um, largely because this was the first time that uh, BOEM had undertaken a study like this. Um, and so it covered the past 20 years. Um, it included 256 assessments and 876 completed studies. 
We also conducted almost 40 interviews and surveyed over 125 uh, respondents um, and also drew on information from uh, BOEM's um, SBAT tool, uh, which provides information on um, certain studies and their intended uses. This was a significant undertaking because it was new. However, part of the project was to develop a repeatable process. Um, so the hope is that BOEM will be able to build on uh, both the study findings and the process that we develop together in the future so that it won't be um, as heavy a lift going forward if BOEM uh, chooses to repeat this process. And so as I walk through the findings now, we'll be talking uh, both about what we found and about um, what make what might make this um, proce process easier to repeat going forward based on the lessons uh, that we learned. In the interest of time, I won't um, delve too deeply into the methods that we used. Um, we looked at trends in study and assessment topics over time. Um, we conducted uh, a variety of um, citation analyses um, which looked at citations of BOEM studies and BOEM product, uh, study products, both within assessment documents as well as in the scholarly literature. We tried to trace information needs over time to figure out what was identified as an information need and whether and how it was addressed. We surveyed stakeholders internal to BOEM during the internal evaluation um, and then surveyed stakeholders external to BOEM in year three of the project as part of the external evaluation. We conducted a number of interviews and um, conducted qualitative coding analysis of those responses. And we conducted a social network analysis, which used survey responses to understand who's talking to whom and how information is exchanged, both throughout the Bureau and between BOEM and external stakeholders. So how information gets disseminated and how ideas flow across BOEM's network. This slide provides an overview of the studies and assessments that were within the scope of the internal evaluation. There were just over a thousand studies in the data sets. Again, this is looking back over the past 20 years. Um, and of those studies, there were um, th there were some, particularly from older years, uh, that we weren't able to incorporate due to um, not having enough information to trace the study through the entire study's process, or uh, because upon further review, um, it wasn't exactly a study as um, defined for purposes of our projects. For example, um, there were various uh, efforts to support conferences that we didn't include in studies. Um, so overall, we ended up with 876 studies in scope. Uh, in terms of assessments, I mentioned before, there were 256 assessments within the scope of the projects. Importantly, we did not limit assessments to uh, NEPA environmental assessments, although NEPA environmental assessments accounted for uh, the highest number of assessments. We also included NEPA environmental impact statements, as well as a variety of other types of environmental analyses, including resource assessment reports, um, oil spill risk analyses, ESA Section 7 assessments and evaluations, essential fish habitat assessments, uh, and so forth, uh, as depicted on this slide. Before I move into uh, summarizing the findings for each study question, um, let me just pause and see if there are any additions from, from BOEM or any questions on what we've presented so far. Um, I'm not seeing any raised hands or tent cards. Okay. So we'll go ahead. Thank you, Daniel. All right, thank you. So the first overarching question was, how well do studies inform assessments? So to get an initial um, kind of high level read on um, to what extent studies are informing assessments, we looked at the extent to which assessments are citing back to BOEM studies or to the study products um, that results directly from the studies. 
And so looking back over the 20 year period uh, from 1999 to 2019, the average across all years was 75%. This is a, um, a simple average of the assessments that cited at least one BOEM report or publication. The percentage of assessments uh, varies widely um, across different types of assessments. So NEPA environmental analyses, EISs, ESA section seven biological assessments and evaluations and essential fish habitat assessments all typically cited at least one BOEM study. Um, other types of assessments on the list um, overall uh, had a somewhat lower number of citations, although um, Again, at a glance, this provides some uh, initially encouraging information. We also parsed this out a bit more um, to look at the average number of BOEM studies that were cited by uh, BOEM assessments. Um, so not just did the assessment cite at least one study, um, but how many, how many studies were they citing? Uh, and that's what this uh, graph shows. Um, so, Specifically, what this shows is out of our universe of about 256 assessments, um, 57 of them did not cite to, um, to any BOEM studies. Uh, the rest cited to at least one, um, 66 cited to between uh, one and five. And then on the far right, there were 14 assessments that actually cited to more than 50 uh, BOEM studies or BOEM study products. We also use the survey and interviews as an opportunity to uh, ask people within BOEM who work on studies and assessments what they perceive to be the link um, between uh, their study work and their assessment work. And so as part of that survey, we surveyed or attempted to survey all staff within BOEM who work on environmental studies or who manage staff who work on environmental studies everyone who works on assessments or manages staff who work on environmental assessments, as well as those who work on both or manage staff who uh, work on both. Um, and this particular question was asked for those who work on assessments. Um, and a majority of survey respondents who work on assessments either somewhat agreed or strongly agreed that ESP funded studies are useful to their BOEM assessment work. We also asked about this question in the interviews, and the interviews really highlighted the importance of studies for informing BOEM environmental assessments, and interviewees were able to provide multiple examples of how BOEM studies had influenced BOEM assessments. These types of influences included informing key policy decisions, um, including mitigation measures, uh, informing notices to lessees, and um, various other uh, types of influence that we'll talk about um, on the next slide. So specifically, mitigation measures, NEPA reviews, consultations, models, um, as well as follow-on studies, oil spill risk analyses, identification of resources, changes to policies, and uh, NTLs were all ways that were identified in the interviews of how BOEM's environmental studies program informs BOEM's environmental assessments. Uh, and the call-out box here provides just um, two examples. Um, one is from the Nantucket Shoal area, um, where a study on um, the density of birds in the middle of a proposed wind energy area resulted in BOEM changing the shape of the wind energy area um, to avoid uh, an adverse impact on the bird population. Um, the second example in the call-out box was in the Gulf of Mexico, um, where a series of studies expanded the knowledge of potential archaeological features. And BOEM actually updated its assumptions and considerations that it used in its assessments based on the results of these studies. So we found pretty strong uh, evidence and indications from um, the interviewees and survey respondents who work on assessments that studies are informing assessments. Our second question was how well do assessments inform studies? And our theory here that we sought to test was that the assessments would identify information needs that would then feed into the development of future studies. Um, and we found that uh, overall that 
is the case. Information needs identified in assessments do inform studies. Um, this was voiced particularly strongly by uh, interviewees who really reported overwhelmingly that um, BOEM developed studies based on information needs that are identified in BOEM's assessments. We also asked survey respondents uh, what, um, what, what they consider when they submit study profiles or what they consider uh, when they're developing studies. And uh, just over half of survey respondents indicated that their own scientific work, including uh, work on assessments, was a source of study ideas, um, either their own study ideas or other study ideas. One of the interesting findings that came out of uh, this evaluation was that Boehm also pursued studies based on anticipated information needs for future assessments. So it wasn't just the case that Boehm was looking at assessments that had already been conducted, um, but was also really uh, thinking ahead and planning for what information would be needed uh, to inform future assessment documents um, and was building that also into its study design. We also looked at funding over time. Um, we coded the different uh, studies that had been funded over the past 20 years by topic area, and we did the same for uh, assessments. And within assessments, we looked specifically um, at trying to identify information needs that had been identified as part of the assessment process. And we found that overall, the topics uh, that had more identified information needs actually had total uh, higher studies funding. Um, so again, the correlation there suggests that there is um, a positive relationship uh, between where information needs are identified in the assessment process and what's being funded uh, under the studies process. However, while all of these indications are positive and confirm what we would um, what what we would hope and expect, um, the assessment documents themselves we found really don't comprehensively or systematically record information needs. Um, and this makes it very difficult to track what information needs exist and also to track over time the extent to which information needs are being identified um, or rather are being addressed. Um, and so this is one area that we'll be coming back to when we go into our recommendations is um, the, uh, this idea of being able to track from when an information need is identified um, to then seeing whether or how that information need is picked up in a study development profile and then ultimately reflected in, um, in an actual study that gets funded. Um, while all the evidence that we were able to piece together um, suggests that um, certainly this is happening, um, a more systematic uh, process um, and more systematic way of tracking information needs throughout the study development process would uh, certainly be very helpful um, for uh, being able to study this topic going forward. So a related question that we looked at under this project was um, when studies do address information needs, how well are they addressing them? Um, and for this, we looked specifically at how well studies are um, addressing the information needs that were identified in the study development profile. The overarching takeaway here is that study results do generally address the information needs identified in the study profiles. Um, however, there were a variety of reasons that came up in the interviews about why this doesn't always occur. Um, interviewees noted that in some cases, the information needs section of the study profile um, didn't include enough detail to sufficiently explain how Bowen would use the data from the study, um, which made it difficult to, uh, to, to be able to assess whether the study had actually fulfilled um, the information need that was identified. Um, in other cases, there was a disconnect between the person who authored the study profile and the individual who authored the statement of work to uh, carry out the study, which, um, again, interviewees reported in some cases could result in the study actually addressing an information need that was somewhat different from the original study profile. The survey responses also identified some challenges to Bowen pursuing an information need, even if it was developed into a study profile. Not all study profiles uh, move forward, um, and uh, this can include, um, oftentimes includes um, just limited funding, 
um, and not necessarily matching BOEM's highest priorities or the most pressing priorities um, for a given uh, study funding cycle. Um, there can also be a question of timing. Some information needs persist. Others are information needs that need to be addressed as part of um, informing a particular assessment. And if they're not addressed in that time frame, um, then they, they may not be able to uh, inform um, what prompted the information need. Um, so these are all, um, we think, important uh, caveats or nuances. Um, but again, the, these are nuances or caveats to the overarching finding, which is that in general, study results do address uh, the information needs that are identified in the study profile. And so our third question asked how the feedback loop functions. And within BOEM, this was really about trying to better understand the processes by which information needs are actually informing studies and how studies are informing assessments and how that information is exchanged between studies and assessment authors and across the Bureau. We started with um, some straightforward survey questions. We asked how, uh, how, how people learn um, about study findings within BOEM. As we can see on the slide, the top three responses were word of mouth, study reports, and presentations. Similarly, our interview respondents emphasized the importance of communication and collaboration as a really essential piece of the feedback loop. Um, and they noted that the communication of study results often occurs through informal uh, channels, which is consistent with the survey findings that word of mouth was a common communication method. So it's peers talking to peers, um, people exchanging information uh, with each other, um, sometimes through um, formal processes, but often through their um, personal or, or professional relationships. Survey respondents uh, were also asked, what was the most useful means of disseminating information about studies? Overall, they identified peer-reviewed articles, presentations, and um, study reports as the most useful means. Interestingly, the word of, uh, word of mouth um, was slightly lower on the list, although um, it was still um, seen as an important way of disseminating information. Um, and ESPIS was considered the least useful method. Um, it received critique from interviewees regarding the navigability or searchability of ESPIS. Um, although as we'll um, address uh, later on when we get to the recommendations, um, BOEM has actually um, taken actions uh, since this internal portion of the evaluation was conducted um, to, um, to really uh, address um, the critiques that were raised here. So getting back to this question of how information flows across the network, what we're showing here is um, a social network map. I realize there's a lot going on here, um, but uh, what this shows in general is the different clusters within BOEM and the arrows represent who's communicating with whom. Um, the dots uh, represent um, contacts within BOEM. Uh, not surprisingly, a lot of communication occurs um, within a particular office or within a particular program. Um, so uh, we see Alaska, the Pacific, OREP, Gulf of Mexico, MMP and headquarters. Um, the numbers that are associated uh, with each of these offices are the average number of intra office contacts. Um, what really stands out here from, um, from the network map, though, is how central headquarters is to communication. Um, it's not necessarily surprising that individuals exchange information within their respective offices, um, but notice how much of the information from one office to another actually flows through headquarters. Uh, and that could be because of presentations or, um, or meetings that could be uh, a result of information blasts that are sent. Um, it could be uh, because headquarters has um, common contacts with people uh, in different um, parts of the Bureau. Um, but, um, but, but that's really what stands out for us is the important role that headquarters plays 
in facilitating communication um, across the Bureau. Um, and it just really also reinforces the role that headquarters has to play in ensuring that there's good communication between offices and across different regions. Before I pivot to the external evaluation findings, um, I'll just pause here again and see if anyone has any anything to add or uh, any questions about what I've gone over so far. Go ahead, Scott. I, I have a question I, the, I, about this slide. I'm just trying to understand this slide. Mm -hmm. So for each of the regional offices, there's a number. What yes. does that number mean? That number is the average number of contacts within that office. So on average, people who identified themselves as being with the Alaska region reported having between seven and eight other contacts within the Alaska region with whom they exchange information on studies or assessments. Okay, so it's it 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 I guess it may have to do then with the size of the office to some degree. Is that it? That, that's that's fair to say. Um, that, that's that's fair to say. Um, and, and what are the circles connote? The, the office. Uh, the cir the circles um, connote the number of um, individuals uh, within the office who are uh, responding to the survey. I see. Okay. Okay. So. And then there's one out there that's a Pacific, a green out in the Pacific there. Is that somebody in Hawaii or something? I don't know what the, yeah. No, I would, I would have to check who, who specifically, um, who specifically that individual was. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't know offhand, I'm sorry. The colors, the colors are, uh, the colors kind of connote the office though. I mean, that's ideally what you're trying to show here. Right. That's then. that's right. That's right. And and not necessarily the physical location of the person. So that the one that's sure. in the Pacific that's associated with headquarters is probably there just because the lines are more easily seen to the I, to the connections they make to Alaska and OREP in the Pacific. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. This is Stacy speaking. Um and just uh another clarifying point on this slide before I turn to Les, uh, who also has his hand up. But the dots that are the circles that are outside of a yellow circle is that indicative of a contact that is not within a region or are the um mm. are the colors are the colors indicative of the of the regions and offices the, or are the yellow circles the colors are indicative of the regions or offices the yellow circles are indicative of clusters um, okay. which are defined um, uh, mathematically um, based on who's most densely uh, or closely connected to whom. In most cases, there's a fairly good degree of overlap between the circles and um, the different colors, indicating that clusters tend to be clustered by region or by headquarters. But um, as, as you pointed out in your question, that isn't, that, that isn't 100 percent true. Um, or universally the case. Excellent. Les? Yeah. Hi, Daniel. Um, there, If we consider different kinds of information ranging from raw empirical data that's just particulate and one timestamp all the way to process understanding that mm. leads to equations you can put in a model to make predictions. Um, is there any, were you able to get any sense of how successful BOEM has been in communicating about one kind of data versus another? Uh, in communicating about one kind of data versus another. Yeah, in other words, sharing information within BOEM particularly, but also outside about, okay, here's the state of the world. We have all these instantaneous data or mm -hmm. We've really been wondering what the impact of a floating wind installation is. And here are experimental and observational data that speak to that. And this is how you can now model it. It's a great question. And I can provide some general thoughts and would certainly in invite um, others to, to weigh in as well. Um, in, in terms of um, general observations about the most influential studies um, that stand out for me, 
Um, in many cases, it was a series of studies that was addressing a particular topic. So that topic might be how do marine mammals react to sound in a particular environment, for example, or what is the effect of um, of wind turbines in a particular um, in a particular geographic area. Um, but typically the examples that, again, at least stood out for me are were not one-time answers to very discrete questions. Um, it was knowledge that was accumulated over time through a series of studies. Um, and in some cases with kind of mini feedback loops where you know you you answer the question part of the way and then that gives rise to new questions um, that then give rise to new studies which gives rise to new uh, questions. And so then over time produces knowledge that's, um, you know, sort of seen as um, kind of the, the definitive state of the science on a particular topic. I know um, marine mammals, um, the, the, the impacts um, of, uh, of various types of um, disturbances on marine mammals um, and, um, Benthic communities were were two areas that were often cited as, um, you know, being really important um, areas that Boehm had contributed to through a series of um, studies and and research over time. Um, and then um, just what one other thoughts um, on on your question. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about study and assessments documents, um, but we did include data and models in here as well. Um, and so in cases where models or a common data set can be used um, multiple times uh, or repeatedly, it may be used to answer different questions. Um, but if we treat the model or the underlying data sets kind of on its own terms, there's, you know, a, a sort of outsized influence there just because of the different applications of the model um, or, or the data sets. Um, I, I hope that that helps answer that helps answer your question. Um, oh, yes, thank uh, you. Uh, Maura or others, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, I, I think that works. I think that there's a few different ways you can cut the data that when when you're tracking the links between the studies and this and the assessments. And we we coded them by topic area, um, and by region and by year, um, and um, uh and and so when we identified which were the most cited studies it was according to those cuts so there wasn't a cut that necessarily said was this a study that strictly collected data um uh and, versus whether or not it was an analysis to derive a relationship right so when we have the topic of marine mammals and that was one of the most cited topics in the assessments from the bone studies um, we don't we don't have the we don't have the cut of how much of that was just collecting data on population distribution, for example, versus the impact, uh, the effect of G and G surveys on marine mammals. Thank Still, you. OREP right. looks a little bit isolated, though. <laughs> You know, one really important uh, caveat here actually is that this internal evaluation was done just on the cusp of, or, or even just before um, the real, you know, major focus that we're seeing now on offshore wind. Um, and so this is an example of particularly this network map for the internal um, evaluation, um, which is what this is showing. Um, is something that is, you know, date stamped or time time stamped, and and may uh, I suspect could actually look different um, if we were to repeat this exercise even just today, as opposed to a couple of years ago when, or you know, a year and a half ago when when we did this map, particularly with respect to OREP. There's a uh, hand raised in the room, so Jake, I'll turn it to you next. Uh, hey everybody, uh, this is Jake uh, Levinson from Studies. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, of co-leading this study on the Bohm side with um, my colleague Mega Davidson, and uh, there was a, a nuance I wanted to point out, Daniel. That I hope you don't I hope you don't mind me chiming in here real quick. And yeah, that was please. About the uh, the studies that didn't cite, uh, I'm sorry, the assessments that didn't set cite a study, and I think that's 
uh, you know, in that, I can't remember what the universe was of the numbers. I think it was something like 50, 50 56 reports or something. And um, what that, the nuance there is that it could have cited a, a peer review publication that could have come out after the study report had mm -hmm. ended mm -hmm. uh, because we don't have sort of a, a, a centralized uh, citation analysis tool mm -hmm. that looks at the reach of our studies. Um, uh, we weren't able to sort of tabulate that. And I wanted to make sure that was clear that the, we were, when you talk about those 56 assessments, you're talking about strictly a, a studies report that's cited, not necessarily a peer review paper because linking those isn't always easy. Was that, did I, do I, do I have that right? Yes, absolutely. Um, and that was particularly uh, true of um of publications that came out after the uh, contract period, um, we, we were um, if if peer reviewed publications were developed during the contract period, um, they they tended to be reported. Um, but many times there's a delay um, between the study report and when the peer reviewed publication comes out, um, and those were harder to link. Um, just as right. you said, Jake, because there wasn't a, a centralized or you know systematic way of of tracking those links right so there's a lot of variability in how studies are organized and that sometimes a peer-reviewed paper we don't have the ability to control whether a paper is accepted or not um but uh sometimes during the period of performance uh a a draft paper could be submitted in which case we know something's coming down the pike in some cases uh, a contract ends but obviously people want to get that published in a peer-reviewed journal uh in a lot of cases and so afterwards they they might take on their own initiative to publish something um but it's not always you know it's not required to send us back you know a heads up a, hey we got we published this or sometimes the acknowledgement information might not be correct and things like that despite what we try and have in our contracts so that, that's all i wanted to chime in thanks daniel okay. thank you yeah, thank you jake really um insightful um clarification jeremy yeah i, I just wanted to note that that DOE, uh, sort of like Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and NREL, have moved to a model away from reports. Um, and, and it goes to sort of the comment of the slide on peer review. So that, um, one, they, people have a harder time getting into peer review if there's already a published report. Um, and so they've moved to a, a model with open access, but also with uh, uh PowerPoint slides being posted uh, and with webinars as far as information dissemination uh, and then the peer review publications uh, rather than the, the the more generic reports. And that may be a way to to move BOEM forward, particularly given uh, the 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 information that that the peer review publications are, are something that you like to start mm -hmm. support put mm -hmm. in the assessments and presumably that's going to strengthen the assessments against challenge too uh if they're reliant on peer review literature versus uh bone reports thank you thanks i don't see any other hands or cards in the room so if you want to continue go right ahead please. <clears throat> great thank you so now we're going to shift gears and talk about the external evaluation. Um, and by external, we just mean looking at the influence of BOEM science on the community outside of BOEM. And that was the overarching research question for, um, for the external evaluation. What is the impact of BOEM scientific research on the external environmental community, uh, which we define to include other federal agencies, state agencies and academia. The methodology uh, that we used was in many ways similar to the internal evaluation methodology. Uh, we conducted interviews with, um, I think and ended up being about 90 uh, external stakeholders. Um, and this was a very um, interview focused methodology, um, particularly for the external evaluation, because um, unlike within BOEM, um, where there is a comprehensive set of studies and where um, IEC was able, um, with input from BOEM, to um, sort of pull together an inventory of assessments, uh, externally, 
you know, environmental products that are produced by other state agencies, federal agencies, papers produced by academics um, are really, you know, very dispersed, very diffuse. There's no central universe or repository. Um, and so to understand how Boehm science has been used and the extent to which it's influenced the external science community, we really had to talk to the people who are in a position to use Boehm science. Um, we also conducted a survey of external stakeholders, and as part of that survey, we updated the social network analysis um, to see how Boehm's network looks, um, not only within different parts of Boehm, but when we expand to Boehm's connections uh, with the external community. Um, and then lastly, we did conduct a citation analysis. This included both a publication site <laughs> excuse me, citation analysis, which um, looked at the scholarly literature, as well as an external assessment citation analysis. And so um, to the extent possible, we tried to pull together an inventory of external assessments. And then we looked in that inventory of external assessments for citations to BOEM study products or to BOEM assessments. And we looked at two different types of use um, in the scholarly literature. These are often called instrumental use and incremental or conceptual use. Instrumental use, um, I tend to think of as sort of the smoking gun, where you can point to a specific study or set of studies and say that this directly informs a management decision, planning, or policy decisions. Incremental or conceptual use is more about how Boehm's research advances the state of the science over time. So it might not be a particular policy decision that you can point to where we say that study informed this policy decision, but people can recognize that Boehm has played a really important role advancing the state of science in a particular area. So we'll start with um, just an overview of some of the survey responses. And again, we've, uh, we're looking at survey respondents as external stakeholders. So this includes um, federal, state, uh, and academic respondents. We asked them where they most commonly receive their information on BOEM studies and BOEM assessments. Um, and the top response uh, for both studies and assessments was their direct interactions with BOEM staff. Um, they also noted the BOEM website, um, internet searches, ESPIS, conferences, um, and so forth. Um, but it was um, it, it was notable to us that it was these direct relationships or these direct interactions with BOEM that served as the primary means uh, by which external stakeholders receive information about BOEM science. Looking now at the external uh, network analysis, um, we found that external stakeholders are important disseminators of BOEM study and assessment results. And so one of the questions that we asked the external survey respondents was not just from whom do you receive your information about BOEM studies and assessments, but to whom do you further disseminate that information? And so the external survey respondents were um, actually able to identify other external organizations um, with whom they share um, BOEM science. And what this social network map shows at um, sort of a high level here um, is that um, you really have a ripple effect when these external organizations, um, whether they're federal, state and local, academic, et cetera, um, the colors um, denotes um, federal, state, local, academic, NGO, and so forth. When they start to then further disseminate that information with their uh, external contacts, um, it becomes um, it, it becomes a really important way of getting the results of BOEM science um, out there more broadly. And to put a little bit more detail on that, um, we found through the social network analysis that academic researchers and federal agencies like NOAA, USGS, and the Fish and Wildlife Service in particular really play a critical role in disseminating BOEM science outward to uh, other external stakeholders. Um, here, the uh, BOEM offices are illustrated in pink. Um, and uh, but, but our focus here is really on the non-pink 
dots and lines, these external uh, stakeholders. Um, it's uh, it's interesting to see um, who is and isn't featured um, prominently in the network map. The big universities, um, big agencies play an important role in um, receiving and then further disseminating BOEM science. Um, smaller agencies, um, you know, smaller uh, academic institutions like community colleges, um, smaller non-governmental organizations um, aren't as as prominent here um, in terms of um, facilitating the spread of information. Looking a little further at the social network analysis and also the interview findings, we find that BOEM staff are engaging regularly with trusted external stakeholders and collaborators. Um, and this helps extend the reach of BOEM science beyond the Bureau. Um, conversely, it can also make it difficult to further expand BOEM's network beyond that core group of trusted stakeholders. Um, interactions generally occur among a more limited group of organizations and individuals, and reliance on closely held relationships with recurrent collaborators um, may limit expansion of BOEM's network and therefore the reach and influence of BOEM science. Um, this came out uh, during some of the interviews with external stakeholders. Um, some academic interviewees shared their perception that BOEM doesn't offer many opportunities for early career scientists um, or uh, emerging scientists. Um, there was also uh, a sense on the part of some state agency staff, um, particularly those who were newly involved in planning for offshore winds, um, that it was, you know, really necessary to have that direct connection with, um, with individuals at BOEM, and that if they didn't have that direct connection or that direct relationship with particular individuals within the Bureau, um, they felt in some cases that, um, that it was really hard to sort of fully get in on, um, on, on what was going on. Um, there are a series of uh, valuable long-term connections. Um, we, we interviewed many of them, and um, these long-term connections are really critical for building institutional knowledge and ensuring continuity. Um, although over time, um, there may be some, um, some side effects, whether that's entrenchment in, in terms of um, the way that people are thinking about different topics or operations. Um, or ways of thinking about um, ocean science. So that's that's how information is exchanged and how collaboration is happening um, uh, across the Bureau and with external stakeholders. We also looked for uh, the extent to which and examples of where BOEM study products or BOEM assessments are, um, are being used uh, by external stakeholders and how they're influencing external stakeholders outside of BOEM. We found that BOEM study products are consistently cited in external assessments. Um, mm -hmm. Of the 240 or so external assessments that we were able to identify, meaning assessments that were not primarily authored uh, by BOEM, um, we found that over half cited at least one BOEM study. Um, and the average number of BOEM studies cited by all external assessments was just under four. Um, it's interesting to note how assessments vary across the, uh, or citations rather vary across different types of external assessments um, and by uh, different types of, um, of agencies. Uh, another, and which is shown on the right of the slide, another notable finding was that assessments with some level of BOEM involvement had more citations of, um, of BOEM science, uh, which is um, not a surprising finding, but, um, but is a notable one. I mentioned that we also looked at the scholarly literature. Um, and what this slide shows is a distribution of citations um, to BOEM studies or, um, or really more commonly BOEM study products um, that are cited in the scholarly literature. And this is the results of citations of journal publications resulting from BOEM studies as shown in Google Scholar. Some of the feedback uh, that we received um, as part of the first-in-class study, um, as we were and as we were um, 
engaging with COSA members on our preliminary study findings and our methodology for the external evaluation was different ways to extend the citation analysis. Um, and one of the um, key suggestions was to look not only at the total number of citations of different BOEM studies um, or study products, but also to look at those citations relative to other literature in a similar field um, and for a similar period of time. So in other words, a BOEM study product might have been uh, cited in the scholarly literature 500 times, um, but how does that compare to other non-BOEM studies that address similar topics and that were published in similar years? Were they also cited 500 times or were those other products cited a thousand times or, um, or less frequently? Um, and so we pushed this analysis um, as far as we could. And we found that the top referenced and cited BOEM publications are influential publications within their respective fields. Um, not just based on the total number of times that these publications were kind of cited um, in absolute terms, but also relative to other publications that address a similar topic um, and that were published at similar times. Um, we, I, I said we pushed this as far as we could because coming back to, um, to Jake's comment earlier on, um, we were uh, limited in that we didn't have access to a citation service. Um, so there are citation services available um, that actually track this information and calculate these metrics in a very comprehensive and systematic way. Um, they're expensive. Um, we uh, explored some options and um, you know received quotes in uh, the six figures. Um, for a subscription. And so ultimately we ended up doing a manual search one publication at a time based on uh, what we were able to access um, based on what was publicly available. And we were able to do that for a subset of 60 uh, articles, um, but having access to a subscription service would have allowed us to do this comprehensively. As part of the survey, we asked respondents to tell us to what extent BOEM science influences their decision-making or how it influences them. Um, and we found from the survey responses that BOEM science does seem to directly influence decision-making outside of the Bureau, particularly in the context of coastal and marine resource management for federal and state agencies. 84% of respondents reported using information from BOEM uh, studies to inform their future research, um, as well as informing uh, specific policy decisions. And this was also true for BOEM assessments. Um, we also see a um, you know, a good amount of use of BOEM information to develop environmental, social, or economic assessments, um, to develop mitigation measures, to inform policies, uh, and to teach others. Through the interviews, we asked for more specific examples or more specific ways in which BOEM science is influential on external stakeholders. And the conclusion that we reach um, is that BOEM studies do fill critical knowledge gaps and meaningfully advance ocean scientific research this slide summarizes um, by some of the general categories uh, of influence that we identified through the interview process. This includes generating new uh, information on the impacts of offshore renewable energy, advancing basic scientific research, informing funding decisions, contributing to publicly available databases, informing natural resource decision-making and policy developments at multiple jurisdictional levels and informing stakeholder understanding of ocean science. Now, in terms of how this information is conveyed and who's able to um, engage with it, uh, we did find that BOEM study reports and data uh, tend to be geared towards more technical audiences in the science community um, and certainly meet their needs. Um, but we also found that BOEM science may not be readily understood by less technical stakeholders, including some decision makers. 
So experienced technical and scientific efforts, uh, uh, um, experts uh, are, you know, engaged, they're understanding um, what they're reading in BOEM study reports, uh, but um, less experienced individuals or people who don't have scientific training um, have a harder time engaging in, uh, in BOEM scientific products. So BOEM um, could actually improve the use of its science and make it more generally accessible um, with additional attention to communicating scientific findings in a more accessible way to more general audiences. The relatively limited extent of the non-technical communication of study findings can be challenging for external stakeholders who rely heavily on BOEM science to inform policy. BOEM study reports and assessment reports are long and they're complex, particularly for people who don't have scientific backgrounds. Um, we did find that data portals are useful resources for learning about BOEM study results. Um, although some interviewees mentioned that BOEM data could be more user-friendly um, or that data sets could be prepackaged, um, for example, for use with GIS software. Um, so overall, there's a, a strong appetite for the information, but um, different levels of ability to engage with um, the information uh, in the way that it's shared. Before I move on to uh, recommendations, let me pause uh, for any comments or uh, questions. Uh, Daniel, there's a there's a number of comments in the chat um, oh, that I could potentially um, walk through here. Great. Um, I think starting with uh, well, Jessica, thank you for answering the question for the study period. I don't have an easy way to navigate these um, questions here, but. Um, Okay. Um, so Mid Atlantic and Southern states, how are they covered? And oh, I and I I do apologize for missing these questions. It looks like these go back a, a ways. Yeah, I think um, the on. I think the ones that start for the external evaluation where we started was um, uh, whether or not that whether or not that will be peer reviewed. Um, this whether. I'm sorry. It says that will be another question. What is the metric for peer review? Conference presentations or full publications? If the publication is not accepted, will it be retroactively updated in the assessment? We were looking at um, at published at at, um, at publications that were um, in a peer reviewed journal, so peer reviewed journal articles um, that were published. So, um, if an article was submitted for peer review but not accepted, or uh, if it was in the peer review process, but hadn't completed that process yet, it would not have been captured in our analysis. Uh, and there's another question here about why is an industry, wind, oil, and gas, solar, and others included in the outreach? Um, they have very robust data sets. Um, and then uh, relatedly, does BOEM share completed studies with relevant trade associations? And I responded there that, that industry was included in the outreach where BOEM highlighted contacts in industry. Um, uh, we have a full list of, in table three of the external assessment and there are several um, uh, survey participants described as being related to industry, though there is a mention that in the slides, industry wasn't represented in the metrics listing of categories. So I, I apologize, I don't know which slide that was referring to. That one came from uh, Ann Carpenter. I don't know if you want to try to go back, Daniel. Yeah, and Mara, I'll just interrupt for a moment while um, if he's looking for that um, to know we do have a couple of hands raised in the room. Um, and I just want to make sure too that we leave a little bit of time at the very end for some questions also. So um, yep. I don't know how much time is needed for the recommendations portion, but I don't want to shortchange that by any means. So okay. Um, just give folks um yeah um, um I oh slide 29. Okay. Yes. Um, oh, are you're referring to maybe the um the the key, the legends here? Yeah, I think oh, it might okay. be one more slide further back. Slide 28. Here. There's 
Yeah, but it, there's a grouping of NGO, nonprofit, private. Is that right, Danielle, there? That's right. Um, and that just, um, we, we didn't have, um, we, we, we didn't have a lot of private um, uh, or um, corporate responses to the survey. Um, so we grouped them with other types of uh, non-governmental organizations, but, um, uh, you know, I certainly take the point that um, qualitatively, there's an important distinction between a, a, a private business entity versus a nonprofit or NGO. Excellent, thank you. Scott and Rod, did you each have your hands up or was it just to get to that point? Yeah, it's good. Okay, Go yep. We'll go ahead, Daniel, and let you wrap up the presentation. Great, great. Thanks for all the all, all the good um, questions and inputs. So for recommendations, we're not going to have time to talk through all of them, which is fine. Um, I've included all of them on the slides um, so that if the slides or the recording are distributed afterwards, um, there's a record of all our recommendations, but I'll just uh, touch on some of the highlights. Um, so starting with um, internal evaluation recommendations, which really focus on uh, processes within BOEM. Um, one of our primary uh, recommendations for the internal evaluation was to organize and strengthen the process for tracking information needs across BOEM. Um, and I mentioned that before that, you know, well, certainly um, there was widespread agreement and uh, there were indications in the paper trail that um, studies are addressing information needs. There really wasn't a systematic process um, to be able to track information needs from when the need is identified to um, whether or how it's addressed. Um, and so our recommendation um, includes uh, a series of um, steps uh, that could be taken either altogether or um, partially um, to uh, organize and strengthen that process um, for really tracking information needs um, from when they're identified um, as the result of an assessment or in anticipation of future assessments, all the way to when they're submitted in a study profile and perhaps ultimately funded um, as a study. One of our other recommendations from the internal evaluation was to expand the functionality and usability um, of ESPIS um, to make it um, a even more useful resource to obtain study information. Um, since publishing the internal uh, or um, submitting the internal evaluation, um, BOEM has recently uh, released the Environmental Studies Program Hub or the ESP Hub. Um, and this was uh, intended to improve the searchability of BOEM ESP reports um, and also GovInfo uh, houses all environmental studies program reports, and the information can now be found through um, Google Scholar. Um, so this is um, an important step that's been taken since we developed um, the internal evaluation and made this recommendation. Um, if this uh, study were, um, or projects like this were repeated or updated in the future, um, you know, a potential next step would be to uh, to look at the usefulness and effectiveness of the ESP hub um, and, you know, the extent to which it's addressed some of the critiques that um, were previously made about ESPIS. The second uh, recommendation, uh, main high-level recommendation on this slide is to improve communication regarding the process for prioritizing studies uh, to increase transparency. We didn't get into this um, during the presentation today, but the internal survey um, responses um, and interview responses indicated um, a sense that, you know, when study profiles were not accepted for funding or when um, study development profiles were created and included in the plan, but couldn't ultimately be funded, that um, perhaps it was because they didn't um, address BOEM's priorities, or perhaps the authors hadn't been able to fully convey how their idea addresses BOEM's priorities. And so um, this recommendation was partly um, in response to, um, to that information um, to just um, continue to be really clear about the process for how studies are prioritized so that everyone's on the same page and can better target their study ideas. One of our other key recommendations from the internal evaluation 
um, was to create a central location for storing and accessing all BOEM assessments. Um, and so at the time we did our internal evaluation, there was no central repository for uh, BOEM assessments the way that there was for BOEM studies. For BOEM studies, we had ESPIS. Um, for assessments, we actually um, spent a lot of time working with BOEM to identify relevant documents. We did a lot of web scraping, a lot of web searches, um, really a, a, quite a bit of sleuthing and, um, and programming uh, and coding analysis to be able to um, identify and then download uh, all of the various assessments. And sometimes uh, they were in locked files or um, otherwise um, couldn't be downloaded. And so there's just a lot of effort that went into compiling that assessment inventory because the effort hadn't been undertaken before. Um, more recently, uh, BOEM has um, actually um, created uh, SOX, S-O-C-S, um, this is uh, this has been beta tested, and we understand that uh, it will be coming soon. Um, and our understanding is that this will be an assessments database, um, including all of the assessments that were identified in the assessments inventory for the evaluating connections projects. Um, but as long as this uh, inventory is maintained and continues to be updated. Um, you know, as new assessments come online, that would make it significantly easier to repeat this type of uh, process in the future. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to the external uh, evaluation recommendations. And one of our key recommendations uh, resulting from the external evaluation was to improve the ways in which BOEM tracks impacts on the wider environmental science community. Um, and the primary recommendation here is to invest in a citation analysis service. Uh, our report um, identifies several different options um, that we identified. These citation analysis services um, are you know, expensive to subscribe to, um, but would uh, certainly um, provide a great deal of, of insight and a much more systematic and comprehensive look um, at uh, the influence of BOEM science as reflected in the scholarly literature. In addition to investing in a citation analysis service, uh, BOEM can also use Google Analytics to track um, web traffic on the ESP hub. Where possible, we recommend that um, BOEM track uh, BOEM source data downloads from data portals that BOEM contributes to um, as additional measures of uh, the dissemination and use of BOEM science. Um, and we also recommend requesting information about potential uses of study information by co-developers outside of BOEM. Um, the study development profiles currently include a space to list co-developers. Identifying how the co-developers uh, will use that information would be informative. Um, we're not recommending that that necessarily influence BOEM's funding decisions about what studies to fund or not, um, but it would provide um, a helpful point of reference uh, to follow up in the future about how studies that um, that do get funded uh, might have been used by um, external stakeholders. Drawing on the results of the social network analysis, um, our overarching recommendation here is expand BOEM's network. Um, that includes planning for institutional uh, knowledge loss or staff turnover by building relationships and funding studies led by emerging or early career scientists who are new to BOEM's network. And it also includes outreach to uh, institutions, including universities beyond where BOEM funded scientists are currently uh, located, um, as well as making sure that information about specific BOEM staff and points of contact is available online um, as a possible point of entry for people who don't currently have um, a connection to someone at BOEM. I also wanted to mention here, part of this recommendation was to actively target and track engagement with scientists at minority serving institutions or MSIs, and that institutions that have not historically um, had scientists who received BOEM studies funding. Okay. 
Our next set of recommendations is to uh, develop and implement a plan for extending effective information dissemination. Um, in short, the idea here is to make uh, BOEM science accessible um, or more accessible to non-technical stakeholders. Um, and that can include um, uh, summaries and layperson's terms about different study themes um, or providing more concise abstracts or um, fact sheets and making sure that that information is easy to use. Um, that concludes our slides, and I also know see that we are at time, so um, let me pause here. Thank you so much, Daniel and Maura. Uh, we'll take a couple of minutes for questions, um, but I do want to reserve some time for a break for those in the room. So I'll start with um, Jake and then Scott. Yeah, thanks. Um, this is, uh, I just wanted to make a, a quick uh a quick caveat also to, to one thing Daniel said about um, the early career uh, scientists and the uh, minority serving institutions and things like that. Um, our national studies list captures a uh, who the prime contractor is, whether it's an interagency agreement or whether it's with NOAA or it's a uh, a contract with with whatever or or a cooperative agreement with an academic institution. It doesn't capture if there are subcontractor relationships on that. So we have uh, many studies that mm -hmm. might have a prime contractor, um, but uh, but could have other things as subcontractor under that. So uh, that is a nuance that isn't captured that is just important to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for this presentation, and thanks to Bohm for undertaking this, this study. Uh, as somebody who was on the first-in-class uh, study, um, uh, I greatly appreciate seeing this uh, recommendation come to fruition. Uh, as somebody who was around when we first talked about the need for something like this, some sort of look back on of this type, I also greatly appreciate the fact you've done it. So well done. Um, uh, and and I think the, the first piece of advice I'd give you is, is after you take your victory lap, plan when you're going to do your next one because you want to keep it evergreen. This is uh, having... Those of us who've been in the business, uh, uh, we understand uh, uh, look backs on a on a regular basis of your activities where you actually measure how you did relative to what you thought you were going to do is, is an extremely valuable way to keep yourself on track. So I, I commend you and I, I just encourage you to schedule the next one. I have a question about this this study. I, I, I'm assuming it focused on everything that was included in the environmental studies program is that all, basically anything that came out of funded out of that effort right the, the, all that those studies what about studies that were funded by some of the other um research funds that operational funds that boem has which is not inconsiderable as i understand i mean i i'm aware of some other studies uh that we don't often see um or are, are they include were they included in this look back as well or not? Uh, only if they received at least some funding from the environmental studies program. So they didn't have to be funded entirely uh, with ESP funding. But if they received no ESP funding, then they were not included. And in they were not included. Program. That's okay. And 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 of, of the total spend of um, research money that goes out from BOEM, how much of it is coming out of ESP and what, and you have an estimate of what comes out of kind of the operational pots, just kind of getting a, is it 50, 50, is it 25, 75? What's, what's your gut, gut feel about that guys? I'm guessing Brad's at the table to respond to this. <laughs> yeah, so we'll talk about this tomorrow. Uh, but first of all, uh, for bone folks, don't do environmental studies outside of the environmental studies program. We've already been yelled at about that once. Um, so, We'll talk about this tomorrow. Um, I did a look back a couple of years ago uh, and then started tracking how much quote, you know, anything that meets the the definition of an environmental study for BOEM. Um, and I think where we're averaging somewhere between, you know, 25 and $35 million per year for the environmental studies program. Um, I would say the, the biggest years where folks were, were, uh, conducting studies outside of the environmental studies program. Uh, hopefully we knew about most of them. We did know about most of them. Uh, and they were partnered with through the environmental studies program with a, with a best small cost share. Uh, but there were some that were not done uh, with the knowledge of the environmental studies program. 
Um, we'll wag our fingers at people for that. Uh, but the biggest years were somewhere around like two and a half, three million dollars of research that were done outside of the environmental studies program. Okay. And most years, almost all of that was uh, captured under the ESP uh, through the process we have to add things to the national studies list using operational funds. So it sounds like it's a fairly small percentage Pretty of, the small. of the total total yeah. investment. Okay. Yeah. And that stuff probably though was, unless there were some ESP dollars in it, it was, included, was not included in this look back. Yeah, so I think my understanding is if there were no ESP funds in this, it was not included. Thank but that would be a very small number of, of studies over Thank the you. years. Bill? Yeah, I just add, I, I don't have numbers for you, but um, but I, the broader question is research that's not environmental, too, if I heard that right. And I, that's, that is pretty limited. Okay. Okay. Maybe we'll talk about some of that yeah, more tomorrow. Yeah, we can so, talk about it tomorrow. What, yeah, so what does yeah. get captured under okay. an environmental study and what, okay. what isn't? Got okay. it. I'm not seeing any other tenth cards. Go ahead, Rod. So I had a quick question about um, the ITMs, the information transfer meeting. So um, early on in the presentation, there was a discussion about or a slide that provided information about how information is transferred. And one of those bullets was word of mouth and another one was presentations. Yeah, yeah. Did, did that include the ITMs? And I was the reason I was a little confused was because later on one of the recommendations was to commit to regular communication of studies through formal channels, which then I thought, well, maybe that is the ITM, so. James? We didn't, oh, sorry, go. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Daniel. I was, I was going to say the um, the ITMs were not um, called out in the survey responses as a standalone category. Um, so um, when people responded with presentations, um, they they could have been including ITMs um, there, but we didn't ask um, specifically about ITMs. Thank you. Bill, gonna, if I can, I'm going to take that as a as a softball that I may, might hit back, which is uh, we um, I, I think there's a general uh, shared consensus in the environmental program that we need to get together more. And we just spent the last uh, uh, yesterday and the day before with representatives from all the environmental program at a retreat and Shepherdstown mm -hmm. near there. And um, one of the key points there that a lot of people pointed out was that uh, study profiles are, there's a lot of back and forth discussion, but it's become more transactional. And a lot, and the result is that a lot of the study profiles developed by the regions and programs are pretty well baked by the time they get laid on the table that we, mm -hmm. we don't have a good, probably annual get together before things are baked very much to present those, you know, in, and I'm talking internal uh, and find commonalities and challenge and so forth. So we're, I'm very interested. I, pl I plan to uh, uh, do what I can to push to have an annual uh, uh, get together of the environmental program. And then apropos of your question about the ITMs, I, I know the, I know the Gulf representatives were very excited about trying to have uh, uh a more regular ATM uh, set of set of meetings, which are, are different than the, the get together on the profile. So, mm -hmm. I, I I think we should do more of that. Yeah, and, and so I just consulted with uh, with Ari um, to make sure I was right in my recollection. So the Gulf operational funds funded the ITMs themselves. However, and Rodney can correct me on this, my recollection was that while the ITMs were still sort of active and, and going on, uh, there was a requirement in studies uh, that were conducted in COR by Gulf of Mexico staff that they would come and present at the ITMs when those studies Thank were you. finished. Um, so I don't know how that would be captured here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't I don't necessarily think that would be captured here. Um, but while the Gulf ITMs were going on, they did have a requirement to present 
at the ITM when that study was was finished or nearly finished. Um, and then for like the Alaska Marine Science Symposium, um, we have not, we didn't, I, I, and Jim, I, I don't remember us ever having requirements for BOEM funded folks to present at the ITM, but pretty much everybody did. Right. Uh, and the Arctic session mm -hmm. was pretty much 90% uh, BOEM funded stuff. Um, and awesome people like Katrin were were there often and, and doing all sorts of great stuff. Um, so I don't know the capture that way, but there were no direct studies funding for for those things. Um, and what would have been captured was uh, like conference sponsorship for like things like the Alaska Marine Science Symposium, but those were pulled out uh, as not being a study because they were a conference sponsorship. So, so I'm going to be a little shameless and just ask, do, do the COSA members have views on whether it would be a good idea for the environmental staff to do what we're talking about more. I think it would be an excellent idea. Um, uh, I think one of the, I mean, having worked, and in, in, I'd be interested in Laurie's perspective from from one of our fiercest competitors, but uh, to keep our technical staff at their sharpest level, we would routinely every year, oftentimes twice a year, have major technical sessions where people would come and show the results of their technical projects and an opportunity to show the results of studies that, that, that have been undertaken, the, the, the so what of the study, also the ones that didn't work. So people can learn from that as well. Uh, lessons learned, that's extremely valuable for the staff. And uh, it's also a morale builder, I think. And uh, I would I would encourage you, and it sounds like presentations are pretty damn effective in BOEM. When you do them, it sounds like people get something out of it. And your, your own staff are your best communicators and going on to the outside. So I think it's a win, win, win. So uh, I would strongly encourage you to consider that. Thank you. Les, before I turn to you, I want to just check in with Brianna, um, who's our next presenter up at 3.30. Brianna, do you have um, some flexibility in your time such that if we start your session late, that won't be problematic? Yes, I have some flexibility. Fantastic. Thank you so much for for. Um, allowing us to continue this conversation and still provide those in the room a, a brief break. Um, so Les, I will give you uh, the last chance for a question and then we'll take any responses to that before we move on. Okay, try to be quick. Um, first of all, I applaud all these efforts and it's wonderful to see these results. And in the short time I've been working with BOEM, I think there's been a marked improvement in the in the intellectual culture. But I do have a, a special question, <laughs> and that's about the ambiguity about the technical capabilities that BOEM wants to develop in-house uh, as opposed to other agencies. And a key example is our relationship with NCOS, BOEM's relationship with NCOS, where NCOS is now doing spatial analysis. But I've been involved with Jake, as you've heard, um, on a on a study to develop dynamic analysis. Would those advanced technical capabilities live in BOEM uh, so that that can be something BOEM develops or is it something that's gonna be offloaded to another agency? Who makes those decisions? Uh, yeah, I make all the budgetary decisions and uh, would have a staff of 10 and uh, I, I don't. I guess I, I don't really have a good answer for that, Bill. I, 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 I we. Need, I mean, it's the same thing with things like OECM and stuff like that, right? We need our mm -hmm. own capable team of that can live and breathe this stuff. But I think we're always going to need the external expertise as well. I think it's a combination of both. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the the big challenges that we have now is. We're just we're spread really thin, and uh, and having people that can dive that deep into the things that require this level of technical expertise is a is a real challenge. Yeah, and I, I guess I'll say I, I agree with what Jake said, and you, know, you really have to approach these things on a case by case basis, and you know look at the resources of your partner and so forth. But but an example where where Bohm actually is probably the uh, the deepest. Uh, traveler is on the uh, Center for Marine Acoustics, where there, there are a lot of experts, but we've developed a large enough staff that we're really leading from a technical point of view, and I'm very comfortable we can sustain that. Yes, yeah, so can I just, I'm just going to chime in with one other quick thing. I mean, 
Les, uh, uh, I mean, I think we probably have talked about this too, but I, and I think if if Jen Bosica is on the line, maybe she'd chime in too. But uh, I think if 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 I had my way for things like like EBM, I guess it's a priority case by case basis, like you said. If it's something that we need a large team for, I just don't know how how we pull the trigger on uh, you know the the budget side of things. But um, if I could put Jen on the spot, um, I'd love to do that too, if she wants to. Um, well. Uh, yeah, sure, Jake. I don't. I honestly, less don't think I have anything to add beyond Bill's sort of case by case. I mean, you know, for the dynamic modeling, our next uh, step is the strategy, right? And how does it move forward, and where does that expertise live? So, um, certainly, that's that's on the agenda for the next year. Yeah, this may just be a little bit of chauvinism. I feel like we work work hard on things, and it's nice to see professional development at Boeing. Yeah, I, I think there are some places where we where we do still keep those things in house. I mean, so so Bill mentioned the CMA, uh, with air quality, uh, a lot of air quality modeling work, as well as the oil spill uh, risk analysis work. That's all done in house. Uh, and again, the new stuff will be case by case. Uh, but just for for clarity, uh, one of the reasons that we are leaning on NCOS uh, so hard for these uh, these new analyses that we talked about earlier today uh, was that they actually got funding for that. And so when we came to them and said, hey, we need to start doing this stuff, they said, hey, that's great. And we'll do it for you for free because we got money for it. Uh, so that was just a great piece where, um, you know, two agencies are getting what they need, uh, coordinating. Uh, and, uh, you know, from Bones' perspective, we, we didn't have to pay anything for it. So, yeah, it's also well, great well, to work with. Them. Yeah, just uh, and uh, to, but yeah, I, I'm on board with all of the staff. Uh, Another area where we might be the leaders, we are in oil spill risk assessment. So why not uh, uh, carbon release risk assessment? Yeah. And, you know, there's really close connection. Excellent. On that note, I'm going to insist we take a break. Um, it is 3.32 now, um, and I don't want to push Brianna back too much. So if we could aim to be back... Um, well, you know what? Let's go ahead and make it 345. Brianna, if that's problematic for you for any reason, please let me know. Uh, we will push back the uh, discussion session that we have at the end and abbreviate that. Um, but 345, please be back in the room and ready to go. No worries. Yeah. So one of the things that I do want to share is some of the outreach that BOEM has been participating in to get some um, interaction and engagement with the um, different science-related conferences and um, minority-serving institutions. So recently, we had a number of people in representation from across DOI attending the 2023 Society for Advancing of uh, Chicano, Hispanic, and Native Americans. This was a um, and a science national diversity of STEM workshop that was taking place in Portland, Oregon. So we had a presence there. We were able to um, talk to multiple students um, at that conference. And it was a guesstimated amount of like 5,000 students at that event. And this is something that BOEM is going to continue to participate with. Um, we were also part of the, um, the Washington's um, White House um, HBCU conference week that was held in Allerton, Virginia. And so as we are finding ways to connect with the diverse uh, uh, background and skill set, we are trying to also put our face out there in front of the public and the students to get them more informed about what we are doing here at Bowman to gauge interest in um, the type of projects and, and activities we do here. So I did want to mention that. But the um, going back to the human capital strategic plan, that was a recent plan. It was um, before for the fiscal period of 2024 to 2028. Um, and uh, the strategic plan key objectives is to um, shape the future of bone and reflect on our commitment to recruit, retention um, for our employees, and making sure we have a diverse equity and inclusion and accessibility workforce. So that um, strategic plan is now um, made available to all in BOEM to have a step and guideline on how we can accomplish that goal. 
Um, last time we talked about the DEIA strategic step down implementation plan. We talked about the um, the DOI strategic plan. And these are some of the things that we have so far in BOEM trying to really champion diversity in our science. Okay, so there was a couple of evaluation questions that were in the report, and I wanted to kind of address some of these areas of um, sample questions that we here in BOEM are trying to really think about and evaluate ourselves on to see if we are hitting the mark. So um, just to kind of wrap up some of the ideas here um, regarding the, the, the questions, so um, I will say for the first one, how how um, the organization characterize and implement distinction distinction between the surface level diversity and that deep diversity and that deep diversity, like I mentioned before, is going beyond you know um, uh, race and gender and, and sexual orientation, but is going to culture and looking at uh, people experience in expertise in many different areas. So one of the things that BOEM has really been focusing on is trying to, for the area that we know we need a system with, um, we're, we did a uh, environment to justice um, forum. So this was a, um, a effort that is um, created for, for the interaction between New York and New Jersey offshore wind environment to justice um, communities. And I think they are in the process of having their meeting, um, if not this month, the upcoming month, but I believe it's already in process now. Um, but this is a way for, for, for us to hear from the communities that may be impacted with some of the work we're doing here in Bone. Um, we also are focusing more on trying to get um, tribal representation um, or, or um, staff in the right offices to be able to connect and, and, and help us communicate effectively and also hear what the tribes are saying. So um, there's been a number of um, recruitment actions and announcements that went out from the Office of Environmental Programs, Office of Renewable Energy, as well as the Gulf recently um, recruiting, trying to recruit the tribal expat aspects of things and trying to understand um, from their lens of how how the, the work here in BOEM impacts uh, certain areas that um, we can really benefit from. So this is trying to understand that the work that we're doing here in BOEM um, and the impacts um, culturally and also in these underrepresented uh, populations. Okay, and um, let's see. So one of the other questions was, um, we actually did hire our first BOEM ever diversity and inclusion officer um, a couple months back. We we're super excited to have her. Her name is Lisa Broadway. She will be helping us standing up the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and Accessibility, I'm sorry, Diversity and Inclusion and Human Capital uh, within BOEM. And their focus is, is going to really be trying to find um, processes and, and places where we can make um, a BOEM a great place to work, making sure there's uh, access to the different resources we have in BOEM, um, education opportunities to understand the diverse culture in BOEM, and also be able to recruit that diverse workforce that we're looking forward to have. And then um, we currently, the criteria that was being used to measure some of these um, these uh, areas that is identified in the question, we currently are using information from the Fed's survey to get us a, a baseline of where we compare with other departments and federal agencies and also um, larger um, agencies that um, are relatively the size of, of, of federal government. And we also are trying to understand the information and data that we are able to receive from USA Job Staffing. Um, there's a backside where we can get data from applicants that are interested in a position that we may put out there. And the data can tell us 
if they self-identify themselves, um, their race, their gender, their location, if they were uh, made it to the qualification stage, um, if they were selected or not. So um, the Office of Human um, Capital is working with the different um, bureaus trying to gather that information to see if there are some discrepancies on um, the people that are considered qualified, the diverse their diversity and if they are actually being hired. So there's some beginning analysis being done in that data collection process. Um, but later on, um, I will kind of point out some areas that we might need uh, some assistance with or some, some expertise on. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and talk about um, I think I kind of wrapped up some of the examples that we are doing to um, really move forward with fostering a diversity, uh, diverse uh, culture within BOEM. And with all this work that we have been doing, and we've been working with a lot of our, our counterparts across BSE, as well as um, the department level, trying to really shape up how we are um, really uh, focusing and driving our attention and commitment to a diverse workforce, we do have some information from the Feds 2022 data. And um, I think right here is a comparison of how we um, perform against the government and the De Department of Interior overall. And our overall uh, index for diversity, uh, equity, inclusion, accessibility is around 83%. Um, and that's a pretty good number, but we still have a ways to go. We want to continue to work and improve and increase that number. Um, I also wanted to share that this is a new measure that is being um, tracked in the Fed's results. Um, and I'm pretty sure that uh, we're, we're going to continue to track this information. Um, we really want to, to make it clear, and, and there is certain crap criteria and questions in each category to identify these different um, subsets within the index. So they they are really trying to find something that is measurable and get input from the existing workforce to see how we are um, measuring up as a bureau against the department and government overall. And then this is how we compare to um, the other small, large, medium agency. So government is usually considered to be a very large agency with over 75,000 employees. So uh, we obviously are doing really well compared to large industry, but we want to do better. Um, we want to get this, this um, index for our Fed's result as close to um, perfect as possible. Perfect is not... Um, this is something for us to strive towards, but we understand that there's areas that we're going to have to, to tighten up and address. And that brings me to the next slide here is the questions that BOEM needs to address. And we're hoping that the, um, the Academy can help us with some of these questions and such as what are the best practices that are in, identified to uh, look at these barriers in our recruitment processes this is something that is part of our strategic plan and step down plan about identifying barriers um, and our processes on bringing diverse talent in. Um, but we would love to understand what are some of those best practices from other industry or other agencies um, so we can use those as a starting point. Um, how can we address those um, barriers that are identified, um, rectified, um, um, so that they can no longer be obstacles for, for diverse talent and what parameters and practices can BOEM implement to eliminate these barriers. So those are some questions that I just wanna throw out there. Um, just looking at where we are with some of the action items in our strategic plan, realizing that this is one area that um, we have not done too much work on uh, besides gathering some some rough data from um, the USA job um, application pool, but we most definitely can uh, find ways of improvement there. So I will conclude the presentation and will 
open it up for any questions or clarifying statements. Brianna, thank you so much for that presentation. I know this is a topic that um, folks on COSA have been um, eager to hear more about and receive these updates on, so very much appreciated. I will open it for questions. Yes, uh, th thank you very much. Uh, that was really useful to, to get a good understanding of where BOEM is. I, I got three questions, um, and, and they all sort of relate to the environmental studies program. So do you have data on diversity in the environmental studies program versus BOEM proper? since that's sort of our bailiwick. And then um, is BOEM, does BOEM have any data on uh, diversity in the, the individuals that it gives money to? Um, and then related to that, a number of agencies are beginning to require um, various kinds of diversity and community engagement as part of uh, their research or proposals and such, and is is BOEM requiring uh, moving in that direction uh, as well? So uh, thank you. Okay, I'll take a stab at addressing those questions. So the first question regarding, um, is there a way that we can get data um, for the diversity in the science program? Um, I think this is a step of getting where we currently have data that we can break out with the different subject matter expertise and the different career fields that um, are within the the um, the agency. Um, we do not have data specifically to the environmental program. Um, I know that there is a very um, a very um, structured process on getting certain subject matter experts uh, within the study development program. And so while they are reviewing profiles, they have subject matter experts for certain oceanographers, for um, birds. Um, and so they're, they're called, um, if I'm not mistaken, the STAR team, who are um, a collective group of individuals that should have a diverse background. How those individuals are selected, um, I'm not quite sure. I will have to go to Rodney or his team for that. But that should allow a diverse set of expertise discussing and reviewing our studies and what studies are going to be funded. Um, so I will let Rodney chime in on that first question. Happy to, Brianna. Thank you. Uh, no, we don't collect that. And, you know, when we went for you know, the uh, um, kind of diverse or, or minority, uh, you know, the, the the contracts that go out or to various types of universities that uh, historic black colleges, universities um, probably could pull that out. But no, we don't track that. Um, we do have like a small business, uh, you know, minority business that's tracked at a bone level and a higher level. But we can pull some of that information out. I know there's other federal agencies that, that do track uh, that type of information quite well. Um, and I would like to move us in that direction where we are, you know, really, you know, getting a handle on that and tracking that through our contracts uh, and through our, our, our cooperative agreements. Cause I would like to make a push uh, to work towards and, um, you know, more cooperative agreements with historic black colleges and universities as well. I see a lot of opportunity, especially work with environmental justice. Uh, and we will be doing several of those studies, you know, this next year. So I think that's an opportunity to kick in. Um, I will give a, a a quick promotion for our new employee. His name is Ben Queener. Uh, we brought him on board to ha help with our uh, our acquisitions. Uh, he's going to be our acquisition liaison. Uh, he's going to help streamline a lot of our processes. And we're also bringing him on board to do a lot of general tracking for the environmental studies program. This is one thing that I'm really wanting to do a better job of in, in the future with help from Brianna and the business unit and, and support from Ben does that answer your question, Jeremy, pretty much? Um, did I forget anything? All, all except the, whether you're moving like some of the other mm -hmm. federal agencies to require sort of community engagement and diversity uh, aspects in, in, in context of part of the research projects. 
part of the context of the, of the research. Um, I don't know about that requirement. I think it's something we could think about. Bill, if you'd like to add. So uh, building on what uh, Rodney said, um, we are, we have, uh, we're on the verge of formally inviting all 574 tribes to consult on the, uh, the ESP. And I'm, I'm sure we'll get uh, a lot of good ideas on the tribal front. Uh, and then, and I, I say this because the tribes are a part of this. Um, uh, for them, we did uh, recently enter into the first cooperative agreement that BOEM or MMS has ever had directly with the tribe with the Mashpee Wampanoag. And, and we've been uh, or trying to organize different ways to provide funds, and we'll go through the list for travel work. So, we're, so we are doing that kind of thing just by direct funding of tribes. But, uh, but I think I think Rodney's right that we could. So the, the recommendation you would make is to take a hard look at that anyway, ways in which we might. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, I mean, the the work that Priyana is, you know, is put forward, it, it's a good first step. And so then the question is, where, where do you move from here? Um, and so that was the sort of reason for my three. Yeah, three actually, questions. let me add it. There's, there's an interesting venue besides us directly. We, the National Academies mm -hmm. has, has, has uh, launched uh, uh, a study that uh, is expected to take two years on uh, diversity, inclusion, inclusion, equity, accessibility, and belonging. Uh, uh, in the ocean science arena, it's sponsored, and uh, so Bohm was, I believe, the first contributor. We gave a hundred thousand dollars to the project a while ago, and they're but they've got enough support that they're moving forward, and that's a really good venue, probably, to explore the a way to do that. Yep, I was wondering, Bill, if you were going to raise that. I appreciate you doing so. Uh, you know. If, I, like if I might add a little bit to you, actually, there is additional tracking that we do in terms of where our money does flow and what partnerships that we have. Um, so we are now doing an annual report on relationships with HBCUs. Um, and we also do track any procurements that are targeted under the Buy Indian Act. Um, and we are being a lot more intentional with what opportunities we could have in terms of these types of relationships and in terms of um, what businesses are awarded for what types of tasks, because we're very well aware that when you're engaging with some of these communities or when you want diverse, um, you know, information, uh, you need to reach out and you need to be a lot more intentional and your end result will be very, very different if you're engaging with certain types of businesses or certain types of universities. So I, I suspect we'll be continuing to grow in this space. Scott? Brianna, that was great. Thank you so much. Can uh, can I ask you to uh, put back up the slide that showed the comparison of uh, BOEM to DO, DOI and government? And that there was kind of a, a, a metric slide there. I'm just trying to make sure I understand what. Sure. Let me go ahead and share my screen again. Sorry about that. No, oh, no worries. Is this the slide you're referencing? So. Or the yeah, next one? No, I think that one's probably okay. Can you, yeah. So, um, yeah, can we make it bigger? Because I've got really bad eyes. I'm oh. getting older every day. So, uh, the, 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 the one before that, the one, yeah, the one, the one, yeah, the one you have, yeah, that one. Okay. So, this has a series of key. Oh, here. Oh. Very good. Oh, yeah, and I can see it. Thank you, thank you, Rod. <laughs> see, I, I'm really, I'm getting older every minute. So, um, uh, senior moments. So, so, um, are, I, I take it these uh, DEIA indexes are. Is this a a, a a a new set of metrics that were this fairly recently compiled for BOEM? I take it, and and. Because I don't remember seeing these before in any previous presentations. This is a this is a new thing, right? Yes, this is a new thing, and it's not just in BOEM. It's being tracked across um, all all measures in right. the federal sector as well. Yes. So 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 the 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 
so Bohm kind of stands out relative to the to the others. D, looks like DO Department of Interior is pretty within the range, pretty close to the the uh, the government average as a whole. But uh, Bohm kind of stands out. Um, uh, tell me what what what's what's the take? What is the what is the you know the high the high numbers at Bohm relative to the others? What does that what does that mean? And what do you have a and do you have some sort of specific target you're aiming to? to uh, move BOEM towards, uh, yeah. you know? Sure. I, I think this is reflecting with with all the work that we've been doing the past previous year in 2021, because there's always a lack in the information. This is reflecting um, BOEM hearing that there there's needing to be some, some changes in the way we do processes and acknowledge and recognize our staff making sure that we have some some reasonable accommodation for those individuals so we do have guidance for reasonable accommodation so we we are able to take what the staff is saying and really have some actionable plans and i think this is a result of us hearing the staff and what their needs are so some of the things that we have focused more so on um when we started the jedi um we we looked at the racial composition, and this is just in BOEM. I know it's not very specific to science, but BOEM is a science um, agency, so I guess it has some relevance there. Um, but when we when we were looking at um, how we can improve I'm, our diversity or minority numbers, were in the low twenty percentile um, of um, diverse and minorities within BOEM. And so we were starting to look at actions and items of what we can do to really get more diverse um, workforce. And I think by bringing awareness and having senior leaders acknowledge and recognizing that there is indeed uh, something we need to work on, it attracts a little bit more diverse background and more scientists. Um, a lot of the things that um, in regards to inclusion, a lot of our scientists wanted to be a part of the overall um, um, mission and make sure that their work matters. And so we were hearing that as a as an agency and we're giving um, empowering those scientists to speak more and to have more opportunity to talk about the science they're studying. So in that way they are being empowered and feeling included. So stuff like that bone we're doing to to try to raise that number. But we don't have a solid number as to where we want to go. I, I know that 83 may look great. Uh, compared to the others, but we have so much more that we can do. And I have not thought about what that percentage look like. So my question is more just because I'm just, just I'm retired and kind of out, out of a lot of stuff here. So I, 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 I'm assuming that the high numbers are good. Is how yes. you're, you're feeling yes. good about your high numbers. So you are ahead of the game relative to the rest of the Department of Interior. That's that right? is correct. That is and, correct. And, and and Department of Interior is, yeah, they're slightly ahead of the game relative to the whole government. But so so y you don't want to lose ground on these, right? And 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 um, so where where do you see relative to these? Where do you see your biggest opportunity that you're you're trying to f to focus on? Given that you're you're kind of outperforming your your uh, department. So I think the area that we probably would like to really increase is um, having an equitable approach on how we bring in on new people. Um, okay. There was some rough data that we, we pulled from some of our um, um, analysis from USA Job, and there was some slight concern there where we looked at uh, the qualified applicants and who actually were hired and that diversity starts sloping down when they get, went to um, specific minority groups. So we know that there is a, 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 a discrepancy or there is a barrier somewhere between when a person makes the certification list or the cert list, and then that person actually being hired. So we're Got trying it. to, one of the recommendations we're bringing in, of course, the diverse um, interview panels, hiring panels, but also trying to make training available for hiring managers as a recommendation. But I know that we can probably do more, and I'm wanting to know what other um, what are other agencies doing to yeah. avoid that obstacle. So, so, but it looks like you're off to a good start, based yes. on their relative and 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 um, 
you know, so you're looking for opportunities like how can I um, improve my recruitment from you know, underrepresented m minorities, for example, which is a huge problem in STEM across the, mm -hmm. you know, across the whole waterfront. Do, do you have um, like internships? You, you're also blessed to have some of your locations close to uh, HBCUs and in, in yeah. co-located. Are you, are you working on internships with HBCUs to try to identify? Uh, uh, that was, a, yeah, that was an area that was brought up um, and it was part of our recommendation um, to our SLT about having, having paid internships because um, we currently in Bone have internships, but they are not necessarily paid internships, and that doesn't really work for the diverse and minority communities. Um, they don't have the luxury of taking off work without getting paid. Um, so we are trying to see ways of, of having a uh, consolidated program where we can actually offer internships, paid internships, However, we, we still are trying to make some ground weight on that. Um, it has not been a lot of movement regarding um, setting aside funds and resources to get that um, up and running. But that is something that the, the new diversity and inclusion office is going to be tasked to help drive that forward. Okay, thank you. And if I can add on to that, we're we're piloting a new thing this year. Um, we are partnering with the ORISE Fellowship. Mm -hmm. um, we can do a little bit more targeted uh, announcements for opportunities. These are paid fellowships for university students and postgraduates. And we were able to bring two part-time fellows on board to help with our environmental justice work. And we were very intentional in the recruitment and the requirements for these positions that these folks had to have deep ties with environmental justice communities because that's the best way that we could have uh, gotten the right kind of people in to do the kind of work and really have the deep connections and understanding in those communities. So we're going to see how that goes and hopefully we can potentially expand that. And, it's, and everyone, actually, uh, I, I, I'd like to note that uh, uh, after George Floyd was murdered, uh, Bohm uh, adopted the Jedi Charter that Brianna's talking mm -hmm. about. Right. And, uh, and and Brianna stepped in as the the chair of the of the Jedi committee, uh, and she does that. I, I I don't think you when you when she was introduced, she probably didn't explain. She's she manages the group that does the budget for the studies program, mm. uh, HR, uh, you know, or sort of editorial services, a whole range of things. So she's done this as a collateral job, but really. I mean, I credit Brianna a lot for the passion and intelligence she's brought to this. So, and she's not going to accept anything as being good enough unless it's a hundred percent. I guess we'll never get quite there. But thank you, Rod. You you had your card up. Do you want a last word? I think we we sort of um, got to um, much of what I was thinking about. So, um, I was wondering, Brianna, about the balance between. Um, recruitment and retention and it sounded when you got to sort of um, a number of the things you were discussing that that retention was very much part of what you're thinking so I, that was really my, my question mm -hmm. yeah so uh, retention has been um, a very a very interesting topic over the years mainly with um, a lot of new programs coming on board with bone um, but I think um, we were able or we are able to retain a, a good amount of our um, staff here because um, the work-life balance and the flexibility we have in BOEM. Um, there's a transparent process on how we do our monetary performance awards um, and is, is um, transparent to the staff and the managers, um, usually based on percentage, not necessarily set on dollar amounts, but percentage on their salary. So we try to acknowledge and recognize staff through that way. There's been a lot of um, in, um, inspiring leadership development programs throughout BOEM, um, where it gives uh, either GS 11, 12, and also 13, 14 opportunities to learn leadership development and also um, um, have a uh, cohort to, to mentor um, them through that process. Um, and there's also expansion and detail opportunities across the different offices and programs. So people are able to learn knowledges from different sectors and bringing it back in to have a clear understanding. So I think 
a lot of the retention has a lot to do with people feeling um, needed, accepted, belong, um, respected in their expertise, as well as um, the freedom to to try new things and learn new new areas of, of the of the bureau. Thank you. That's super. Yeah, thanks, Brianna. Rona, last question. Um, uh, Brianne, I'd just like to thank you for all the work you've done. Um, I'm responding to Bill's comment because it sounds from his description of your uh, your job description that you are an extremely busy and important person uh, and that you've taken this on as extra labor. And so I'm wondering uh, to what extent are you being supported by other BOEM staff um, because I worry a little bit about uh, people of color doing all the diversity labor um, in these institutions. Um, yes, that's, that's been very, a very good point to make. And um, one of the things that um, came from our senior leadership um, recently was um, we're trying to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to participate on the JEDI committee. And so there was a, uh, a requirement to an extent, um, to have representation from each program and region, part of the JEDI community. Um, and what I've seen coming through as far as with people that are interested are people that are um, learning more about um, the challenges we are having, and they are not just people of color um, recently, and that's been great to see that. Um, so I have the opportunity to speak with new employees um, each quarter. Um, and that gives new employees information about how we are existing within the Bureau, give them resources. Um, and now that we have our diversity and inclusion officer on board, um, they have some dedicated staff for that office to start working on these activities and, and goals here. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Brianna. Um, and. We are at the 4.30 mark, which is our adjournment time. But before we close, uh, I want to do a couple of things. The first is I want to thank all of our speakers from today. I don't know how many are still on the line, um, but really appreciate the opportunity to learn from everybody, to um, have these rich discussions. Uh, I know we were... Um, really excited to hear from Daniel and Maura about the update on um, the uh, uh, evaluating connection study and also Brianna on this uh, topic as well. So really grateful. Um, appreciate especially your additional flexibility and timing. Um, and then, you know, of course, we had a rich discussion in the earlier part of the day today on the expansion into the territories, which I know is an area that we're going to continue to be monitoring and, and um, take uh, significant interest in. <clears throat> so again, gratitude on behalf of the committee for, for all of the presentations. Um, I did just want to give folks uh, maybe a quick three-minute opportunity total um, to uh, make any comments or um, uh, questions, feedback on the day-to-day -day more generally. Um, we have a very rich, busy schedule tomorrow as well. Um, and the committee will have a chance for closed session tomorrow afternoon. Um, but I don't anticipate we're going to have a lot of additional time for just open discussion tomorrow. So um, with that in mind, I just, if there were any broad overarching comments or things that didn't come up today that folks want to mention, um, I just wanted to give a couple of moments for that. James? Yeah, thanks. I had a question. I, I've Wind energy is not really my my background, but I did some looking around and I came across some stuff that Department of Energy has been doing in Puerto Rico. And, and offshore wind is part of that. I was curious if that's anything that, that BOEM has been working with or has that been done separate of? Um, yeah, hi, this is, this is Rodney. We met with DOE, oh, I guess it was last month. Um, uh, I, I didn't realize uh, that uh, they were doing work in, in that area. And 
PNNL, actually the Pacific Northeast National Lab, if I got that right, uh, was uh, are, are some of the folks that are really engaged in that area. So they had um, various um, outreach meetings, list of stakeholders they shared with us. Uh, they did share with us some of the 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 data collection that they've been doing. Um, you know, uh, mainly some physical oceanography, but still still useful uh, information. We're just now um, kind of starting to take a look at that because the meeting was very recent. But we are aware of that at this time, and we are trying to you know, leverage that opportunity. Is that going to be something that's going to be collaborative going forward, or y'all going to continue to work with them? Or I I, I think that would be wise. Um, uh, DOE, DOE does have uh, um, funds to put, put, I want to say this nicely, you know, uh, money bags, as sometimes I call them. Uh, they, 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 they do have uh, resources that I think we can, you know, partner with them and, and pull our resources and our expertise as well you know, together with theirs. I'm not sure if you're aware, but, you know, PNNL and others have a lot of great great scientists there that I think we can work with. So we're looking towards uh, areas where we can get those synergies work together, uh, you know, along with our, our, our work with NCOS and, and others. I think any federal agency that has interest and is doing work down there, we should reach out and uh, you know, coordinate with them. So. Isn't, isn't, isn't it fair to say, though, that DOE, uh, um, the National Renewable Energy Lab, I mean, they are the go-to people to do the initial assessments of wind energy potential around the country are they not that's where the we we look to them first to kind of tell us where the the wind off blow and where the right right yeah i'm, I'm talking beyond kind of the in rails yeah. which, which does that assessment and, and looking towards the environmental and community work that Got these it. folks are doing which i thought james was asking more towards that that would that that, that work but um but, but i know that i realize they do both I mean, very quickly, I mean, we're pretty deeply entwined with them and a number of projects, particularly where they have funds they can bring in. So. And they're very involved at the political level because it's it's been the Secretary of Interior, Secretary of Energy, and the Defense Department, for example, that announced the 30 by 30 goal. Fantastic. Well, thank you each again very much. Uh, we appreciate everybody's time today. Yes, uh, th thank you very much. Uh, that was really useful to, to get a good understanding of where BOEM is. I, I got three questions, um, and, and they all sort of relate to the Environmental Studies Program. So do you have data on diversity in the Environmental Studies Program versus BOEM proper? since that's sort of our bailiwick. And then um, is BOEM, does BOEM have any data on uh, diversity in the, the individuals that it gives money to? Um, and then related to that, a number of agencies are beginning to require um, various kinds of diversity and community engagement as part of uh, their research or proposals and such and is is BOEM requiring uh moving in that direction uh as well so uh thank you okay i'll take a stab at addressing those questions so the first question regarding um is there a way that we can get data um, for the diversity in the science program um, I think this is a step of getting where we currently have data that we can break out with the different subject matter expertise and the different career fields that um, are within the the um, the agency. Um, we do not have data specifically to the environmental program. Um, I know that there is a very um, a very um, structured process on getting certain subject matter experts uh, within the study development program. And so while they are reviewing profiles, they have subject matter experts for certain oceanographers, for um, birds. Um, and so they're, they're called, um, if I'm not mistaken, the STAR team, who are um, a collective group of individuals that should have a diverse background. How those individuals are selected, um, I'm not quite sure. I will have to go to Rodney or his team for that. 
but that should allow a diverse set of expertise discussing and reviewing our studies and what studies are going to be funded. Um, so I will let Rodney chime in on that first question. Happy to, Brianna. Thank you. Uh, no, we don't collect that. And, you know, when we went for you know, the uh, um, kind of diverse or, or minority, uh, you know, the, the the contracts that go out or to various types of universities that uh, historic black colleges, universities um, probably could pull that out. But no, we don't track that. Um, we do have like small business uh you know, minority business that's tracked at a bone level and a higher level, but we can pull some of that information out. I know there's other federal agencies that, that do track uh, that type of information quite well. Um, and I would like to move us in that direction where we are, you know, really, you know, getting a handle on that and tracking that through our contracts uh, and through our, our, our cooperative agreements. Cause I would like to make a push uh, to work towards and, um, you know, more cooperative agreements with historic black colleges and universities as well. I see a lot of opportunity, especially work with environmental justice. Uh, and we will be doing several of those studies, you know, this next year. So I think that's an opportunity to kick in. Um, I will give a, a a quick promotion for our new employee. His name is Ben Queener. Uh, we brought him on board to ha help with our uh, our acquisitions. Uh, he's going to be our acquisition liaison. Uh, he's going to help streamline a lot of our processes. And we're also bringing him on board to do a lot of general tracking for the environmental studies program. This is one thing that I'm really wanting to do a better job of in, in the future with help from Brianna and the business unit and, and support from Ben does that answer your question, Jeremy, pretty much? Um, did I forget anything? All, all except the, whether you're moving like some of the other mm -hmm. federal agencies to require sort of community engagement and diversity uh, aspects in, in, in context of part of the research projects. Part of the context of the, of the research. Uh, I don't know about that requirement. I think it's something we could think about. Bill, if you'd like to add. So uh, building on what uh Rodney said um we are we have uh we're on the verge of formally inviting all 574 tribes to consult on the uh the ESP and I'm I'm sure we'll get uh, a lot of good ideas on the tribal front uh and then and I, I say this because the tribes are part of this um uh for them we did I recently entered into the first cooperative agreement that BOEM or MMS has ever had directly with the tribe with the Mashpee Wampanoag. And, and we've been uh, or trying to organize different ways to provide funds. And we'll go through the list for tribal work. So, we're, so we are doing that kind of thing just by direct funding of tribes. But, uh, but I think, I think Rodney's right that we could, so the, the recommendation you would make is to take a hard look at that anyway, ways in which we might. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, the, I mean, the, the work that Brianna has, you know, has put forward, it, it's a good first step. And so then the question is, where, where do you move from here? Um, and so that was the sort of reason for my three. Yeah, three actually, questions. let me add it. There's, there's an interesting venue besides us directly. We, the National Academies mm -hmm. has, has uh, launched uh, uh, a study that uh, is expected to take two years on uh, diversity, inclusion, inclusion, equity, accessibility, and belonging uh, uh, in the ocean science arena. It's sponsored, and uh, so Bohm was, I believe, the first contributor. We gave a hundred thousand dollars to the project a while ago, and they're but they've got enough support that they're moving forward, and that's a really good venue, probably, to explore the a way to do that. Yep. I was wondering, Bill, if you were going to raise that. I appreciate you doing so. Uh, you know, if I, if I might 
add a little bit to you, actually. There is additional tracking that we do in terms of where our money does flow and what partnerships that we have. Um, so we are now doing an annual report on relationships with HBCUs. Um, and we also do track any procurements that are targeted under the Buy Indian Act. Um, and we are being a lot more intentional with what opportunities we could have in terms of these types of relationships and in terms of um, what businesses are awarded for what types of tasks, because we're very well aware that when you're engaging with some of these communities or when you want diverse, um, you know, information, uh, you need to reach out and you need to be a lot more intentional and your end result will be very, very different if you're engaging with certain types of businesses or certain types of universities. So I, I suspect we'll be continuing to grow in this space. Scott? Brianna, that was great. Thank you so much. Can uh, can I ask you to uh, put back up the slide that showed the comparison of uh, BOEM to DO, DOI and government? And that there was kind of a, a, a metric slide there. I'm just trying to make sure I understand what. Sure. Let me go ahead and share my screen again. Sorry about that. No, oh, no worries. Is this the slide you're referencing or so, the yeah, next one? No, I think that one's probably okay. Can you, yeah. So, um, yeah, can we make it bigger? Cause I, I've got really bad eyes. I'm oh. getting older every day. So, uh, the, 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 the one before that, the one, yeah, the one, the one, yeah, the one you have, yeah, that one. Okay. So this has a series of key. Oh, here. Oh. Very good. Oh, yeah, and I can see it. Thank you, thank you, Rod. <laughs> see, I, I'm really I'm getting older every minute. So, um, uh, senior moments. So, so, um, are, I, I take it these uh, DEIA indexes are. Is this a a, a a a new set of metrics that were this fairly recently compiled for BOEM? I take it, and and. Because I don't remember seeing these before in any previous presentations. This is a this is a new thing, right? Yes, this is a new thing, and it's not just in BOEM; it's being tracked across um, all all measures in right. the federal sector as well. Yes. So 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 the 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 so BOEM kind of stands out relative to the to the others. D it looks like DO Department of Interior is pretty within the range, pretty close to the. The, uh, the government average as a whole, but uh, BOEM kind of stands out. Um, uh, tell me what what what's what's the take? What is the what is the you know the high the high numbers at BOEM relative to the others? What does that what does that mean? And what do you have a and do you have some sort of specific target you're aiming to to uh, move BOEM towards? Uh, yeah. You know. Sure. Tell us more. I, I think this is reflecting with with all the work that we've been doing the past previous year in 2021, because there's always a lack in the information. This is reflecting um, bone hearing that there, there's needing to be some, some changes in the way we do processes and acknowledge and recognize our staff, making sure that we have some, some reasonable accommodation for those individuals. So we do have guidance for reasonable accommodation. So we, we are able to take what the staff is saying and really have some actionable plans. And I think this is a result of us hearing the staff and what their needs are. So some of the things that we have focused more so on, um, when we started the JEDI, um, we we looked at the racial composition and this is just in BOEM. I know it's not very specific to science, but BOEM is a science um, agency. So I guess it has some relevance there. Um, but when we, when we were looking at um, how we can improve our, our diversity or minority numbers were in the low 20 percentile um, of um, diverse and minorities within BOEM. And so we were starting to look at actions and items of what we can do to really get more diverse um, workforce. And I think by bringing awareness and having senior leaders acknowledge and recognizing that there is indeed uh, something we need to work on, it attracts a little bit more diverse background and more scientists. Um, a lot of the things that um, in regards to the inclusion, a lot of our scientists wanted to be a part of the overall um, um, 
mission and make sure that their work matters. And so we were hearing that as a as an agency, and we're giving um, empowering those scientists to speak more and to have more opportunity to talk about the science they're studying. So in that way, they are being empowered and feeling included. So stuff like that, Bone, we're doing to to try to raise that number. But we don't have a solid number as to where we want to go. I, I know that 83 may look great uh, compared to the others, but we have so much more that we can do. And I have not thought about what that percentage look like. So my question is more just because I'm just just. I'm retired and kind of out of, out of a lot of stuff here. So I, I, I'm I assuming then the high numbers are good. Is how yes. you're, you're feeling yes. good about your high numbers. So you are ahead of the game relative to the rest of Department of Interior. That's that right? is correct. That is and, correct. And, and, and Department of Interior is, yeah, they're slightly ahead of the game relative to the whole government. But so, so you don't want to lose ground on these, right? And, 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 um, so where where do you see relative to these? Where do you see your biggest opportunity that you're you're trying to f to focus on? Given that you're you're kind of outperforming your your uh, department. So I think the area that we probably would like to really increase is um, having an equitable approach on how we bring in on new people. Um, okay. There was some rough data that we we pulled from some of our. Um, um, analysis from USA Job, and there was some slight concern there where we looked at uh, the qualified applicants and who actually were hired, and that diversity starts sloping down when it get, went to um, specific minority groups. So we know that there is a, 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 a discrepancy or there is a barrier somewhere between when a person makes the certification list or the cert list, and then that person actually being hired. So we're Got trying it. to, one of the recommendations we're bringing in, of course, the diverse um, interview panels, hiring panels, but also trying to make training available for hiring managers as a recommendation. But I know that we can probably do more and I'm wanting to know what other, um, what are other agencies doing to yeah. avoid that obstacle. So, so, but it looks like you're off to a good start based yes. on their relative and, 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 um, you know, so you're looking for opportunities like how can I um, improve my recruitment from, you know, underrepresented m minorities, for example, which is a huge problem in STEM across the, mm -hmm. you know, across the whole waterfront. Do, do you have um, like internships? You, you're also blessed to have some of your locations close to uh, HBCUs and in, in yeah. co-located. Are you are you working on internships with HBCUs to try to identify? Uh, uh, that was, a, yeah, that was an area that was brought up um, and it was part of our recommendation um, to our SLT about having, having paid internships because um, we currently in Bone have internships, but they are not necessarily paid internships and that doesn't really work for the diverse and minority communities. Um, they don't have the luxury of taking off work without getting paid. Um, so we are trying to see ways of of having a uh, consolidated program where we can actually offer internships, paid internships. However, we, we still are trying to make some ground weight on that. Um, it has not been a lot of movement regarding yeah. um, setting aside funds and resources to get that um, up and running, but that is something that the, the new diversity and inclusion office is going to be tasked to help drive that forward. Okay, thank you. And if I can add on to that, we're we're piloting a new thing this year. Um, we are partnering with the ORISE Fellowship. Mm -hmm. um, we can do a little bit more targeted uh, announcements for opportunities. These are paid fellowships for university students and postgraduates. And we were able to bring two part-time fellows on board to help with our environmental justice work. And we were very intentional in the recruitment and the requirements for these positions that these folks had to have deep ties with environmental justice communities because that's the best way that we could have uh, gotten the right kind of people in to do the kind of work and really have the deep connections and understanding in those communities. So we're going to see how that goes and hopefully we can potentially expand that. And, and everyone, actually, I, I, I'd like to note that uh, uh, after George Floyd was murdered, uh, Bohm 
uh, adopted the Jedi Charter that Brianna is talking mm-hmm. about, right. and uh, and and Brianna stepped in as the the chair of the of the Jedi Committee, uh, and she does that. I, I I don't think you when you when she was introduced, she probably didn't explain. She's she manages the group that does the budget for the studies program, mm. uh, HR, uh, you know, or sort of editorial services, a whole range of things. So she's done this as a collateral job, but really, I mean, I credit Brianna a lot for the passion and intelligence she's brought to this. So, And she's not going to accept anything as being good enough unless it's a hundred percent. I guess we'll never get quite there, but. Thank you. Rod, Thank you, you. you had your card up. Do you want a last word? I think we, we sort of um, got to, um, much of what I was thinking about. So um, I was wondering, Brianna, about the balance between um, recruitment and retention. And it sounded when you got to sort of um, a number of the things you were discussing that that retention was very much part of what you're thinking. So I, that was really my, my question. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, retention has been um, a very a very interesting topic over the years, mainly with um, a lot of new programs coming on board with BOEM. Um, but I think um, we were able or we are able to retain a, a good amount of our um, staff here because um, the work-life balance and the flexibility we have in BOEM. Um, there is a transparent process on how we do our monetary performance awards um, and is, is um, transparent to the staff and the managers, um, usually based on percentage, not necessarily set on dollar amounts but percentage on their salary. So we try to acknowledge and recognize staff through that way. There's been a lot of um, ins- um, inspiring leadership development programs throughout BOEM um, where it gives uh, either GS 11, 12, and also 13, 14 opportunities to learn leadership development and also um, um, have a uh, cohort to, to mentor um, them through that process. Um, and there's also expansion and detail opportunities across the different offices and programs. So people are able to learn knowledges from different sectors and bringing it back in to have a clear understanding. So I think a lot of the retention has a lot to do with people feeling um, needed, accepted, belong, um, respected in their expertise, as well as um, the freedom to to try new things and learn new new areas of, of, the, of the Bureau. Thank you. That's super. Yeah, thanks, Brianna. Rona, last question. Um, uh, Brianna, I'd just like to thank you for all the work you've done. Um, I'm responding to Bill's comment because it sounds from his description of your uh, your job description that you are an extremely busy and important person uh, and that you've taken this on as extra labor. And so I'm wondering, uh, to what extent are you being supported by other BOEM staff? Um, because I worry a little bit about uh, people of color doing all the diversity labor um, in these institutions. Um, yes, that's, that's been very a very good point to make. And um, one of the things that um, came from our senior leadership um, recently was um, we're trying to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to participate on the JEDI committee. And so there was a uh, a requirement to an extent um, to have representation from each program and region part of the JEDI committee. Um, and what I've seen coming through as far as with people that are interested are people that are um, learning more about um, the challenges we are having and they are not just people of color um, recently, and that's been great to see that. Um, so I have the opportunity to speak with new employees um, each quarter, um, and that gives new employees information about how we are existing within the Bureau, give them resources. Um, and now that we have our diversity and inclusion officer on board, um, they have some dedicated staff for that office to start working on these activities and, and goals here. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Brianna. Um, and 
we are at the 4.30 mark, which is our adjournment time. But before we close, uh, I want to do a couple of things. The first is I want to thank all of our speakers from today. I don't know how many are still on the line, um, but really appreciate the opportunity to learn from everybody, to um, have these rich discussions. Uh, I know we were... Um, really excited to hear from Daniel and Mora about the update on um, the uh, uh, evaluating connection study and also Brianna on this uh, topic as well. So really grateful. Um, appreciate especially your additional flexibility and timing. Um, and then, you know, of course, we had a rich discussion in the earlier part of the day today on the expansion into the territories, which I know is an area that we're going to continue to be monitoring and, and um, take uh, significant interest in. <clears throat> so again, gratitude on behalf of the committee for, for all of the presentations. Um, I did just want to give folks uh, maybe a quick three-minute opportunity total um, to uh, make any comments or um, uh, questions, feedback on the day-to-day -day more generally. Um, we have a very rich, busy schedule tomorrow as well. Um, and the committee will have a chance for closed session tomorrow afternoon. Um, but I don't anticipate we're going to have a lot of additional time for just open discussion tomorrow. So um, with that in mind, I just, if there were any broad overarching comments or things that didn't come up today that folks want to mention, um, I just wanted to give a couple of moments for that. James? Yeah, thanks. I had a question. I, I've Wind energy is not really my my background, but I did some looking around and I came across some stuff that Department of Energy has been doing in Puerto Rico. And, and offshore wind is part of that. I was curious if that's anything that, that BOEM has been working with or has that been done separate of? Um, yeah, hi, this is, this is Rodney. We met with DOE, oh, I guess it was last month. Um, uh, I, I didn't realize uh, that uh, they were doing work in, in that area, and uh, PNNL, actually the Pacific Northeast National Lab, if I got that right, uh, was uh, are, are some of the folks that are really engaged in that area. So they had um, various um, outreach meetings, list of stakeholders they shared with us. Uh, they did share with us some of the 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 data collection that they've been doing. Um, you know. Uh, mainly some physical oceanography, but still still useful uh, information. We're just now um, kind of starting to take a look at that because the meeting was very recent, but we are aware of that at this time, and we are trying to you know, leverage that opportunity. Is, is that going to be something that's going to be collaborative going forward, or are you all going to continue to work with them? Or I, I, I think that would be wise. Um, uh, DOE, DOE does have... Uh, um, funds to put, put, I want to say this nicely, you know, uh, money bags, sometimes I call them, uh, they, 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 they do have uh, resources that I think we can, you know, you know partner with them and, and, and pull our resources and our expertise as well, you know, together with theirs. I'm not sure if you're aware, but, you know, PNNL and others have a lot of great, great scientists there that I think we can work with. So we're looking towards uh, areas where we can get those synergies work together, uh, you know, along with our, our, our work with NCOS and, and others. I think any federal agency that has interest and is doing work down there, we should reach out and uh, you know, coordinate with them. So. Isn't, isn't, isn't it fair to say, though, that DOE, uh, um, the National Renewable Energy Lab, I mean, they are the go-to people to do the initial assessments of wind energy potential around the country are they not that's where the we we look to them first to kind of tell us where the the wind off blow and where the right right yeah i'm, I'm talking beyond kind of the in rails yeah. which, which does that assessment and, and looking towards the environmental and community work that Got these it. folks are doing which i thought james was asking more towards that that would that that, that work but um but, but i know that i realize they do both I mean, very quickly, I mean, we're pretty deeply entwined with them and a number of projects, particularly where they have funds they can bring in. So, 
And they're very involved at the political level because it's it's been the Secretary of Interior, Secretary of Energy, and the Defense Department, for example, that uh, announced the 30 by 30 goal. Fantastic. Well, thank you each again very much. Uh, we appreciate everybody's time today. With that, I'll turn it over to our coaches to see if they have any initial words before we do our uh, committee introductions. I'll go first. Welcome back, everybody. Um, yesterday's meeting, I thought was, or yesterday's sessions were were extremely um, rewarding. I uh, there was a, a we covered a lot of territory, um, and there were some excellent exchanges of information and I anticipate the same for today um and um I would I guess the only thing I would say is I encourage folks in Boehm that are online that are not able to contribute um and be in the room if they have things to add and want to participate in the conversation that they uh, we really encourage them to to do so um other than that over to you <clears throat> Thanks, Rod. That was a great, a, 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 a great summary. And, and indeed, I would echo that. Please uh, avail yourselves of the chat function uh, if you're uh, joining us remotely and uh, want to participate in the discussion. Uh, Stacy keeps her her eyes open for for uh, people raising their hands outside. So, um, yeah, I thought yesterday was very, very, a, a very good session. And one thing I was particularly appreciative of is that uh, we were focused on a, a, another new uh um imperative for boem moving into the territories that's a, a an exciting new area that you're going to have to deal with and I, I was very pleased that uh i my my, my perception is that uh you got heard a lot of receptiveness to some of the suggestions that came from the committee i mean we're we're here to help you know we're like the federal government we're the national academy we're here to help um and that, that's what we want we want you to be successful and we want to assist you as, as best we can and uh uh and but we got to i think uh, all felt good about the discussions we had yesterday today looking forward to some other exciting challenges that are coming your way the whole marine spatial planning issue is a is a is a I think a big frontier and a huge and important challenge. We're also going to get to hear some external perspective, which from from our uh, from outside folks, not part of this committee, but uh, people with some some deep expertise. I think that's going to be interesting as well. So, looking forward to a great day, and uh, thank everyone for your participation. <laughs> thank you. We'll quickly do a round of introductions for those on the committee. Um, both in the room and online. And then as we did yesterday, I'll just ask our speakers to please introduce um, prior to providing their presentations. So um, Scott and Rod, we'll go ahead and still start with you all. You give a bit of an introduction, but go ahead and uh, introduce Good morning, yourself. everybody. My name is Rod Mather. I'm a professor of uh, maritime history and underwater archaeology and applied history at the University of Rhode Island. And I've been on COSA for quite a while, and um, I am co-chair, and uh, this is my last meeting. Hi, I'm Scott Cameron. I'm a geologist. I worked for Shell for 32 years, uh, and in the last 10 years, I've been doing some consulting and a lot of volunteer work. Um, I've been on COSA since its inception, and this is also my last meeting, and I'm going to miss my good buddy Rod here. <laughs> you all are both welcome back anytime. Uh, next, I'll turn to Jack. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jack Barth. I'm a physical oceanographer at Oregon State University. Thank you. Rona? Good morning, uh, Rona Cox. I'm a geologist and coastal geomorphologist from Williams College. Jeremy? Uh, good morning, Jeremy Firestone. I'm a social scientist and lawyer at the University of Delaware School of Marine Science and Policy. James? I'm James Flynn. I'm an atmospheric scientist with the University of Houston. Thank you. Katrine? I'm Katrine Eichen. I'm a marine biologist at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Thank you. Les? Les Kaufman. I'm a marine ecologist at Boston University. All right. We'll go next to Carrie. 
Good morning, everyone. Carrie Pomeroy, research social scientist, background in uh, applied sociology and anthropology and marine policy, Institute of Marine Sciences at UC Santa Cruz. Thank you. Thanks. Kevin? Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm the uh, <clears throat> I'm Kevin Stokesbury. I'm the dean of the uh, School for Marine Science and Technology at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. Uh, I'm a fisheries oceanographer and marine biologist by training. I'm also the incoming uh, chair for this committee, and I I wanted to personally thank Rod and and Scott for just uh, uh, leading the way and and certainly setting a a bar of which I hope to be able to try and at least reach <laughs> hold up but you guys have just been amazing uh, chairing these sessions and and uh, i really appreciate your guidance so thank you we appreciate you as well kevin Lori. hi everyone i'm Lori suma geologist uh, retired from exxon mobile i'm currently adjunct at rice and ut austin thank you excellent um well with that i think we can um go ahead and introduce our first session. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Jim and Laura, if you'll each introduce yourselves as well, and then we'll go ahead and uh, get your presentations ready. Okay, well, uh, my name is Jim Kendall. Um, I am the regional director for the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management in the Gulf region. Now I started there February 1st. I came from Alaska where I worked in Alaska for 11 years. Uh, before that, I spent 11 years in our D.C. office. This is where everybody goes, ugh. Uh, but before that, I spent 11 years in the Gulf office. In fact, right now, I'm on the same floor with the same view out of my window I had when I started February 1st of 1989. Uh -huh. uh, I did my graduate work in the Gulf of Mexico and uh, the Florida Keys, so I'm very familiar with the office. Uh, but I want to stay right now that I am familiar with what's going on because Bone, being a very small organization, has taken full advantage of matrix management. Uh, people in Alaska, uh, people in the Gulf have been helping out on the Atlantic. So we've sort of all are all interconnected. So we really know what each other's doing across the breadth of the United States. And with that, before I live up to my Inuit name, Akaktos, the one who talks too much, I will turn it over to Laura to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Laura Robbins. I'm the Deputy Regional Director down in the Gulf of Mexico working with Jim. Um, I, I have a varied background. I started out in industry, oil and gas industry, many, many years ago. And I have uh, worked in private industry quite a bit. And then I've done some stints in the government. I've been with uh, the U.S. Department of Education. I've been with the EPA. I have been with uh, the Department of Energy and um, my most recent home for probably uh, almost 10 years now, I guess, uh, would be uh, Department of Interior, either with the Office of Natural Resources Revenue, as well as the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. But um, I believe I've found my home. I love what I do. We have the best job in the world. So um, with that, we better give a cup took his full time because we all know he <laughs> likes to talk. Well, seriously, my last meeting on the North Slope, uh, the air bombs that name. They said that it's not an insult. We all have names. We all have names uh, like that, most of which we can't translate. So let's just <laughs> see if I can actually share the screen. Uh, let's see here. Can I share my screen? Come on, come on. Share. Is it working? Oh, outstanding. So let me put it in presentation mode. Is it going to work? Okay. Okay, I want to minimize that. So it looks like it's working. Okay, well, uh, yesterday's conversations were phenomenal. Uh, we really enjoyed it. That's probably the best day I've had in a long time listening to what was being said and the questions and the conversations. Oh, one point of note is I'm severely hearing impaired. I read lips. So if you see me staring at you while you're talking, I'm not trying to freak you out. I'm trying to understand what you're saying. It just hearing aids don't work well for me in a room like this. So if I'm staring at you while you're talking, it's I'm trying to get what's going on here. But anyways, yesterday's conversations were phenomenal. And uh, I think it was a perfect setup for what Laura and I are going to say today. 
And so that's who we are. Um, I like to say energy transition, minerals and sustainability working together in a multiple use basin. Because if you're into stuff like spatial planning, ecosystem basin management, resolving conflicts, this is what we do. And for me, I'm a kid in a candy store. And we are gonna handle, as I like to say, all the food groups, uh, conventional energy, renewable energy, marine minerals and carbon sequestration. And recently we added dessert. So we're gonna talk about something else. Let's see if we can get this to work. Okay, I always start out uh, with the BOEM mission. Now, you know this, what we do is manage the development of the outer continental shelf energy and marine or mineral resources in an environmentally and economically responsible way. Um, you know this, but I emphasize to all crowds, we're a stewardship bureau, we have responsibilities for preservation, conservation, and resource use. On a good day, everyone likes us. On the second best day, everybody has issues with us at the same time. Case in point, the new five years out, three lease sales, uh, industry is upset, the NGOs are upset. Well, that's a typical day for us. And so whenever we have new folks join our organization, I say, welcome to BOEM. It's the hardest job you'll ever love. Things like spatial planning, ecosystem-based management, use ins inspired science for decision-making. That's what we do. It's hard. Get used to it. Okay. Um, just to touch things real quick here. That's the Gulf of Mexico. Those are the leases, uh, 2,230 leases out there. Uh, there's about 1,500 oil and gas structures. About half of those are manned. At any one time, there are three to 10,000 people living offshore, and there's 20,000 miles of active pipeline. A lot of it is under the peer review of uh, Bessie, but mm -hmm. we work very closely with the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement. Now, this is where we're going to start the story. One thing I learned living up north is stories can have a big impact. So here we're going to start the base of the story. Okay, in terms of lease sales, uh, the um, Inflation Reduction Act uh, said you will hold lease sale 257, 258, 259, and 261. Lease sale 261 is the last lease sale in the current five-year program that's expired. So we have to have this one. It was supposed to happen in August. Then we've had courts and lawyers and judges involved, and it was moved to September. We just found out the day before yesterday that we are going to have it on December 20th. Yeah, you, uh, missed, you missed a date in there. We were supposed to then have it November. November. You meant, you know, it's been up and down. And up, up and down. down. But um, yeah, now it, it's... it's it, September, uh, August, September, November, November and now uh, December. Uh, December. And there's a lot of planning in that, public outreach, federal mm -hmm. register notices, all that stuff mm -hmm. that have to be on. That's the stuff that's done behind the scenes no one sees. And there's dozens and dozens of people involved. Um, let's see, what else can I say about that? I think that pretty much covers that. This is what we have to do, and we're doing it. Okay, for the next five years, the proposed final uh, program that came out uh, proposes only three lease sales in the next five years. That would be one in 2025, one in 2027, and 2029, all of them in the Gulf of Mexico region. Again, there are a lot of people not happy with this. That was not our decision, but this is the world we work in. Next, uh, marine minerals. This is something that often gets overlooked. Uh, we have the responsibility to manage marine minerals in the Gulf. It's primarily sand and gravel to take those resources which are yeah. offshore on the OCS and working with, for example, the states, and with all the other agencies, make them available to put back on the beach for erosion. Um, and with things going on with climate change, the changing environment, that is incredibly important. I like to say no sand, no coast, no infrastructure, because whether it's pipelines for oil and gas or an electrical cable, they have to come ashore somewhere. And it's a very active environment. We all know this. We're all scientists. The coastal areas, a lot of things are going on. So our marine minerals program sometimes gets overlooked, but it's extremely important. Next, 
Okay, November 15th, 2021. Uh, with the uh, the bill, the bipartisan infrastructure yeah. law, we got the authority to manage carbon sequestration on the outer continental shelf. This is a big deal. I've got an office of uh, yeah. 292 people. At least 70 of them are working all the time on this issue. We've got seven teams, 70 people working on it. The uh, proposed rulemaking just went through management review. I read the document. Laura's read parts of the document. We've all got into it. It will be made public soon. But this is for us to take CO2, send it back offshore and deep into the ground. This is really some incredible high-tech scientist. I've got geologists, geophysicists, petroleum engineers, environmental scientists in my region and in headquarters working on this around the clock. Um, this is really phenomenal. Uh, it is a big lift. It's going to hit the streets soon, but we're committed to doing it and doing it safe. And it's a joint effort between yeah. Boehm and Bessie. And you can jump in any time yeah, when I miss it, something. He, he's not exaggerating. It is a very big lift, and you're going to see that in the proposed regulations. It's approximately a 2,500-page document at this point. So it, it took a long time to review. It, it's very complex. Okay, now here's the dessert. We covered the food groups of um, conventional energy, renewable energy, mineral resources, and carbon sequestration. Well, this has been on our plate uh, for now well over a year, and we've had a number of folks coming in about green hydrogen. Um, you don't always have to use electricity generated by wind turbines to make electricity and send it to shore. We all know what electrolysis is. Why not use the electricity generated by wind turbines through uh, um, electrolysis to produce hydrogen. And the red there, those are hundreds of miles of pipeline that already exist in the coastal areas of Louisiana and Texas to move hydrogen between industry facilities. There's a market for it right now. Trust me, we have more than one company has come in our door and said, when are you gonna start this? We have an idea. Uh, it could be, using the electricity from a wind turbine, sending it to shore and doing the electrolysis on shore or generating electrolysis offshore. There's a lot of complications with this in terms of rulemaking and the solicitor's office, all the lawyers, but we are looking at this and it's a daily conversation. So we've got conventional energy, renewable energy. Now we've got hydrogen, carbon sequestration and marine minerals. Again, if there's any place to use conflict management and multiple use, the Gulf is the place to do it. And that's what we're doing. OK, wind. Uh, Laura is going to go into a lot of details here uh, shortly in part of the presentation. But on uh, August 29th, we did something that was phenomenal. We had our first offshore wind sail. That red area is off of Lake Charles. That's 102,000 acres. A company has purchased that. Um, it was pending, but the lease has been 100% issued. Mm -hmm. Now they're going to have to go and do site characterization mm -hmm. and um, surveys. And then after that, they would submit, if they choose to, a construction and operation plan. There'll be more outreach. There will be uh, more NEPA done. But we mm -hmm. have those two areas, mm -hmm. or that one area. And then off of Galveston, we had a large area that was broken up into two areas, Galveston 1 and Galveston 2. No one bid on those. But less than a day after that sale concluded, we had multiple calls that came in and said, you didn't sell them, can we buy them? Um, I'm not saying we kicked the hornet's nest, but having a renewable wind sale in the Gulf of Mexico, right in the oil patch, people kind of woke up and we have had multiple companies come in since that sale saying yeah. we want unsolicited leases. Well, we have to have competition there. Uh, we can include those areas in the next wind sale, Gulf of Mexico wind two, which we're planning for. But one thing I want to point out, if you notice, um, do I have that cursor work in there? It won't. You see, you see the yellow and the orange off of Galveston. There's a bigger area that sort of looks like a pyramid on its side. That was the original wind area. So, Laura, I'm going to turn it over to you for a couple of second minutes to say why that wind area now had two areas in it. Oh, OK. Uh, so so basically what he's describing, um, the 
the the pyramid shape was basically the wind energy area that we we developed uh, as a part of the planning model that I'm going to talk about later. So those the the gray or black outlines are the actual wind energy areas on both of both of those areas. So you go one step further, or we went one step further based on comments within our uh, proposed sale notice uh, through stakeholder engagement and getting the comments back. We we always adapt to to the feedback that we we get. So you see see the two in the Galveston area, those are two different leases that we offered. Our stakeholders wanted areas of approximately 100,000 acres in each lease. So all three of those are all approximately 100,000 acres. But but to, to talk more about the precision of that, because some site precision was done with the model, based on comments from our fisher, fisher people, the shrimp people, they wanted specific things pulled out. After we got that far in the process, we went back and took things out. We were constantly adapting these wind energy areas. So that gap you see between those two leases, it looks like a little corridor. Those were blocks that were pulled out because we further determined that that affected them negatively. <clears throat> later in the process, we pulled that out. You'll see a little empty block in the, the yeah. Southern Galveston lease. And that was another concern that came up after the fact, after the modeling, and we pulled that out. The blocks in the lower part of that wind energy area, uh, some additional lightering issues came out. So, so I think Jim just wanted to point out how we were constantly adapting based on things we were hearing along the way. Um, it's a continuous and, process. And another thing, I, since you brought up the uh -huh. dessert, uh, let me let me throw this in here. He brought up the um, hydrogen. So I think it'd be a good point leading in before I get to my stuff, leading into how how critical hydrogen is going to be in the Gulf of Mexico. So our northeast uh, wind energy areas are in all of our partners and headquarters. They have all of these, the dealings with the, the complications of, of plugging into the grid and, and doing these things. That's not necessarily the goal of the people coming in, giving us presentations and in, in all of these business models. The Gulf isn't as focused with plugging into an existing grid. I'm, I'm speaking from what I'm hearing from industry. They're bringing in proposals for our wind energy to be used for production of hydrogen. So that's why Jim threw that in there. That's a new one. Our Pacific region hasn't had that. Uh, the Atlantic has not had that, but that's going to be a first for us. And that is that is the reason why uh, we are faced with a hydrogen challenge in the Gulf. Okay, next slide. I threw this in um, just a, a couple of years ago. The Atlantic was the big thing for wind. But the Gulf of Mexico, you know, it's the Gulf of Mexico. It's all conventional energy. Why are they interested in it? Uh, why would they be interested? Well, I went to a meeting in Boston uh, just a few months ago, and it was primarily about the Atlantic. But some of the comments were phenomenal. Like, for example, the jacket for some of these bottom-founded wind turbines, the second one from the left, are being made in Louisiana. The first Jones, a Jones Act compliant turbine installation vessel was being built in Brownsville, Texas. Then I heard comments like uh, in some of the panels, like we have to go to the Gulf of Mexico to get people that know how to work offshore. The funniest thing was, uh, one of the comments was that our welders on the East Coast, they're used to welding for eight hours, getting in their F-150s and driving home. Now they may be asked to work offshore for days at a time. That's new to them. In the Gulf, everybody knows somebody that's on seven days, off seven days, or whatever. And so a lot of the stuff that they're using on the Atlantic coast has connections to the Gulf Coast because that's where the infrastructure and the experience is. And so, and now with people coming in and talking about hydrogen, and we want that unsolicited lease because you didn't sell it, the activity is ramping up. It's really kind of exciting. Okay, now. Um, a review here. Bohm's authorities, this is where I'm going to go in my lecture mode. Sorry, my old academic hat is coming out. Um, Bohm's authorities and responsibilities, conventional energy, marine minerals, renewable energy, 
carbon sequestration, then we added dessert hydrogen, and there may be other things coming. But it's not all about us. We have to factor in our other stakeholders and our other partners, fisheries, ecosystem services. We all like to breathe. We need our oxygen, transportation and shipping, recreation, defense and security. My uh, son's an F-16 pilot. I don't want him running into a turbine. His mother would kill me. So we have to consider all of this in what we do. So that map I showed you with the lease blocks, the green lease blocks. Okay, let's add all that stuff and you get something that looks like this. On this map, we've got the lease box. Uh, we got an endangered species, the rice whale area, the big thing that goes from Florida all the way over. The lighter blue areas are potential areas for carbon capture and sequestration. The red areas are significant sand resources. The yellow are potential wind energy areas. The light blue area off of Lake Charles, that's the lease we just issued. There is a lot going on. We could add more to this. Bottom line, the Gulf of Mexico is a mature energy multiple use area. That has not been lost on us. We're in a sandbox with a lot of different people that's doing this. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we address multiple use in terms of sustainability? Again, I'm gonna get in my lecture mode. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. First of all, we have to acknowledge the social, economic, environmental, tribal, and international components on areas like carbon sequestration and hydrogen, we have a lot of connections, a lot of meetings. Last year, I was to Norway twice. We got people that just came back from Norway uh, to talk to them. Uh, we've had meetings at OTC. There was a side meeting um, hosted by the Netherlands on carbon sequestration and hydrogen that I got to attend. I was the only government representative there. Um, so we have to acknowledge all of these things. It's all going on at once. Uh, recognize and engage all ocean users, stakeholders, tribes, and partners. Uh, everybody needs a seat at the table, and that brings up the next collaboration. Um, now, a lot of people use the term collaboration and partnership interchangeably. That drives me crazy. Rodney and I are co-authors on a, a chapter in a book that came out two years ago on partnerships. Collaboration is the highest level of partnership. Partnership includes coordination, cooperation, and collaboration. Collaboration is where everybody has a seat at the table. You come and operate in good faith. You have skin in the game. This is what we aim for with everyone we are working with. It has to be collaborative. Um, except the change and transition are occurring. The energy transition. There's a lot of talk about transitioning from fossil fuels to non-fossil fuels. Well, and there's been a lot of attention on the Atlantic coast. Well, it's already happening in the Gulf. Some of the stuff they're using on the Atlantic coast is being built in the, the, in the Gulf coast. Uh, we've already had a sale and we're planning for the next sale. So it's not coming, it's here. Okay, build upon what we already know. Uh, at the very beginning of the renewable energy program, there is a little bit of angst about getting too close to conventional energy. We're the new kids on the block. It's renewable, not that old stuff with fossil mm -hmm. fuels. Well, I think people have learned that there is so much we can learn from the oil and gas industry in terms of construction, welding, placing things, all that stuff. It is transferable. And so we've acknowledged that and we're working on it. Also, use the best available information and knowledge, social information, economic information, tribal information, environmental. When I worked in Alaska on the North Slope, uh, working with the indigenous folks, the Inuit, I come to really value indigenous and local knowledge. Um, you may have the best data for the last 10 years, but if you're talking to somebody that's been out in the water for 50 years and they've got information from their grandparents, that is invaluable. So there are different forms of coming to know. We have to embrace that. Now, moving on. To do this, we are, number one, using adaptive management, willing to adjust and adapt as we go. Uh, it's not like fire and forget, you know. Uh, it's one of those where what you're doing today, you have to be willing to change tomorrow and the day after that. We've accepted that. Number two, map the different activities now and for the future using state-of-the-art tools, modeling, GIS, machine learning, artificial intelligence. That came up yesterday. 
um, a friend of mine in USGS, a dear friend of mine likes to say map once and use forever. Uh, that doesn't hold anymore with the climate change and the erosion and things like that. You better be mapping more often uh, with the change in migrations of birds and marine mammals. You've got to be cognizant of that and plan for it. You have to be willing to change and adapt everything you know, just because you got this great map that, okay, here we have this for decisions. Well, the next decision process for the next sale or whatever is coming up, we may have to update that map, especially if we have to add new things like dessert on it. Okay, anticipate and seek out and address cause and effect relationship between activities, uh, distinct and cumulative impacts, new mitigation measures. You know, first there was oil and gas and a little bit of sand. Now there's oil and gas, a lot of emphasis on marine minerals. Oh, now there's carbon sequestration. Oh, now there's hydrogen. Um, those are things we're going to add. What are the tools? We have to look at the interactions between them. Okay, use an ecosystem-based approach to management. We all know what that is, but it's amazing. When you talk to some groups, they actually think you're going to uh, manage the bugs and the bunnies and the fishes and stuff. No, I mean, in its purest sense, ecosystem-based management is using the best information on the environment to help with your decisions. And since we're getting new information constantly, you have to integrate that into your thought processes and have to adapt. Okay, with that, I'm going to shut up and uh, I'm going to turn it over to Laura. Okay. You can drive. So, so the reality, the reality of this break is to give a doc took a, a break so he can like catch up and breathe before. Uh, so I'm giving him a rest. But uh, basically, I just I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, process we used within the Gulf of Mexico leading up to our first wind sale. Um, it's it's basically going to be a high level overview, but uh, I think I think you need to know a little bit of where we were to understand where we are. So uh, back to, back in 2020, we had the on the tails of some in rail studies about the wind speeds in the Gulf of Mexico. We had our Louisiana State Governor John Bell Edwards approach us requesting a task force be formed, looked at and, and start investigating wind in the Gulf of Mexico. So for a lot of us, we were like. OK, you know, we, we had been talking about wind for, for a while, but in, in our minds, we didn't see it coming this fast. So so we talked about it. We responded to him in December of 20 and and, and said, well, we, we'll do we'll put together a task force, but we want to make it a regional task force. We want to bring in all of our affected states. So by uh, that was in December of 20, by June of, of 21, we were out there with our first task force meeting. Um, at the same time, we issued a call for information, not a call, I'm sorry, an RFI to, to you know, test the waters and see if there was actual interest out there based on this. Um, so keep in mind that call or that RFI was issued in June of 21. At this point in time, we've had an administration change. So our mindset before that was a little different. Um, we were working on wind, not to the extent that, that our, our um, or at people and everyone in the Northeast was, but you know, we were, we were thinking someday the Gulf will come to the wind game. Administration change that got upped a little with introduction of these aggressive climate goals. And so by, uh, like I said, June of 21, we're having a task force meeting. We have an RFI, everything is moving rapidly. So this is just a, a quick look at, at what that initial request for information looked like. It's just a very broad geographic uh, area. Um, it, it went out, I think the, the RFI went out to water depths of, gosh, I, off the top of my head, I wanna say it was about 1300 meters. Uh, we received around, I believe it was 39 comments on that and, um, from from you know private citizens, the state agencies, Fed agencies, um, but yeah, there was some interest, and um, we went out down that area and took it to the went out for a call for information. So we took that area down to approximately, um, I think that was approximately twenty million acres in our call area. It's 
the boundaries of the call area are the red lines. Uh, and we brought the water depth into approximately a little over 800 meters in depth. Uh, we, we, again, based on comments and industry interest, we proceeded to move forward. And you're fixing to see uh, on this next slide, um, oh, no, not the next slide. I don't, my notes in the slides don't exactly match up, but part of, part of the process uh, was getting industry interest because we did not want to, we didn't want to progress in this unless people were willing to, to join the game and be interested. So that's just a depiction of the indus industry expressing interest in it's basically as you can see, the interest did not fall completely within our call area. But uh, as you can see, if you remember the map Jim previously showed, a lot of the interest lined up in the areas where we eventually developed the wind energy area. So this is the slide I was talking about. Um, as you probably recall from James Morris's presentation yesterday from NOAA, he presented this same slide. We, we were, and I don't want to use the wrong word, we were in a very important collaboration, If because if I say partnership, Jim's going to have a heart attack. Um, we were in a, a very good collaboration with NOAA, and we shared the same slide in, in, with our extensive outreach. So uh, anyway, you've seen this. I don't really need to, to go over the slide again. This basically shows what spatial modeling is and what's considered. So I... Um, uh, after after we got our comments from the call for information area, and that was after November of 21, that's when we progressed with our collaboration with NOAA and NCOS to, to go into this modeling process. Um, I don't know, I believe James probably mentioned this yesterday, but I don't recall specifically if he said how our collaboration started. NOAA NCOS was out there already doing aquaculture work and using this model. And they were engaging with, with a lot of the same stakeholders we engage with. These stakeholders already had exposure to this model. They already liked it. This is something that if, if the Gulf was blessed with anything in this whole renewable energy process, we, we had support going in to our process where in the Atlantic, they did not have that. So, so, so it's been, it's a totally different situation. Um, so we um, decided to this, getting feedback from, from our stakeholders, we decided to engage in this process with, with NCOS. So James mentioned yesterday our modeling consisted of 75 different data layers. That's true. 75 different data layers that were further reduced down into 54 different data sets. And in the model, then that was narrowed down into sub submodels or subsets of information as shown on this. As you see, the industry and operations, the constraints, natural and cultural resources, national security, economics, logistics, fisheries, all of those 75 data layers are buried in those sub data sets. And, um, and I, you see the constraints when that's the, that's the, the go, no go area. Those are, those are things that we absolutely, that was, you know, things we could not, could not include. Um, so, I wanna, I'm gonna stop here because because we I keep talking about stakeholder engagement. I want I, I want everybody to understand because I heard a lot about this as as we progress with our work with the territories. I just want to talk about how the Gulf did it. We adopted from the beginning. You have to engage early and you have to engage often, and we did. Uh, from the time we decided to put that task force meeting together. So late 20 through the time we published our uh, proposed sale notice back in probably March of this year, we had engaged in, and this, these are approximately, they're probably a little more than this, but a nice round even number of engagements would be 400. We were on the road 
constantly. We were talking, we were, uh, as we were collaborating with NOAA, as we would move along in the steps, we were socializing this information with, with people. We wanted them to understand from the beginning as we worked through the process. So when I say 400, this, this were state governments, uh, federal partners, uh, NGOs, tons of environmental justice communities, uh, tribal, tribal nations. Uh, we ran the gamut and it, I mean, someone, someone made the, the comment yesterday that it's important to have the people in the areas they're going to be affected doing this engagement, sitting down at the table with them, listening. We didn't necessarily have our headquarters people coming down and doing that. We handled that locally because we felt like we had a better understanding of, of our affected, our affected uh, stakeholders. So, so we did this early and often, and we got ahead of the game in, in stakeholder um, engagement. So, as uh, after the comments were received for the call of information, that's when the work with with NOAA in cost began. They took in all of these data layers. Now, some of the data they already had because of of all of their fisheries work, but <laughs> this was this is bone data. Uh, these and I can't remember what examples James pulled out and used yesterday, but these are two of very important ones. Um, yeah. The one on the left are shrimp electronic log books. Those, those bright red areas are their heaviest trawling areas. So that was very important to us that we protected our, our shrimpers, especially, uh, you know, being from Louisiana, that is the livelihood of, of a lot of people. So all of these layers built, built up, as James said yesterday, to this uh, suitability model. Uh, another one that we put a lot of consideration in, in the model for was migratory birds, the one on the right. So part of the, part of the protections we put in for that is we had a, a 20 nautical mile buffer around the coastline that we put in for that. You can, you can see the yellow uh, by the coast is, is a big migratory pattern for this. So we eliminated that. In the uh, shrimp logbook thing, the the reds, uh, you're going to see where we basically eliminated all of those areas the best we could. Um, I'll point out now. This is this is. I don't know if you can see those of you that have your laptops up. Do you see that that pyramid where um, off of Galveston, where we put that wind energy area? Do you see that that little line of red cutting right through the middle of it? And I, we talked about how we we went back after comments and pulled something out. That little line of red across there are those blocks that we pulled out. We listened to them, uh, to their comments. We went in and, and we did some revisions. But that really demonstrates demonstrates it in that picture. I, I forgot that one was in there. But but these are, I mean, I have, I brought them. If anyone wants to see them, I have a, a report that has all of these, talks about the um, the process we followed. It's got the math, it's got the formulas, it's got the how things were weighted. And it shows every one of these data layers, but we have this on our website. And it's, it's on, yeah, website for the public. Yeah, it's, yeah we, we were very transparent in our process. Every time we, we, we came up with something, we put it out there so they could go and dig through it and read it and, and ask us questions. And, and these 400 engagement meetings we had basically answered those questions that they would have. And it, it was it was successful for us. I mean, I'm not gonna say that it was a cakewalk to do this in the Gulf, but based on what our, our colleagues in, in headquarters are having in the Atlantic, it kind of was. Hey, no one's gonna be happy all of the time, but through this modeling process, we modeled out an area that Deconflicted, approximately ninety to ninety-five percent deconfliction, and they were the stakeholders overall were very pleased with the with the product. So, as James showed this slide yesterday, this was the final suitability um, map that came out. You know, of course, all the red was the the no-go areas. Um, it 
and you, if you see this and you you saw our map where we we had generated 14 identified wind energy areas eventually that got narrowed down to 13 because we had a DOD concern on one of them and we pulled that one down later because um, we listened to the DOD but you can start to see based on uh, corridors transit corridors you can see how our, our it just it fell out and that's that's what it looked like after we had the the deconflicted areas our initial wind energy areas and we were talking with them i mean every step of the way every time we got a piece of information yeah. we didn't hold on to it as soon as we had clearance from from our leaders in in headquarters that we could go talk about something we were just waiting can we go talk can we go talk and we would immediately hit so we socialized this. These weren't final wind energy areas, but we were transparent and open with them about where we were considering putting wind in the Gulf. And from, from the beginning, they, they all know that these were on the table. Now, apparently it's clear we did not go forward with all of these. We, we went forward with two. We went forward with wind energy area I off of Galveston and wind energy area M off of Lake Charles. But all of our stakeholders knew where we were thinking and where we were headed. So we were, we were, we took a very programmatic approach in the Gulf to this and looking towards the future and where we may go in the future. We took a programmatic approach with, um, with our environmental assessment. We did an EA over the entire call area. So that allowed us to to be able to, I believe they built in, and Ari can correct me if I'm wrong, she's sitting back there. I believe we built into our EA where we could have up to 18 leases. Leases, not wind energy, just the, the identified leases within the wind energy areas over our call area. So we were we were planning ahead while in the process. So, I, I said that to build up to this. So most of the other uh, regions that have been working in wind energy, they followed a, a strict, we come out with draft wind energy areas, we have comment periods, we finalize wind energy areas, we go back out with uh, proposed sale notices in, in this process. Well, keep in mind, again, we have these lofty uh, climate goals and we're trying to, to support the administration in, in the climate goals. So <clears throat> we were sitting around one day and um, before, before actually the August sale, we, through uh, all of this engagement, supply chain came up, supply chain development always supply chain development. It's it's a chicken and egg situation. It's like, we want to invest in the supply chain, but are you going to be there for us when we do? We don't want to overbuild a supply chain that's not going to have work to do. So we were talking and we said for the Gulf, perhaps as we're doing all of this engagement, we need to talk about the potential for a second round of wind in the Gulf. Not saying we are doing it or aren't doing it, but going ahead and socializing. Again, going back to our engage early and often. So when I said we had a programmatic approach to this and we had socialized all of these areas previously, we then went back and started socializing the idea of a second round. So we pulled out, as you see, these beige areas. If you back up, look at, uh, focus on J, let's say J, K, L, and N, and, and remember where I is. So we literally pulled up our previously identified draft wind energy areas. And we started having a, uh, we had an internal discussion for a while and we got the approval to go ahead and start talking to, to the uh, stakeholders. Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call this, um, we had our last task force meeting this in April after our PSN came out. But we wanted to get to our stakeholders quickly and start socializing and getting feedback because we would not proceed with another round if we didn't have 
support and didn't have, um, you know, if, if they're not going to show up, we, we, we need to know. So we set up a, we didn't call it a task force meeting, but it had all of our task force members there, plus a whole lot more. And we called it a, a round, round table, table, a round table session. That was back in June of this year. So we started, we started talking about, hey, if we go with another one, what areas interest you the most? What are your concerns? What have we missed? We ask them to bring data to us. And, you know, there's, there's data gaps everywhere. But we did this first round process. They're all familiar with it. So here's your chance to, to give us feedback on what, what additional things you would like for us to look at before we progress. And then we started having, again, we, we hit the road again, starting having all these engagement meetings. And, and it was, no one was shocked. That was what was, uh, people can't believe us that we had the Southern Shrimp Alliance supportive. And so we, we progressed with that and we, we, we went ahead. We did not go out with a draft wind energy areas again, because we basically had socialized those. So we skipped that part of our process in the Gulf that other regions haven't skipped yet because we did it programmatically up front. We went straight to issuing final wind energy areas. So that's what this is. And it's showing the JKL and N in proximity to our lease that we have out there right now with RWE. Um, and also I is showing on the map. I was already a final wind energy area based on the first round of wind. Uh, you know, for many reasons uh, that did not happen. There were a lot of political reasons why those leases didn't lease. Uh, Texas did some things the day before the sale that greatly scared a lot of people. And um, for, for whatever happened, we didn't lease those. But as Jim stated, these people came back in the very next day, started contacting OREP in headquarters, contacting us, trying to figure out how to get their hands on these leases. So, um, And they're serious. They're really serious. Uh, so I... If, if we do move to a second sale, we haven't made that decision yet. You know, that's still out there. We're going through the process. We're putting in all the work. Um, the final decision to have a sale has not been made, but I might go back in for the next sale. It might not. It may go with an unsolicited uh, lease, lease request. request. And of course, if we get multiple, I, we publish that on the federal register. If there's multiple companies, it's going to turn into an auction, right. even through that process. And but, the last company that came in, knew they had competitors already. So they were pre-gaming us that no matter what we do, they're coming to the table. Yeah, that was last week. Yeah. It? yeah. It's all going together. But anyway, we don't know what areas we would put through in a, a, a PSN. We could move all of these there and then eliminate some of them after we receive comments. But we, we're very... We're very invested in our public comment periods in, in the Gulf. We, we do make decisions based on those. Um, left. Oh, so so basically, uh, is just the key takeaways from all of that. I would have to say is, and and Jim touched on this, but the success we had, and and we do a lot of people. We got a lot of bad press on our our auction, but we define success as leasing one lease in the Gulf. That is what we had internally. I, Jim and I. I don't know. I can't speak for everyone else. We. We said, if we get a, a lease in the Gulf, because there are so many challenges in the Gulf, that is success for us in, in the middle of oil and gas country. But I think part of the reason why, and well, I know, part, know the reason why we were successful is we had decades of lessons learned and experience in the oil and gas industry to, to build on. We, we had the workforce. We, have, I mean, we didn't have to start from scratch. We, we learned. Um, yeah. Second point, uh, I pointed this out. We we took a programmatic, large geographic approach, and um, that has proven to be a, a really good a good call for us to have done. Uh, and again, a programmatic EA within the call area too. Uh, I you know this one to me should probably be the number one key takeaway was our extensive outreach and engagement. 
because we we built those challenge we built those relationships early and we've had some of these same relationships for decades there were a few new groups that came in but we've worked with these stakeholders for a very long time the process was just a little different to them but we we may maintain contact throughout and again um, I was showing Jim because I, I don't think Jim wasn't around when we were that, one of the reasons why he wanted me to talk about this. Jim wasn't in the Gulf yet when we did this. So we were, he was quizzing me on things. And, and when he goes, well, just how much outreach did you do? And I said, mm, it's it's bigger now. The number's bigger now, but probably 400 meetings. And he's just like the eyes go, what? And, and he's asking me how many groups. And, and I, so I just pulled up my phone because I had the list on my phone and he starts flipping through all of it because we record all of our engagement and in, in what was talked about. And he's looking on this list and he looked down at the document and he goes, there's 51 pages of this here. I went, yeah, yeah, there, there was, it was hard. It was hard work, but it was worth it. Um, another key takeaway for the success was the model use. This was initiated in the Gulf. Our other regions had not adopted this yet. I think James touched on that as well yesterday. But um, it was, you know, there were some growing pains there. But now I, I think I think everyone now wants to follow this process. And, and they are following this process. This collaboration with NOAA and COS just it caught fire. And, and they're all they're all doing it now. And I mean, we're kind of we're kind of proud that we mm -hmm. we were able to to help the bureau with that. You know, we we, we like to we like to share our information in the Gulf, and you know, it just leads to success for everyone. But the key thing, and James said this yesterday, and it was so funny because I'm sitting here thinking that's my fifth key takeaway, and James is saying it. And we didn't even talk before mm. yesterday. The model is only a tool. And we've made that clear to everyone. It is only a tool. It is not making our decisions. We, the humans, get to, to do that. But with that said, Akaktuk has rested. And um, I'm sure he's ready to roll on. Well, that sort of touches on where we're going to go with the next part of this. Um, as you're familiar with movies and Hollywoods, um, they always like to have a prequel, you know, after a successful movie. Um, so I wanted to look back. Now, at our last meeting that we did virtually, Scott, you had some phenomenal questions that I got from other groups that I want to uh, touch on as we look back before this started. Uh, I'm not going to date myself, but I guess I am. Um, I am a Texas A&M graduate. I did my dissertation at the Flower Gardens in the Florida Keys. The Flower Gardens was studied now for over 50 years, the original studies for the Flower Gardens, which is now a National Marine Sanctuary, was funded by the Bureau of Land Management, which used to be where the studies program and our leasing program was, okay? So we're out there doing this work. Uh, my major professor, Tom Bright, and plus uh, my, the rest of my committee, uh, Dave McGrail, Dick Rezik, and a few others, did the pinnacle trend work. Uh, and also the hard banks. You're familiar with Bright Bank, Geyer Bank, Sonier Bank. These are topographic features on the top of salt domes. Um, so that work was being done. Uh, there's always been fairways out there and lightering areas. Uh, we've had all of this stuff has been going on. And that is before the term ecosystem-based management uh, became, I hate to use the term buzzword, but before that became part of our vernacular. And then coastal marine spatial planning, CSMP. Um, I don't know if some of you remember, when that came out, very scientifically based, it caused a lot of angst because people associated coastal marine spatial planning with zoning and marine reserves and no-take areas. It was a mess. Remember that, Rodney? Oh, yeah. Uh, now we're calling it ocean planning, but we were following a lot of those principles that make up ecosystem-based management and spatial planning way back before we had these phenomenal tools. In fact, if you go throughout the history, you're going to see that we've always avoided navigation lanes. We've always avoided military areas. We worked with DOD. National Marine Sanctuaries, we protected the flower gardens before no one knew they were there. I Man, I know, I've been diving on those. Uh, the hard banks, the topographic features. Uh, historical areas of significance. We're not going to let somebody knowingly put a platform or a pipeline on a shipwreck. Um, 
We have mitigations, minimizing impacts to marine mammals, turtles, and fisheries. Uh, the Gulf Office, when it was MMS, did the first poster of marine mammals in the Gulf of Mexico because working with NOAA, we did those studies. And I think there were 27. I don't know what the count is now, but 27 marine mammals with a poster. People were shocked. Why are you making a poster about marine mammals in the Gulf of Mexico? The only thing there is dolphins. Well, sorry, there's more there. Um, chemosynthetic communities, the year I started uh, with uh, MMS, I believe it was Willis Pequinot from AM and some colleagues were on a research vessel. They pulled up some weird stuff off the bottom of the Gulf and said, wait a minute, this is stuff that's on the Mid Atlantic Ridge or related to it. Chemosynthetic communities do a study, don't allow things to happen there. The same with deep water corals. Everyone knows corals don't exist below the photic zone. You know, the symbiosis with zooxanthellae and that kind of stuff. Well, when you have a big accumulation of lophelia in the deep, it has a reef effect. So we had deep water coral reefs, new to science. We started to take into consideration viewscapes, okay? Um, putting wind turbines, or oil and glass platforms back then off of some national parks, people don't want to see that. Let's talk about it. And then the significant sand resources. We've always adapted as we learn more. In fact, on more, more than one occasion, I've been approached by someone that says, how come you never turn down a lease? An oil company comes in, dangles money in front of you, and you just take it. Well, we do this work ahead of time. We plan for it. It's not perfect, but we do what needs to be done so we don't make a, a dumb decision. So let's see here. Um, so now I pulled this off the web. Uh, this is a typical diagram for adaptive management. Well, one thing that's incredibly important for adaptive management, and we talked about it yesterday and here, and Laura hit on it, is stakeholder engagement. That is absolutely key. You've got to sit down and talk with people. You go ahead and you marry that with changes in your processes. What you're doing now is probably going to change tomorrow, except that. So we like to say that we have a continuous analysis of the diverse resources in their geographic ranges, you know, climate change, changes in migration patterns, as information, strategic needs, priorities, and technologies uh, evolve. I mean, we're cognizant of that. We follow it. We use a matrix management approach. Uh, we have a lot of uh, experience with renewable energy. Like, well, this is your first sale. What do you know? Um, the person running our lease sale for the Gulf, um, Bridget DePlantis, right? Mm -hmm. What did she do on the Atlantic? She was managing the activities on the Atlantic as well from our office. So a lot of the people in our office and in Ari's office doing the environmental work we're doing work for OREP on the Atlantic coast to get the experience of the processes on what we did. Sometimes we had to change them a bit to work with the Gulf because the people know us. I mean, things in the Gulf of Mexico offshore are not alien like they are off the Atlantic. I mean, where do rig people go when they're got their seven days off and go fishing? They go out to a rig, tie up and fish. That's totally alien in the Atlantic. I met my wife scuba diving under a platform. Um, the, they, the culture is different. You have to factor that in. So to go back one step further, how do we start to deconflict things? And so imagine a room like this, okay, where you've got my staff that's incredible, geologists, geophysicists, petroleum engineers sitting at the table. You've got people from Ari's group for environment. I've got people with experience in renewable energy, like Bridget and her team helping the Atlantic sitting at that table. I've got my sand people sitting there. And then I've got a few people who are working on carbon sequestration. They sit at the table. We bring up these maps. We bring up this information. And the only term I can think of, and it's I hate this term, but it's the only thing I can find is the horse trading. So here we have an area that's got lots of wind. Well, what are the oil and gas resources at that area? Okay, what's next to it? So, okay, this is good for wind. There's better oil and gas places over to the west. So that might be good for wind. Wait a minute. There's a significant sand resource there. Should we take some of those areas out in that area, we think, for wind because there's significant sand resources we need to put back on the beach? 
uh, okay, well, we can do this. Now, wait a minute, what about carbon sequestration? There's saline aquifers and depleted oil and gas reservoirs under there that might be perfect car carbon sequestration. These conversations actually take place around the table just outside my office in my conference room, where we sit down with the data, the modeling runs, the experts in the field, and say, okay, we're looking to the future. Conventional energy, renewable energy, carbon sequestration. Oh, now we've got wind and now we've got, you know, hydrogen. First of all, let's deconflict, and we've got all our other partners, the Shrimpers, DOD, um, the Coast Guard. Where are the areas where we don't have a lot of conflict, like we went through for the wind? Okay, let's look at those first. Then for areas that look like they're either very good for oil and gas or very good for wind or very good for sand, what else is conflicting with them? And you sit down and you work it out. That's why we, uh, Laura said and James Morrison said that the modeling and the computers don't make the decision we do. And then we have to look to the future. There's an area that may have a lot of oil and gas infrastructure. Okay, well, eventually that infrastructure will be gone. Some of it may be used for carbon sequestration. Remember that while we're talking about future for wind turbines, sand, and then hydrogen. So all of those things are floating around in the room with all the maps, with some of the, the best people in the world I've ever worked with. Um, looking at this, looking at the data, knowing where the data comes, the input from all of those 400 meetings that we've had, and where do things work best to try to keep as many people, you know, happy as possible, but we're not Burger King and we can't keep everybody happy, but how do we get the most bang for our buck, preserve the ecosystem and have sustainability? Uh, if you're into science and this kind of stuff, like myself, this is a, a, a kid in a candy store. But the Gulf is very unique, having worked here and headquarters in Alaska. They've got a history of working offshore. They have a history with all the stakeholders. We know who they are. They can call us at any time. We have an open door policy. We sit down with the latest and greatest data we can get, the latest modeling runs, and then we work it out. What is in the best interest of everybody? And with that, I think I will shut up. Anything you want to add? Yeah, I... I see an opportunity as an example of how, how we do adapt. Uh, we were engaged in the, the wind energy effort before the, the bill was handed down and we had to start looking at carbon sequestration. So we were well underway in our modeling for wind. So uh, as a really prime example of how we will adapt in the future, uh, this, this first modeling effort it is, it's just what it is. Uh, I anticipate that that was the outputs from that will will feed Gulf Wind 2 if we have it, if we don't. But we recognize the need now because, you know, we use the best available science at that time. But now with all of the work that's been being done in carbon sequestration, we already had wind energy areas defined and our resource evaluation people were like, but wait. We have been tasked with carbon sequestration. And as he said, I believe we had 70 people working on this, seven different teams. They were doing the assessments of the entire Gulf for, for potential storage capacity. They were looking at saline aquifers and depleted reservoirs. So some of those impinged on the edges of, of some of the wind energy areas out of our Gulf Wind 1 modeling. They were like, hold up, you can't do that. Like, but we are because that was the best available at that point. And we will have to adapt and we will exclude and we will make those decisions that Jim said, but that was a, a prime example. Things are constantly in motion mm -hmm. and they're constantly changing and we have to change with it. It's like, we can't just say, well, we've got this great model from NCOS. We've got to follow this. Like, no, no, we're, we're not going to be able to do that because we have to change with the changes. But I just wanted to make that oh, point. Yeah, and, it, and this is a lot of fun. It's a lot of work. But if you're into this kind of stuff, uh, it's very rich conversations. Ari, you're sitting in the back. Anything you want to add from the environmental side? Did we miss anything? You know, it, <laughs> it, it, it's really uh, it's really a neat thing. Um, uh, the culture of the Gulf is different than other par uh, areas. Um, we anticipate the changes. Um, mapping, I loved it about where we got to move from us. We are we have moved from a static way of thinking to dynamic way of thinking. Things are changing. That's the fact of life, which means everything you're doing day to day has to change. 
And with that, I think we're done. Thank, thank you, you for, for listening. Absolutely, and thank you for your presentation. <clears throat> um, as per our um, usual, I'm going to look for tent cards and raised hands in the participants list. Um, and I will start with Scott and then I will call on myself as well. <laughs> well, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you both for excellent presentations. Great overview. I think you have outlined why the Gulf of Mexico is the most likely place to work on trying to sort out how BOEM is going to handle marine spatial planning. Uh, it's It goes beyond sorting out conflicts. It's actually get, trying to, I think ultimately aim for what is going to uh, provide the most uh, combined benefit for the country, maybe the world, uh, economically and environmentally. And uh, so I, 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 and I applaud your efforts to, to ad advance on, on that front. I also applaud your efforts to work with other agencies to do that. Um, I do have a challenge for you, though, uh, to uh, raise the game in terms of your adaptive management approach as you go to consider the next wind leasing round in the Gulf of Mexico. It didn't appear to me in your first evaluation that you considered the impact of uh, the potential of carbon capture and sequestration. But um, even though I realize your 70 people and your 500 page, 250, 500 page report is not out yet, but uh, there has been a lot of work done already that's mm -hmm. been published. Mm -hmm. As I recall, um, uh, I, I think the uh, BEG, Bureau of Economic Geology in Texas, and, and in some maps that were reported uh, to us at, at COSA, and I think you guys were here a year or so ago, uh, outlined about 300 gigatons of, of, of storage yep. capacity in the, the shelf of Texas and Louisiana. Um, more recently, last week, I checked Exxon, mm -hmm. who I think is a pretty competent company. Mm -hmm. I, I, I good competitor. I, you know, my wife used to work for them too, Those full people. disclosure. Um, uh, five, raise that game to 500, 500 gigatons. <laughs> now that's a lot of storage, mm -hmm. uh, probably mostly in saline reservoirs, but probably maybe some in, in depleted fields. Put that, that storage capacity into perspective. There was a report by the National Academies published in 2019 on negative emissions. It's basically what's the pathway to get to net zero? Yeah, you know, the National Academy does some good stuff now and then. Uh, and and I think they basically said, even if we go full on and with great success uh, in terms of deploying new re renewable energy technologies, we're still going to be looking at have to, having to put away about 500 gigatons of CO2 storage uh, uh, between now and, and uh, getting to net zero close to 2090. I've got the slide here. I'm glad to show it to you if you haven't seen it. Uh, and that's to stay within two, two degrees C. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, make, and things may have gone up since then. This was three, four years ago now. But no, it's ballpark figure, 500, 500 gigatons. Well, gosh, golly, what if the Gulf of Mexico could like handle that for the planet? Whoa, wouldn't that be kind of exciting? Wouldn't that be in a major um, environmental achievement? Is that something we ought to take a hard look at? And if that's the case, uh, does it make sense that we should uh, dedicate leases to things that are not as impactful for climate change. For example, wind potential. And I'll just put it in context. You showed a great slide that showed the wind potential in the Gulf of Mexico from your studies. NREL has this, a similar map. I think it's published in your latest budget proposal. Uh, shows South Texas, where there is very low storage potential, as being the best place in the Gulf. And it still would rank way below the East Coast and the West Coast. And then uh, the areas that has prime uh, CCS potential uh, is pretty low potential. So would we be better off prioritizing um, uh, in a, some sort of trade-off analysis? We have to do that trade-off analysis. But would we be better off prioritizing th those leases for use for carbon capture and sequestration uh, to a, a potentially a bigger end than power generation that might be able to be done other ways? And I realize the importance of blue hydrogen, but maybe there's other ways to get the you know the the energy for blue hydrogen. I'm just just thinking. One, one, I think that's probably something to take a real hard look at before we go for that next round of lease sales. And I wonder if there's a bigger um, you know uh, aspiration uh, out there that CCS could be a, a part of. Now maybe we'll find out that it's just not that big great a thing. You know we're going to hear this afternoon from from the folks in the North Sea. But um, 
uh, might be worth look, listening to. Just as a as a, a twist on that, I I was just at the um, uh, national uh, meeting of my uh, professional association and the geophysical professional association. There was a lot of talk about a lot of interest in CACS, a lot of interest in renewables, a lot of interest in wind, a lot of people talking back and forth about what they've learned so far in places like the North Sea. One caution we got was it's pretty tough to put big new projects like CCS in the middle of a wind farm, mm -hmm. particularly the dense footprint you see in the North Sea and the shallow waters, which is I think what you're going to be what you're proposing is fairly dense footprints. Pretty hard to put that, that stuff in there. Hard to get the rigs in, hard to get the pipe lay vessels in, very hard to shoot the 4D seismic that you're probably going to use to monitor how the plumes move yeah, over exactly. time and make sure it stays down there. So I, I I would encourage you to take a hard look at how CCS could impact future leasing decisions and think a little bit about how we're going to do that trade-off analysis. This isn't the only place time it's going to come up. We're going to, we're going to continue right. to see these challenges. Thanks. Sounds like he's sitting in our RE. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. I agree. I agree with I agree with everything you just said. Yes. Um and and we are we are taking a hard look at it. I may probably have downplayed it a little bit because my focus has been on wind for for a while but uh part of the part of the joy of my job is I I I can't just specialize in wind. I have to I have to stay on top of carbon sequestration and part of that has been while um, leading this wind effort in the Gulf I also had a, a big role in our carbon work at, at the Gulf level and also uh, at the headquarters level. I'm one of the ones that um, we, we get put on, when I talk about engagement and, and we, we always talk about energy transition, but you know, it, it's huge. So they put me on airplanes and I, I, I go all over the world talking about this. So we're, we have been, and, and many people in headquarters and the Gulf have been doing a lot of international travel on the topic of carbon sequestration and learning from the people that are ahead of us. I mean, we know this. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. They're ahead. Everyone else is ahead of us. We're, we're behind in the game. So we're rapidly mm -hmm. learning from from, you know, their lessons learned. So so we're, we're closing closing the gap quickly. But, yes, we are taking a hard look at it. And um I, again, most recently, and, and Bill was along on this trip for part of the trip, we spent a couple of weeks in Australia, and a big part of that trip was discussions on carbon sequestration. Um, I, I think there were still meetings on that when Bill when Bill finally made it to Australia. <laughs> uh, he, he didn't go with the rest. Shut down. Didn't happen. <laughs> but but yeah, we, we are. We, we do see the importance of it. But an, another part, and, and this isn't necessarily the governmental way to do it, but for carbon sequestration, we are relying heavily on our industry partners. Right. There you go. Um, <laughs> you have to be careful around this one. Um, mm. We are you, the Exxons. The, we, we are engaging with them worldwide. And we have these uh, industry groups like the OOC down in the, the Gulf. We, we meet with them. We are actually, you know, how, how the government way is usually to throw a bunch of regs together and then throw it out there for people to comment on. That is not the process we followed this time with carbon sequestration. These, these leaders, these industry leaders, Chevron, Exxon, I mean, I, you know, they're all out there in this they are actually getting to help formulate our regulations yet <laughs> so you know we 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 couldn't you know when we're developing regulations we can't talk about what we will do and won't do or whatever but we were all sitting at the table in these industry um you know, basically cohorts where we're sitting around and they're like but you need to consider this and and we were looking you know we're doing assessments and looking at the saline aquifers and, and determining the same the storage capacities that you were referring to. I didn't I didn't even think to come today with uh, gigatons of, of, of the numbers because but yeah, we, we are looking at that. We're listening to industry. They even got us to look more. We were initially looking at saline aquifers and they're like, but, you know, we've got all of these depleted reservoirs and it, it comes down to integrity and, and containment and uh, plume migration and all of these things. There's still so many unknowns out there. It, it's going to be a while down the road, but I, I just want to assure you, we are taking a long, hard look at it. And the one thing I'd like to add to this, I was to a, an ancillary meeting to OTC uh, this last May 
hosted by the Netherlands. And there was a lot of industry people, both uh, domestic and then international. And they had a very good conversation on this and they promised to work together better and to share information. I finally got so frustrated. I said, stop, you're already talking to each other. What good does it do to talk among yourself? If you stop somebody coming out of Walmart and told them you're involved in carbon sequestration, they're not gonna know anything about this and it's gonna be scary. There is a carbon sequestration process or operation going on somewhere in Louisiana, Lake something or other. Mm -hmm. And the people, pardon me? Maurepas. Maurepas. And the, the community is up in arms. They were not prepared for this. And so with things mm -hmm. like green hydrogen, you mentioned hydrogen to some folks, they're gonna think of the Hindenburg. If you think of carbon sequestration, and it's already out there, I know, I'm sorry, I got to say it, is no. the, the soda bottle with the Mentos in it um, <laughs> and shooting up. So I think we need to do a lot of outreach to the general public so they understand what this is and get rid of the fear before it really comes out. So that's part of our discussions. And with that, I'll shut up. Well, yeah, and, and no, that that is internationally. I can and speak to that. That was the same concerns internationally that, that they had was the the engagement with the general public that just don't understand the science and and how to break it down and and, and get them to understand because we i'm gonna yeah just keep us moving because we've got i think a few questions on the line okay. and in the room so um i want to make sure we have time for everybody Les, i'm going to turn to you next and then jack and then kevin you had your hand up but you took it down do you want to be in the queue okay and then we'll go to jeremy uh, thanks, guys. I mean, personally, I'm a very big fan of all this, but there's one concern that I have. Uh, every structure that we put out on the OCS is an experiment that we can learn from. But learning from it requires that uh, its impacts are monitored and that we have reference areas to compare to. Um, in other words, an experimental design. And in addition, that has to extend far longer than the two or three years that is typically associated with a lease contract. So um, what can we do, what, what do we have for a sensory system to understand the changes brought about by what we're doing out there? Thanks, Kevin. That's a good question. We have discussed that um, in Nauseam. Um, one of my first presentation was to GCUS, the Coastal Ocean Observing System, where they wanted to know what they should monitor uh, for renewable energy. They got a very similar presentation to this, but the message was, what do you not have to monitor? You know, there's so much going on with conventional, now renewable carbon sequestration, et cetera, that the list is endless. And so to get back to, to your uh, question, Les, it's a very active discussion. We're talking with some of our federal partners. Uh, some folks would like us to fund them to do their monitoring. Uh, we can do some monitoring with um, industry. In fact, it's mentioned in the proposed rule. I can't talk much about it because it's not public yet, but some of that is weaved in there for carbon sequestration. But it is an active, point of discussion that monitoring means you do it and you continue it. And I got experience that at the flower gardens. When I was there, we were going out every quarter until we realized corals don't grow that fast. You can go out once a year. But well, that took a couple of decades of experience to learn that you could go out once or twice a year. You didn't have to invest every quarter. Um, also, also, Jim, those nights on the fling or the spree, they there was get what? out of you. <laughs> Those were the boats we used to access the flower gardens. It was a rough ride. Yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> All right, we'll turn to Jack next and then to Jeremy. Thanks for that presentation. And I'm gonna ask a related question to what Les just said. And that is, uh, as, we, as we make these changes in the ocean uh, to help with the public understand them, we need to say something about the changes that Les referred to. And one of the ways we do that is by having long-term historic data sets. And there are places in the ocean where those are occurring. And what we've been doing a bit on the West Coast is considering the research community to be a user of the ocean. And that's another data layer in your analysis. And these are super important places. They're 
their point measurements. They might be um, regions for biodiversity surveys. They might be hydrographic lines, et cetera. And so it would be really good as you talk to G. Coos and others that you consider that as a use of the ocean that can really help us document what's going on. Excellent, thank you. Jeremy? Yeah, hi, uh, good morning. So I, I've got a number of things I wanna uh, bring up. Um, uh, first, I think there are a lot of reasons why we might as a country want to develop oil and gas in the Gulf, but sustainability is not one of them. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think, you know, we need to, to we need to be careful on how we're presenting our work in the Gulf, because there are a lot of reasons, but we, you know, as a country, we, you know, the administration has said, we, oil and gas is not sustainable. To the, to the, but I, I want to focus most on, on, on talking about the trade-offs and, and the engagement. So the, those are sort of the, the main things you 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 focused on. Um, it, you showed us this schematic where you group things into seven buckets and then you equally weighted them. Um, and that may be a good start, but uh, it depends a lot on lumping and splitting and how you lump and how you split. Um, I mean, I could say that natural should go in one and cultural should be another and there should be eight buckets. Um, and it's not also clear that the weights always should be equal. So, and, and indeed, as you said at one point on national security, you just X'd out an area. So uh, there are certain things that may carry different weights mm -hmm. in different areas. And so um, I, I think just saying we're going to create everything equal is mm -hmm. particularly when you're lumping, you're lumping um, and that is problematic. Um, the same thing, there was a, a picture of, of 24 pelagic bird species, and it's good to, to lump in that way, but we also need to split because at the end of the day, we're concerned about biologically significant impacts to individual species and populations. And so um, we can't, we, you know, how you look at data and how you treat data um is important mm -hmm. um and it may be that that's where the majority of bird species go but there might be one individual line through these other areas for one important species uh that would be really significant and so and, and maybe you did that but just from the presentation it's not it wasn't clear uh how you're lumping and how you're you're splitting um I, i'm a little concerned about the skipping of engagements on this next round. Um, and, and, and I say that, you know, yeah, I mean, my, most of my research is focused around both social science, uh, uh, acceptance and issues of, of, of justice. So um, it, as you said, the focus on the next round might be more on hydrogen. Um, I'm not quite convinced that you're going to get a lot of bids anyway, just because the wind speeds are quite low in the Gulf. Um, you know, as your map showed, they're even in the windiest part of the Gulf over uh, on the edge and the Texas coast are not considerably mm -hmm. high. You've also got obviously a very large land-based wind resource in Texas, which is something that doesn't really exist on the East coast. And so there's reasons why, people went offshore on the East Coast where you may not have as much interest going offshore. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I know that there are people in Texas, including the, one of the Texas Railroad Commissioners that's opposed. Yeah, we uh, So we, we have some politicians who are opposed, but we know, and, and as you said, there are concerns that people don't really understand carbon capture, they don't understand hydrogen, they may think of the Hindenburg. Um, so that would suggest that you need to do more engagement, not skip engagement, that there are border communities, there are environmental justice communities uh, that may have, you know, we don't know, someone may change their mind, they may think they're going to do hydrogen at first, they may decide instead. 
they're going to go uh, ashore with a cable um, and all of these issues. And so your communities are, are going to be really uh, important. So just like, I mean, you said that you rely on your industrial partners. You should rely to the same extent on your commercial fishers and Absolutely. your your border communities that may be impacted. So um, I don't know if we want to rely on any of them. We want to engage with them and, and get informed by them. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you guys are regulators to do the best for the country uh, as a whole, um, not for industry, not even, you know, and, and so we just need to, to, to think about this. Um, and, you know, maybe things went pretty smoothly the first time, but as we've seen, things can blow up pretty fast. Right. New Jersey being a good example. Uh, and, um, things that may appear to be a cakewalk, uh, may become a plank. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we just need to be mindful of all, all of these things on both the engagement side. And then again, going back to the sort of more nuanced, the issues that were really focused on the spatial, I think it, it's trade-off analysis and waiting and, and doing sensitive, it's quite complicated um and it's more than just putting up a bunch of maps and and talking with people in rooms so uh, no you're spot on with everything yeah. you said um can, please. Can I, yeah um thanks thanks for that jeremy i appreciate it um, i just want to provide a little clarification on uh probably use the word skipping um probably probably shouldn't have used that word but um we we have we're not skipping engagement. We are not we we okay. are doing the same level of engagement. The part that we skipped was the the that step in the process for going out with a draft area and then to a final area. We're skipping that draft step because we had already determined the draft areas before previously. The engagement did not change. We have we have I don't know, probably right now, at least three engagement meetings a week with different parties. It's, it's the same process we followed with the first one. So we are not, absolutely not skipping the engagement. That is what is going to help shape the any decisions. We, we don't rely on that. We take the information in and still make the decisions. Like, like you, you made the comment about the, with the industry partners. Yeah, they're not driving the bus. We are listening to them because they have unlimited research dollars and potential and they, they, they have a lot of information for us that we can learn from. We leverage these relationships to learn, but we're not just bending over because industry wants us to do something a certain way. We, we're listening to what they have to say. We're listening to our own information, but I, I, I don't want you to think it, it's quite that easy because, you know, we, we have, you know, we, we've had a reputation in the past for, for industry, getting too close to industry. We, we're not. So, and the other, the other point I wanted to bring up was, um, you know, the, the level of the migratory birds. I, I do understand what you're saying there. Uh, if you want to see, that was intended to be just a high level overview. We could spend two days on it easily on this model, talking about what went into it and the calculations and all the species and everything. Um, that was just intended as a high level overview. I, I strongly encourage any of you that are curious to go to our website and pull up this, this uh, wind siding report, this in cost report, you can get all of the, the species and, and how they were considered. It, it, I, I oversimplify, um, probably because I'm used to speaking to in these engagement meetings where you, you do have to roll up some of it together. Uh, but if you want to see the specific species and, and all the minutia of it, please, please read this. It's, it's very informative. And then after the first wind sale, we did meet with a, a fishing group. I'm not going to get specific and said, what did you think? And they thanked us for listening. And if we were to do this again, what would you recommend? 
And the areas they said, oh, you should go for those where we've already discussed were the mm -hmm. ones that we mm -hmm. put forward to the director. So we are building on the engagement because all that engagement happened just a year before the sale. So we're continuing those engagement constantly. And Laura's right. Half the time I can't find her and half the staff because they're having engagements with everybody. Uh, and in terms of energy, you're absolutely correct. I hate using the term oil and gas because it gives some people a negative connotation, which probably is not deserved. So I like to say conventional energy and energy, but the BOEM's mission is to manage the energy coming from the OCS. Now it's predominantly fossil fuels, but we are transitioning right now into renewables. And for us, it's potentially wind, maybe hydrogen in Alaska, where I moved from Cook Inlet is the perfect place for hydrokinetic. Um, so yeah, your, your point is well taken. Uh, your words have meaning. Yep, appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna take a liberty to call myself and then Kevin and then Carrie. Um, and apologies, cause I've been typing some notes so I might read a little bit here. Um, but going back to Jeremy's point about revisiting the draft areas, um, I can completely understand the logic behind, we just had all this consultation and engagement. Um, let's build from that for, for round two. But I think it's important to recognize that there may be things you learn from round one uh, once things get underway. And further that the feedback may change. Mm -hmm. Other things in the ocean are changing uh, rapidly, where fish stocks are, et cetera. So you might, you know, you might consider at what reasonable frequency you're willing to build off of uh, the, the communications you've already had and at what frequency you need to revisit those draft areas uh, in terms of engagement, um, consultation, uh, listening, et cetera. Um, my second point deals with that. I think I'm, my comment is probably not giving near enough credit to what all you have been doing, um, but I think it may be a matter of semantics and tone. Uh, and that is to say that when I was listening, I heard a number of sort of key words that struck me. They were engaging, talking, teaching, socializing, only once or twice did I hear listening um, and learning. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that that's a really key aspect of the engagements that you all are, are probably doing. You did say adapting, um, and I think that that's key. But as you communicate about your engagements and your communications, I think it's really important to acknowledge where and how that involves learning from the people um, and recognition of the knowledge that they bring to the table and not just the naivety, which I think a lot of people are fearful mm -hmm. out of naivety, but uh, a lot of people are also very familiar with these spaces. Um, so I would just note that. Uh, I also think, um, again, probably just a tone thing, but everything I've heard was about um, deconfliction, the butt weights. I didn't hear a lot about, and look, or, um, complementary uses, innovative synergies, um, compatibility. And those are, I think, areas where I would, I would like to see what's being done in that space. How are we looking to make these multiple uses more compatible? Or um, how are we looking to capitalize on infrastructures that are there or will be there for other purposes? Maybe it's ocean monitoring. Maybe it's, um, you know, uh, you mentioned fishing by the rigs. You know, there, there are some of these things that may be not just compatible, but synergistic. Um, and so I'm wondering where in the process that gets introduced. Maybe it's at the table around your, uh, outside of your office, Jim, um, but maybe it's in the engagements, I don't know. I just, I didn't hear a lot about um, looking for opportunities with the multiple uses, so much as considering each use detrimental to the suitability of the others. So those were just a couple of thoughts um, that I had that I thought I would articulate. Um, welcome to respond or I can go to Kevin next. Great, that was great feedback. I took that down, I Thanks. appreciate that. Kevin and then Carrie. 
Great. Thank you. I actually uh, did decide to to throw my question. I mean, uh, my, my initial questions were were perhaps a little too into the weeds, but if you could post the link for that uh, report you mentioned, Laura, that would be great because I was wondering, for example, about the tuna. I know tuna spawned uh, down in that that area and and I was wondering if that was considered I but but before I jump into my my bigger question I did have one question that where you laid out your your area of of topic it seemed to me and correct I and this is from memory so I might be wrong but wasn't there a large anoxic event down there and uh didn't that affect the shrimp distribution so yes you know, you're especially with the 2015 to 2019 time series was that kind of driving your your distribution a little bit oh that that's part of the discussion you're talking about nancy rabois's work in the hypoxic zone uh for the gulf of mexico all that stuff is factored in to the discussions for the environment uh you know in, in a talk like this for an hour you can't cover everything but that's a good observation it is part of the environmental information we have to factor into all of this stuff. And of course that hypoxia area could change with the changing climate. It's getting warmer uh, and the species are changing. So that was an excellent observation. It is something we do look at. It's one of many things. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's good. Okay. And then I'm gonna get that more. link. I'm, no, I'm just getting the link for it. Okay. Sending the link. Yeah. Um, what else? There was one, go ahead, please. Well, I was going to say my, my bigger question, though, and it's a little bit perhaps it's for, for Bill next to you there, too, is that I mean, by by doing this, by you, you mentioned the, the Mid-Atlantic a lot and how uh, uh, they didn't use a spatial kind of model in this kind of overlap. But the you know, really, these wind farm developments, this is just beginning right to, to hit our 2030 and 2050 uh, projections of 110 gigawatts and such. I, I I mean I know the Gulf of Maine is just coming online and stuff. Are you are you thinking that your work here will now set the tone for the rest of of Bohm and the rest of the working in these areas that 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 everyone will expect to be using these kind of models now? Yeah. Actually, what I would what I would point to is is uh, the effort that. Uh, Jake Levinson and others are leading with with uh, SOX and ecosystem based management, and uh, uh, what what Jake has described to me, and I'm, I'm haven't I haven't really gotten briefed on the details yet, but we're we're we're, we're doing uh, we're trying to develop something that's quite like was done with NCOST here, but to uh, to make it even better, more dynamic. And we're doing that in consultation with with everyone in Boehm. Uh So, to the extent decisions already, already haven't been made and investments done, we're I think we're moving in that direction. Yeah, right on. Thank you. The links well, just if, been if I can path. if I can add on to that, Bill. Uh, the the more recently leased areas outside of the Gulf, like the Central Atlantic and the Oregon area, went through the same process with NCOS. So we've been doing it beyond the Gulf recently, and um, as Bill mentioned, we have, you know, our eyes on the future, doing it even better. Thanks, Jessica, Terry, and then Les. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I. Um, I really appreciate the presentation. I especially appreciate the dialogue. Um, and Stacy, you hit on a number of my points. So thank you, gratitude, and you as well, Jeremy. Um, I guess, you know, a couple of things have jumped out at me. So I'm, bring, I'm bringing my human dimensions lens to this and maybe in particular fisheries, but thinking more broadly as well. And I guess um, one of those things that to some extent has already been noted is that this is these are highly dynamic systems and they are changing rapidly and in many ways unpredictably and i think of the gulf in some sense as a more protected version of what we have out on on the west coast for example so those dynamics really strike me you have um people in the agencies and the external scientific community coastal communities ocean 
engaged people, et cetera, all of whom have these observations and experiences of, of this um, dynamism and change. And so I think it's really important to keep dialogue going at all levels and be able to tap into that information and understanding. And it is labor intensive and yeah, so be it, <laughs> stick with it, don't give up. It's really it's really valuable to engage with that, um, those diverse forms of knowledge and experience and understanding. Um, I, I come back to using maps as a support tool to inform decision-making. And I, um, I think maps include some things and exclude others, one, because they may or may not be mappable. Um, but also because they may or may not occur to the person doing the mapping or the people who are doing the mapping or collate, collating the data to generate the maps. One of the things that I've observed in some interactions out on the West Coast is that there are data sources that are compiled. These are data, and this is somewhat redundant of something I said yesterday, data sources that are compiled, let's say, on fisheries but they are collected for different purposes and they represent certain things, but don't represent others. And there are lots of um, other things that influence the resulting data and what they show you on the map. And people who have been involved in the activities that are re represented by those data, for example, fishermen, have a fair bit of knowledge about what the relationship may be between what's actually done and experienced on the water and then what shows up on those maps of that activity. And I think it is super important and super valuable to engage with that uh, and, and make really good use of it. We've had some experiences out on the West Coast where some things have been shown on maps that grossly misrepresent the way space is used. So a huge caution. The other thing is that I we hear a lot of talk about shrimpers in the Gulf of Mexico, because that's what that and snapper, right? Those are the biggies. Um, I think it gets really complicated when you start to think about the diversity of activities within fisheries, other types of uses, including research, for example. Um, and there is how you, how you accommodate that diversity of information and those representations, for example, of human behavior, you know, it's it's easier to go for the top five, right? The big ones that really stand out. But those little ones also play a role in the in the whole. And whenever change occurs in that system, all of those components have the the likelihood of changing dramatically as well. So anyway, I have a tendency to get into the weeds, um, but I think some of these weeds are really important to pay attention to. Um, and so I am uh, I like the idea of putting heads together and seeing if people can paint a picture of what's going on out there. I think the information that's not necessarily captured on the map is as important, if not more important than what the map shows you. And um, I, anyway, I. I guess I'll stop there. Thank you. No, no, that that was great. In fact, I'm having a flashback to my last meeting in the Arctic where you go up there with our maps of where the ice moves and the currents, sit down with the Nupiat whaler with their indigenous knowledge, throw the maps away because they have information that go back generations. That's phenomenal. Um, as a, In terms of sitting down with everybody, trust, and ver trust but verify. Also, talk with the folks that have that data. Just don't take it verbatim. Sit down with them. Um, and there's an old phrase, I'm trying to think of it, an old philosopher, the best ideas come with um, a diversity of participants in the discussion. And we don't sit down with one office to talk about how we're going to do this. If we're going to talk about environmental issues, I want the other folks in the room to hear it because they will raise issues and questions just like you did. You know, can you re where that data come from? Is that a reputable source? Um, or who else has data to complement that? So, yeah, you're right on. Uh, that's why it's hard. <laughs> yeah, and, and thank you, Jim. And, and let me just follow up with another comment. A, a really important point you both have made is how distinctive the knowledge that you're using is. And that's 
the relationship between, for example, offshore oil and gas activity and other types of activities, people wearing multiple hats, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. The trust. We can't hear you, Carrie. Can you turn on your microphone? Thank you. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. The distinctive culture of the Gulf of Mexico, right? And the relationship among different ocean users and people wearing different hats. Over time, the building of trust in many ways, there's also distrust or mistrust. It's, as you have rightly pointed out, it's different in different parts of the country. I, there is, that is not happening on the Pacific coast, <laughs> full stop. And at least based on what I have seen and uh, it, and at least in terms of the fishing community and the um, offshore energy sector. Um, I think you could get there, but it's very different. So this is a very interesting example. What's relevant there and what's not or whatever, how things might be approached differently to address those very real circumstances and that very different culture, I think really valuable to, to think very concretely about. Thank you. I am I am so glad you said that because having worked in the Gulf Office headquarters in Alaska, even though we want to have policies and procedures everybody can use, uh, geography, climate, local cultures have got to be considered. What works at one place may not work at another for very good reason. One size does not fit all. So I'm so glad what you just said. You hear that, Bill? <laughs> and I guess, uh, uh, Carrie, I, I certainly uh, agree with what you just said, and and welcome it. And and um, there, uh, I mean, it's pretty evident, like Jeremy said, that there are certain species that there are particular rules. For. In fact, we have rules under the Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Act, for example, that that uh, you know are upset uh, by legislation, and we we they're. The weight has already been decided that if you cross a certain standard, you you have to stop. Uh, and I I think that I think I think the generic weighting is a really actually as a you have to start somewhere, but uh, I I don't think it'll ever be resolved. I mean, there's always going to be a debate about how much certain things are, and so so. It probably probably really enforces the reinforces the idea of these as thinking tools versus pretending that you can really come up with a a number that you will f follow uh, unerringly for regula regulations. All right. Um, looking at the clock, I'm going to go to Rod, Les, and then Rona. Uh, and we'll see where that leaves us, but I'm guessing, Rona, you're going to probably have our last word. <laughs> so um, thank you both. That was a terrific presentation, and thank you, Carrie and Jeremy, because you covered a lot of the territory that I was interested in talking about. I have a couple of points of clarification and then a concern, and maybe I'll even get to a question. But um, So my first point of clarification was that uh, Laura, I think you said the entire Gulf. Does that include um, the eastern planning area, or are you assuming that the eastern planning area is going to remain um, subject to monitorium? Uh, when I said the entire Gulf, what... In, put put a little more context to where I said it. You, I, 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 I thought you said that you it, we you were, we did a programmatic approach within the call area. I okay. don't. I, I did not the, mean to imply if I said the entire okay. Gulf of Mexico. No, we are we are not actively looking in the moratorium area, even okay. though it's my understanding the moratorium is not on. Uh, on renewable energy, right. but we yeah. we are not actively looking in that part of the okay. No, we are not. And I don't know how much you want to say about Galveston 1 and 2, but can you tell us a little bit about the motivations of the folks that were um, not, that didn't apply or didn't bid on the leases? and then, yeah. But then afterwards they came in, the same folks came in? Um, or the I, I couldn't speak to their motivations. Uh, there were a lot of things in play at that they time. They wanted to purchase the lease. Yeah. Um, 
for for the people that didn't show up that we were expecting to show up, because quite honestly, there were some larger companies that didn't show up and we expected them. But there was a convergence of many factors. There was a there was a sale in Europe. I believe it's the German sale that happened right before ours that involved some of the the people we expected to show up. There was that sale. There were these uh, economic conditions. The inflation is is hammering everyone. Uh, it was, uh, I would attribute it to bad timing. It was just bad timing. I don't think, uh, another thing, and, and I did hear this, this is fact from, from someone that didn't show up. And it, it makes no logical sense when, when I say this, but they said it. Uh, we didn't we didn't show up because we didn't think it would go for a, a low bid. So if you really wanted that, why wouldn't you have just gone and 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 put your low bid in and 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 roll the dice? But they're regretting it now that they didn't show up because they would have. But but anyway, I the motivations I don't I don't really know. Right. And then me coming in late in the game and watching this and getting introduced to everything the team had done. And then hearing some of those same comments and then originally starting in the Gulf, it's not a good analogy, but this was sort of kicking the hornet's nest because this was the first wind sail in the Gulf of Mexico, the heart of oil and gas uh, areas for, for the world in offshore. Um, it was new. And I can see that people were wondering, are you really going to do this? And then immediately thereafter, I mean, it was 24 hours. People called and said, you didn't sell the lease. Can I buy it? Mm -hmm. And then the comments about if we knew they were going to go so cheap, we would have bought it. And the group that came in just last week, um, they were very familiar with the Texas politics and said, ah, we're not worried about that. Uh, we have a plan and we want to be, you know, um, we want to go through the process of being qualified to bid. And if we have to have competition, bring it on. So it was, it, it's something new and it was the shiny new penny. Now everybody wants one. So it was a lot of dynamics, part of the culture. I actually just wanted to, on, Rod, on your question about uh, the Eastern and Central Greg Gulf, uh, uh, and I had to Google this again to remind myself, of, but the uh, President Trump uh, with you know withdrew an area, but it was, that was reversed by the Inflation Reduction Act. So the, so uh, there's not a, a legislative bar, uh, I believe, on the eastern and and any portions of the central Gulf that that doesn't suggest that they should be leased necessarily. That's the process we have. Okay. Um, I don't want to take up too much time. So my my concern was about horse trading. Um, and horse trading includes both rules, as Bill pointed out, and then, unspoken values yeah. or assumptions and there's a question i had about that how do you keep One track second. i'm so sorry we have somebody on the line that's not muted if we could have uh everybody mute themselves thank you <laughs> yeah uh, i know that's uh, happened twice <laughs> I was using that term because we sort of know what it means, um, the horse trading thing. It's just a term because you can visualize what that is. Uh, and it's not like poker where you're going to raise one and do the other. But the discussions were, OK, this is an area that has great potential for a conventional energy. It's overlapping a wind area. Well, what areas are also nearby that are great for conventional energy, but maybe not for wind? And then where does the sand fit in there? And so that's when I get my folks together that actually have the expertise in conventional energy, renewable energy, sand, and the leasing and where the pipelines are to actually work out what is the best interest of the country, uh, including the, the fishermen and the shrimpers and stuff. And so, yes, it's sort of a qualitative decision, but you also have to look to the future. And if you have an area that has got minimal use in terms of conventional resources, the sand resources are better to the east and you've got good wind here and the shrimpers say you can have that area if you cut out these blocks. Okay, there you go. We have an area for wind. Uh, the shrimp industry is not impacted. They're acceptable to that. There's a nearby area with conventional energy. Uh, oh, what's about a carbon sequestration? 
So that ends into the table. So all of that is going on. Um, it's a fascinating discussion to watch this. Um, I, I think what I was um, also trying to get at is tracking that horse trading yes. and being transparent with the horse trading, because then it, it's an important process, but it also needs to be um, documented and understood what was happening, right? During Good horse point. Trading. And, I, and I think I'll defer on my last question because I want other people to have a chance, but it's about data and I'm going to I'll ask you afterwards. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Rod. Les and then Rona. Yeah, thanks, guys. Um, Jim, I'm like totally aboard on all of this. And getting people to get uptake to embrace the static overlay models is one thing. And then doing it with uh, appropriate levels of engagement is a big thing. But I think sometimes the biggest thing is how are we going to incorporate change over time into this platform? And that's the project that Bill was referring to um, that I'm co-lead on. And I just want to suggest that instead of working totally independently, it would be good to have a huddle, kind of a bone huddle, about ways of dealing with change in our models that are most transparent and take advantage of the science at our disposal. Well said, extremely well said. And that hit another uh, neuron with me about engagement. One thing I learned working in Alaska, and I think we may see a little bit in the Gulf, not too much yet, but there is a such thing as over-engagement or meeting burnout. And so we go back to our people we've engaged with, partner, I mean, tribes don't like to be called um, stakeholders, they're partners. Uh, people get upset when you call industry a partner. We try to engage with everybody. We got an open door policy. We're the, we, tried, we are the honest broker. Um, we're not Burger King. We can't keep everybody happy. But, you know, we are always available to talk to. But it was very common on the North Slope of Alaska to have meeting fatigue. And people will say, how many times do we have to tell you the same thing? It's like when we went back with these new wind energy areas to like the Shrimping Alliance, we sat down with them very informally and said, well, we had the, the lease sale. They thanked us for listening. Well, what would you suggest if for a next step? They sort of pointed at the areas we just looked at and said, you know, those might work if you take that block out and that block out. So it was a continuation. We're not skipping anything. We're continuing the engagement, building on what we already have done, but knowing it is going to change. And those four areas that we added, that's not the end of the game. There are several dozens, if not hundreds of meetings that will take place between now and the next lease sale, if we have it, where folks will say, modify that. Like the Galveston one was basically cut in half. Uh, as a result of Im input, you know, by the Coast Guard and lightering areas and the shrimpers. What have I missed? Thanks. Rona? Um, so, you know, Carrie talked about getting into the weeds, and I hope this isn't getting too far into the weeds, but um, I think I can I build it back out to a bigger picture issue. So I, I pulled up that uh, report that um, got put in the chat, the link was put in the chat to the siting area analysis. And I'm looking at the uh, social and economic vulnerability map, uh, which is on page 64 or 84. God, I can't see anything. 84 on page 84. Um, and so uh, a question is, how do the terrestrial um, social and economic vulnerability data play into the siting analysis? Uh, and the question is sort of sparked by the fact that as I look at this and I look at areas that I'm familiar with, and particularly in the sort of Terrebonne uh, Parish area, um, areas where the uh, the social vulnerability index is shown as being uh, moderate, uh, where I know that these are areas of very high vulnerability where people like the Grand Caillou Dulac um, tribe live, the Punisham people, uh, communities that are outside the Morganza to the Gulf um, uh, structure system uh, and where household incomes are measured in the thousands, not the tens of thousands. Uh, so, um, so I query the uh, accuracy of the data in the areas that I know, which makes me worry about the accuracy in other places. And so the bigger picture thing, other than how these 
these particular this particular data set factors into the offshore analysis is how do you account for or check for uh, validity of data, errors in data, and in an area that's very dynamic, both environmentally and socially, how do you modify the model as you bring new data on board and account for these changes? And that's kind of a lot, but. <laughs> well, as you could probably expect, I'm a little more high level than that, but I would be happy to reach out and, and open that discussion with our people that did that. I and. Yeah, we, let's talk. Let's talk offline. Fantastic. I think um, with that, I will thank you, Jim, and thank you, Laura, very much for your presentations and for this discussion. Uh, I know that the issue of um, multiple uses in our marine space and the uh, the decisions that you all are going to be faced with, both in the Gulf of Mexico, but also elsewhere within um, BOEMS regions, uh, has been something of you know, keen interest to this committee. So appreciate your time. Uh, we will break for lunch. We will reconvene at one o'clock. Um, at that time, we're gonna hear a little bit about uh, what's being done in on these topics elsewhere in the world. Um, and we will look forward to hearing uh, from John Underhill and Michaela Freeman and, and folks from her team at PNNL uh, when we return. So with that, again, um, committee members, you all have lunch across the hall. Same room as yesterday. Same room as yesterday. Um, and those that are joining us, uh, please feel free to avail yourself of some of the great lunch options around here. All right, good afternoon. For those on the line, we'll get uh, moving momentarily. We're just waiting for, I think, maybe a couple more people to come uh, return to their seats and get settled, and then we will get underway. And while we're waiting, um, I just want to touch base with um, Dr. Underhill, who I see on the line, and uh, Michaela Freeman as well. I see you both have joined us. Um, I just wanted to check and make sure you're both ready and um, not needing anything from us before we get underway. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. But can we just check that first of all? You are coming through loud and clear. Very um, good job. Thank you. Um, would you like me to just share my screen for the presentation now and just check that that works? Uh, sure. Yeah, that would be great. We can go ahead and double check that while we're getting settled. Yep, we can see your screen. Uh, it is not currently in presentation mode, but yep, that looks perfect. Yeah, I think there's just a delay on um, transmission, but hopefully it's there now. It is. It looks great. Thank you so much. And Michaela, any, uh, I think we have a copy of your slides, but were you hoping to share your own screen? Yes. First of all, can you hear me okay? We can. We can hear you well. Thank you. Wonderful. Yes, I did make a few updates based on conversations this morning. So um, I'd be happy to share my slides. Um, would it be okay if I just check that those are working okay? Yep, absolutely. So John, I'll just ask you to go ahead and stop sharing and we'll let Michaela do that as well. All right. Let me know when you can see that and yep. all right. 
And then are you seeing the presentation mode or my notes? We're seeing the notes screen. All right, let me switch that. How's that? That looks great. Thank All you right. so much. Wonderful, so, thank you. Absolutely, we'll go ahead and get started now. I think everybody that we we're expecting is back in the room. Um, and so if you were not with us this morning, um, welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, just wanna quickly repeat some of the housekeeping items. We will use mics in the room uh, to connect to the audio. If we're in the room, we'll use our tent cards to uh, indicate that we'd like to speak. If you're online, I just ask that you remain muted uh, until or unless you're asked to uh, called upon to speak. And if you'd like to speak, please use the uh, raise hand feature within Zoom and we'll uh, incorporate you into the queue that way. Um, and for our speakers, uh, we did a quick round of introductions this morning for the committee. Um, and then we've just been asking speakers to please introduce themselves uh, before they get um, underway. So we'll do that again. And I think Michaela, I had you on the agenda first, if you're comfortable jumping in. And I, I recall that you may have some um, colleagues on the line with us as well. They are welcome to introduce themselves and jump in um, if and as uh, you'd like during your presentation um, or in the conversation afterwards. So um, I will turn it over to you first. Um, and again, if you and your colleagues would like to introduce themselves, they're welcome to also. Sounds great. I will let uh, maybe Andrea and Lizelle introduce themselves while I am getting my PowerPoint presentation up. Hi. Uh, sure. I'm trying to, my video doesn't work. Um, hi, Andrea Copping with, there it is, look at that. Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. I'm actually in Hawaii right now, but usually Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in the US, uh, Seattle. And we've been working on environmental effects of marine energy and some offshore wind for a decade or more. So pleased to be here today. Thank you. And I'm Giselle Garavelli, so working with Andrea and Michaela um, on environmental effects of marine renewable energy. I'm at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Seattle. Um, nice to see you all today. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea and Lizelle. Just to check, you can see my slide in presentation mode and not my notes. Is that right? That's yes. right. Everything looks great. Wonderful. So um, I'm Michaela Freeman. I'm from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, or PNNL, um, and I'm based in California. And as Lizelle and Andrea mentioned, we're working on environmental effects of marine energy. But what I'm here to talk to you today about is marine spatial planning and marine renewable energy and some of the lessons learned from international contexts. Um, so I've been with PNNL for about seven years now working on this OAS environmental initiative for this whole time. I also work in other areas. I have a bit more of a policy social science background, um, working on offshore wind, uh, stakeholder engaged research, um, and co-location of aquaculture and marine energy. So at PNNL, we kind of dabble in a lot of different areas. Okay, so to start, I just want to introduce who OES Environmental is, where we're coming from, and the work that we do. Um, so OES and Environmental was established by the International Energy Agency Ocean Energy Systems in 2010, and the goal is really to examine those environmental effects of marine renewable energy to advance the industry responsibly. This is an international initiative with 16 member countries, but it's led by the U.S. Department of Energy Water Power Technologies Office, and it's implemented by our team at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. So one of the main resources that we produce is the State of the Science Report, which is on the right side of this slide, the last of which was published in 2020, and it includes a chapter on marine spatial planning for marine renewable energy, which is what I'm here to talk to you about today. Um, and I do wanna note that we are currently working on writing an update to this report. We do so every four years. And so the 2024 State of the Science Report will be published in September, 2024. So to start off, I know we've been talking a lot about offshore wind today in this uh, meeting, but I wanted to clarify what we mean for OES Environmental by Marine Renewable Energy or MRE. 
So when I say MRE, we're talking about an energy from waves, tides, ocean currents, river flow, and then temperature and salinity gradients. For those not familiar with the marine renewable energy industry, it's really in the early stages of development, deployment, and commercialization. Um, and I wanted to show some examples of these devices. They look quite different um, from a little bit similar maybe to wind turbines, but they are quite different. And there's also a very broad variety of what these devices can look like. So the top two up at the top are both different wave energy converters and the bottom two are different tidal turbines, the left being bottom mounted and the right being floating. So I do wanna note that our efforts don't include offshore wind, but that there are similarities between these industries that really allow for learning to be exchanged. However, especially looking at environmental effects, these are not identical. So caution does need to be taken when doing so. So for example, marine uh, renewable energy developments to date are mostly consisting of one device or small numbers of devices. So arrays of maybe four or so with only a small number that uh, extend beyond that, whereas, of course, that's much different with offshore wind farms with large numbers of devices are being deployed. So with that background, I wanted to give a little bit of um, where we focus our work. And so I briefly want to talk about OES Environmental's approach kind of as the basis for the information that you'll hear today. So as I mentioned, since 2010, we've been working uh, in the marine renewable energy community with researchers, developers, regulators, and advisors to really understand different perspectives in need and how best to increase information and understanding on environmental effects um, and address some of the barriers that the industry is facing. So one key challenge, of course, is uncertainty or lack of knowledge of environmental effects. And due to this uncertainty and also the fact that regulatory processes are generally not tailored for marine renewable energy, this has resulted in long timelines for permitting um, and then a lot of um, onerous data collection and monitoring requirements that are costly to undertake. So based on these conversations with the MRA community, we understand the approach that brings together different processes like marine spatial planning and adaptive management um, that have been used in many industries, as well as with tailored approaches like risk retirement, which is what our team has been developing. So uh, just super quick overview, risk retirement really aims to identify which potential environmental risks are well understood and can be considered retired so that they may not require data collection or monitoring at each new development. And instead we can focus study on those risks with greater uncertainty and need for research. And a key part of this process is really using data from previous marine renewable energy deployments, as well as analogous industries like oil and gas, offshore wind, to bring in learning and guide understanding. Uh, there's a lot more complexities to this process, so I've included a link here, and I think Lizelle will put the link in the chat to the page with that, but I do want to note that this doesn't um, come uh, ahead of any regulatory guidance, but is meant to be a guide for the industry. So using risk retirement in conjunction with marine spatial planning, adaptive management will help us get towards responsible permitting and development. And we do have a chapter in the 2024 State of the Science Report called Strategies to Aid uh, Consenting Processes for MRE that goes into more detail on these topics and includes a section on marine spatial planning specifically that's an update to what's in the 2020 report. Um, so for the rest of the time today, I will focus on marine spatial planning. And from sitting in on this meeting earlier today, sounds like this group is very familiar with marine spatial planning. So I'll skip over the background that I had and jump into the information that we've compiled. So as I mentioned, the 2020 State of the Science Report has a chapter on marine spatial planning for marine renewable energy. And our Ireland country representative, Anne Marie O'Hagan, conducted surveys of the different OES environmental nations. And so she was asking either our other OES environmental country representatives to take this survey or someone in that country with expertise. So all of the information I'm going to present is compiled from those surveys. 
Um, the survey asked questions such as approaches used for marine spatial planning, how marine renewable energy policies link to marine spatial planning, um, how scientific information informs the process, how conflicts are managed. There's a lot of information there. I'm only going to kind of pull out a small subset of that information. So I do encourage you um, to go to the link that we'll put in the chat on the State of the Science chapter. Um, and everything's kind of in nice tables by country. Um, so the following slides, as I mentioned, summarize some of the information uh, from the 2020 State of the Science report, a few updates from what we're writing for the 2024 report, and again, is really limited just due to time, and so I'm trying to pull out some high-level information I think this group uh, will be interested in. So I know this is a lot of information. My next three slides have tables uh, condensed from that 2020 report. I don't expect you to read all of this and I will not be reading through all of it. Um, but I wanted to go through a few um, key examples that highlight MSP approaches taken and how different countries manage conflict. So to start all the countries in this table are EU countries where there's been a basis um, for MSP and law since 2014 as adopted by the MSP directive. And this required coastal member states to have maritime spatial plans by 2021. This dictates a lot of what European countries do. Um, and I should note that some EU countries um, had MSP in place prior to this, but for those that didn't, it created a pathway for plan development. So two examples that I wanted to mention are from France and Spain, and they showcase the spectrum of approaches used. So in both countries, they take a more regional approach. So as of 2022, France has plans developed for four different areas, where as of February 2023, Spain also had adopted plans for five different areas. So again, taking that more regional area-based approach. The way that these two differ is really in their management of potential conflicts. And I've, again, tried to bold the information that I think is most relevant for this group. Um, so Spain mainly addresses this on a case-by-case -case basis rather than through their marine spatial plan. Whereas France takes a very different approach and has targeted early consultation with marine users and activities through their marine spatial planning process. And they aim to reduce and manage those potential conflicts through mapping of existing uses. Um, and specific to marine renewable energy, uh, France also has stakeholders from different sectors working together on a regional approach to marine, rene marine renewable energy development specifically as well. Um, so the next thing I want to go to is the UK. And again, this table has countries from the UK. And I wanted to pull this out because uh, the UK is where we're seeing a lot of the marine renewable energy development to date. A lot of progress has been made here. Um, so for example, there's an important wave and tidal energy test site in Scotland that's been running for years and testing many different devices. And then in Wales, um, we've had a lot of conversations with the regulators there actually, and they're particularly interested in moving the industry forward and processes like risk retirement that can help manage um, the you know, environmental impacts responsibly, but still help get deployments in their areas. So in the UK, marine spatial planning has been in place since 2010, and they have a specific policy framework for plan preparation and decision making. And again, I'll pull out two examples. In Scotland, the National Marine Planning System identifies conflicts and addresses and reduces these before they arise, so really taking a proactive approach. Um, currently, they focus on communication with stakeholders, engaging different sectors throughout planning, assuring voices are heard, and incorporating input all to try and reduce conflict. Um, and they are, they do have marine planning partnerships, only two out of several are planned so far, so this is just their current approach that they're using. Uh, the Welsh National Marine Plan um, was published in 2019, and it encourages conflict reduction measures like co-location of activities and implementation. Sorry, it has uh, implemented guidance uh, released in 2020 that includes additional information to go along with their plan, uh, including ways to manage conflicts and make decisions. Um, and both of these countries call out marine renewable energy specifically in their plans, um, as well as offshore wind. So I've kind of highlighted these uh, in these boxes as well. Scotland noting that it's a specific sector, but with no specific targets, which for moving the industry forward using marine spatial plan, that's really important to include. 
um, whereas Wales notes marine renewable energy as a priority sector to develop over the next five to 10 years. So my last table with lots of information is all of our other OES environmental countries that I've pulled together. Um, again, a lot of information, um, and I will be sharing these slides with you all later. So this information will be available to you. And then again, it is all stems from that 2020 State of the Science report. Um, but I wanted to pull out Japan as an example here. So there's no specific MSP basis in Japan. Um, it's generally noted in their ocean policy documents, but they don't currently have it. Um, and so I wanted to call out that stakeholder consultation here is really noted as key to minimize conflict and also to zone marine activities. Um, I wanna note this as one of the few countries where they specifically call out zoning of different areas. Um, and also of note that in Japan, coexistence with fishing is the most important issue, and therefore there's a lot of engagement with the fishing industry. Uh, and they also note that there's specific areas and activities to be avoided uh, when you're planning things like marine renewable energy development. Um, and so unlike some other countries, they have a really prescribed approach and things to avoid and fishing being that kind of priority existing use. So for the next two slides, I want to move towards some examples of possible synergies and uh, managing conflicts. So this table here shows compatible in green, incompatible in red, and possibly compatible in yellow, as identified in the Portuguese Marine Spatial Plan. And this figure is theoretical, but it does represent how we can think about understanding the complexity of interactions around marine sectors and identify synergies between them. So for example, um, tourism and leisure on the, I guess if you're looking at the bottom left, the third from the uh, bottom has several synergies with aquaculture, with sunken ships, with artificial reefs that should be considered. Whereas mining, which is kind of uh, towards the top of the table, may be much more limited in its compatibility with other sectors. And another thread that I wanted to mention is how marine spatial planning is increasingly being used to achieve sustainable development and growth of blue economies, including facilita facilitating synergistic activities. I know this was talked a little bit about in the discussion in the last section. Um, and so I've highlighted two examples. The first is co-location. For us, what we talk a lot about is powering at sea uses with marine renewable energy. So this can include ocean observation systems, aquaculture, even oil and gas platforms to provide power to uses that already exist at sea. The example shown here on the right is from aquaculture and wave energy um, in Scotland where there was a demonstration project. So the um, salmon net pens already existed. They have one net pen that lays fallow, uh, just as terms of like what's most productive for the farm. And they were able to put a marine energy device within that net pen and provide power for 18 months for the aquaculture operation. So no additional permitting was needed, nothing else, but was a really great example of this um, co-location of uses. Um, I heard you all talk a lot about working with Noah Enkos and James Morris, and I do want to note that uh, Liesel and myself have been working, um, kind of coordinating with that team. We're working on a project to look at co-location of aquaculture and wave energy in Puerto Rico and doing a suitability analysis. And so we've uh, coordinated with them to try and make our methods similar. Um, so if anyone's interested, I'm always happy to talk about that as well. Uh, and the second example I wanted to pull out here is multi-use planning for new opportunities. So I wanted to call out the multi-use in European seas or MUSES action plan that focuses on nine multi-use combination. I have a little bit of one of their graphics on the right here so you can see some of those uh, multi-use combinations that they're uh, considering in this plan. And through this, they're really providing recommendations um, that aren't focused on the technical challenge, but rather the other challenges that may arise to proactively aid multi-use planning uh, and address things such as stakeholder coordination, regulation, financing, and other things. So to wrap up my presentation, I just wanted to end with some overarching findings from the 2024 State of the Science chapter. So as shown in all the tables here, there's um, marine spatial planning really varies by country and sometimes even within country. And there are many different approaches being taken to manage the ever-growing use of the ocean. 
Several challenges really remain specifically for using marine spatial planning for marine renewable energy, such as lack of clear objectives within marine spatial planning. There's remaining knowledge gaps on environmental, economic, and social effects of marine renewable energy that are needed to be incorporated, um, that are needed to incorporate marine renewable energy into marine spatial planning. There's additional data needed to inform marine spatial planning development and also have associated tools that aid implementation. And then adequate resources to carry out marine spatial planning. This is something we heard a lot in the survey, whether it was lacking financial resources or human resources. Some recommendations from the chapter include marine spatial planning being a participatory process that actively involves stakeholders, which I think we're all well aware of the need for that, um, as well as identifying how needs change based on scale and purpose for marine renewable energy development. So for marine renewable energy development, are we looking at commercial scale developments, multiple devices, potentially larger arrays, or are we looking at a smaller scale development for something such as remote or off-grid communities that has a much different purpose and a much different scale? And how do we address these differences within the planning process? And then last, incorporating marine renewable energy into marine spatial planning processes um, includes the need to develop practical measures through marine spatial planning that can aid permitting and help the industry move forward. So with that, I just wanna say thank you very much for having me and my team present here today. Um, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. And as I mentioned, I will share my slides with you all. Um, and I did provide some references so that you can uh, look at some of those sources I cited. Thank yeah, you. Thank, thank you, Michaela, very much. I think we might have time maybe to take one or two quick clarifying questions. Uh, and then we'll move to John's presentation before opening for a broader Q&A. Scott? Uh, thank you for a great presentation and uh, really enjoyed also the uh, report you all put together. Uh, uh, I'm kind of curious whether or not uh, in in the examples you looked at, um, you, you found any that uh, country that it actually or, or sector within uh, MRE where they've actually put together a uh, a framework for doing or criteria for doing trade-off analysis between making tough choices between different sorts of marine spatial uh, uh, programs. Uh, you mentioned, for example, in Japan, they kind of had ranked, it sounded like they ranked fisheries above everything else. Mm -hmm. Other places that it sounded like they just kind of handled it on a case by case de-conflict basis, Does it, did anybody have a, a rubric for uh, kind of more systematically handling the trade-offs? Yeah, from the survey information that we got, there wasn't any information on specific trade-off analyses. So that information wasn't included anywhere. It's possible that it could exist, but from the information that we gathered from our country representatives, um, there wasn't anything of that sort. As I mentioned, I think it was in Wales, there is implementation guidance that uh, they noted would include kind of conflict resolution process. I was looking through it a bit more and I was hoping that it would have more instructions on how to do that. And I thought that a lot of these processes kind of take a more general approach as you were kind of mentioning and figuring out as they go. Is, is trade-off analysis a part of your, uh, your next addition update is that is that going to be included in the September 24 report that's a great question it currently is not I will say that chapter is drafted but we are going through a review um, we'll actually have that report released in May for public comment so I encourage if anyone um, would like to review it and provide us comment it'll be open for I think two months then before it's released in September um, but that is a great point and I will definitely look at that more as I'm revising it and uh, see what see what we can include I will note that marine spatial planning is not a focus of the work we do on OES Environmental, um, was really included from this survey in the 2020 report, and we would be remiss not to mention it in the 2024 report as we look at strategies to aid consenting. So it's really more of an update of that 2020 report right now. Um, so it is a smaller section, but it's a really great point to um, think about mentioning the trade-off analysis because I think that's an important discussion. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michaela. And thank you to your team. I look forward to having a bit more discussion after we hear from John, but I will turn to, to John for his presentation, for his introduction and presentation now. Thanks very much. I'll, I'll just try and um, share the uh, presentation. Uh, see if I can find it there. Just bear with me a second, because I think the uh, something's happened with the presentation. Let's just make sure it's open. Uh, what happened there? Right. So I should be able to share this with you now. And again, it will come in in one form, and I'll just change that so that you can put it in presentation mode. It's just a little complicated here with uh, how it's set up on my screen. Just bear with me a second. Sorry about this. Can you, I might have to present it in this form, actually, unless I can. I think change. in the left corner, um, near where it says auto save, there's, there is the. Um, uh, to the right of that, it looks like there is the presentation link. Uh, it's uh, got the little play button. Please. Yeah, I can't see that because it's sort of covered by something else on my screen. Uh, hang on a second. Let's just see. Um, you may be able to right click on the presentation as well to um, put it into. Hmm, I can see that. Uh, sorry, guys, I'll, I'll try and close that up. I think I can't yeah. understand why. Mine too. This is slideshow. Yeah, if you go to slideshow at the top. Uh, yeah, on your above your toolbar, uh, you'll see slide animation, slideshow, record, review, and you if you use the slideshow there. Um, yep, yep, from the beginning. There we Yay. go. Perfect. That looks great. Yeah. yeah. Apologies about that. I hope you can bear with me. I'll uh, rattle through this. Um, thank you very much for. The invitation to present. Um, uh, I thought it was a great question, actually, from Chris, Chris Cameron just now, um, because I'm going to show you that it's a complete uh, mess in the UK. Um, the competition for offshore real estate and marine spatial planning uh, is in a very uh, confused position, and there is a lot of overlap and conflict. And to be honest, Chris, there is no overarching if you like, United Kingdom net zero PLC um, regulator that acts as an independent arbiter uh, when conflict occurs. So it, it's a bit like the Wild West and, a, and, a, and a, um, uh, a bit of a free range at the moment. So I'll, I'll talk you through some of this with specific examples. Um, I could introduce myself first that I'm the University Director for Energy Transition at Aberdeen University and Aberdeen has had as a city a rich heritage as an energy hub, particularly in oil and gas, and is pivoting towards the energy transition and renewable technologies. And we're seeing um, an upsurge in interest in carbon storage, offshore wind, uh, potential hydrogen sites, and conflicts arising with a number of, of stakeholders as a result, including those in the environmental. Um, and fishing, sand and, uh, sand and gravel aggregates, uh, and the Ministry of Defence and other, other stakeholders as well. Um, I'm going to talk, first of all, about the, the, the driver for some of the offshore real estate conflict. Um, in the UK, we have a legally binding commitment to meet net zero targets by 2050. And the uh, main industrial... Uh, clusters, as you can see perhaps on the slide on the right, are in eastern and northeastern England, Humberside and Teesside, places like South Wales, Merseyside, and there's Grangemouth in Scotland to the north. In the red letters, 
I'm sorry to interrupt. Are you able to just um, move the, there's a little black welcome screen that's covering part of the map. Yeah, I, it's uh, not moving for me. That's the problem. I, I didn't, I hope you wouldn't be able to see that, but. Um, yeah, there we go. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it's really odd. It's it's it's, it's got a, a timing thing on it. Um, yeah, don't know how to get rid of that. No worries. We'll we'll make sure to provide your slides. So anything in that corner, yes. we'll make we get. Thank yeah. you so much. So, um, what's hidden behind here is is the southeast um, uh, England. But you can see where the main industrial clusters are and they face the red areas that i put in eisb and sns now what are they they are the east irish sea basin and southern north sea basins offshore um, that historically have been areas where oil and gas has been produced from and uh, so now that we're coming to the end of the life of those two basins they're being potentially looked at for carbon storage. And our regulator, the North Sea Transition Authority, have indicated that we need around 78 gigatons of carbon storage in order to meet our net zero targets. Now, they have identified um, stores between a minimum of 47 and a maximum of 172 that might be required might be used in the subsurface now that uh, has led to a study of these areas in the green box and the orange box the east irish sea and the southern north sea where a number of carbon dioxide appraisal and storage licenses and a, a, a new competitive licensing round has been undertaken but as i've said here on the slide it's one thing to have the ambition to store carbon in the subsurface quite another to turn it into reality we've been fortunate to be able to use uh, a data sets in the public domain as well as commercial data sets to put together blanket coverage of the southern north sea in the red color are the gas fields in the southern north sea and the pipelines that exist and in the green and the olive brown colors are the coverage of what's called 3d seismic data which allows us to get a body scan of the subsurface beneath. Uh, we've had availability of 2000 wells and been able to integrate well logs, check shots, cores, and gas composition reports. What that enables us to do is to analyze the subsurface and characterize it forensically for the reservoir, the seal, the trap, the overburden, and also non-geological risks like legacy well integrity, co-location, and regulatory considerations. And what we've done is to look at each of these parameters and in a traffic light system, green for go, yellow or amber for pause and red for stop based on the geological criteria. And then stack those parameters above each other to get a combined common risk segment map to show the best areas for carbon storage, the most advantaged areas. And this diagram shows the combined mapping and the green area is shown on the right hand side offshore of eastern england so this is just based on the geological criteria how you identify where the best sites are and in red those areas you wouldn't seek to do carbon storage independently wind energy has been uh, promoted in the uk and currently has 14 gigawatts of offshore uh, wind fully commissioned. This is four times what we had just a decade ago and equates the second largest offshore wind market in the world. The British Energy Security Strategy, published um, something like 18 months ago now, set the ambition to go up to 50 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030, including from five from what's called Innovative Floating Technologies Associated with Oil and Gas, INTOG. Now, if we are going to monitor the subsurface, which is um, a legal prerequisite in European law for carbon storage, 
there are a number of techniques can be deployed, but normally it is seismic data of taking a boat with um, a wide streamer set of sound recordings um, in, in, in being towed in the offshore. Now, you cannot take a large boat with uh, streamers through fixed wind turbines. It's a bit like trying to go through a ski slalom. And this example here is the first example that we've got in the North Sea where conflicts have arisen. Uh, this is a map. So um, the warm colors are where things are higher and the cooler colors are where something is lower. And this yellow uh, surface around here is what defines the endurance structure. The first uh, carbon storage site identified in the North Sea, which is progressing under the Track 1 cluster scheme with the UK government support. The red area here is the overlap of um, the largest offshore wind farm proposed called Hornsey 4, which has a different joint venture operator. Hornsey 4 is operated by Orsted. The endurance carbon storage structure is operated by JV, led by BP. Uh, both of these were going along blissfully unaware that they were going to effectively um, cause conflict offshore because in order to measure, monitor and verify the carbon footprint in endurance, you need to take that boat with the, the, the streamers behind it and you can't do so over part of the structure or over a neighbouring structure to the southeast where that's outside the carbon store. But of course, if you put carbon in carbon dioxide into the ground, into this structure, you force something out, water in this case, water that may contain contaminants, which would come to the seabed here, out with the license, but also covered by, partially by the wind farm. This, is, this has been a long running dispute that has just been settled um, commercially, by BP effectively throwing money at the, uh, at the problem in order that all said don't build, build their wind farm over the structure. But this dispute went to the Under Secretary of State um, in government to make a decision uh, because there is no, uh, at the moment, independent arbiter or regulator to, to um, inform the discussion and make the final decision. This is what the um, a, a, a typical streamer setup looks like with a boat. You can, can perhaps see how um, large on the basis of, of the boat showing here. This is a kilometer wide. And of course, you also need um, evacuation routes if there are any issues in the subsurface with cables or pipelines and so on. So there has to be um, a, a, a balance between the size and the design of wind farms and the subsurface uh, beneath. This is another example of the unintended consequences to building a wind farm. In um, the large red box is a 500 square kilometer proposed wind farm called Outer Dowsing. Um, here within the red box are uh, subsurface depleted fields, which are um, potential carbon storage sites. There is a way to take a cookie cutter to this and to ensure that the 500 square kilometer wind farm which has to reduce by law to 300 square kilometers, could accommodate the carbon storage sites. However, the wind farm operator finds that the, having carbon storage sites underneath is an inconvenient reality, which might impact them in terms of insurance, indemnity, and of course, a different uh, ownership where they have no control on the subsurface if there is any carbon storage leakage. So the competition for offshore real estate is leading to this area being mighty crowded. And when you add the common risk segment uh, layers together, as I, as I showed before, and take into account other factors like wind farms, you suddenly see there's a lot less space available for carbon storage. And this is before we weave in the other multiple stakeholders in, in the area and is actually a now a threat to the UK meeting its net zero emission targets. Unless there is primacy given to specific technologies in different areas, we may find the overlap actually rules out the win-win solution between these different areas.
This work was published in August of this year. I can provide the, um, the public full publication for you to uh, interrogate, but um, has led to the North Sea Transition Authority and the Crown Estate and Crown Estate Scotland now seeking to, to engage with further stakeholders. This is the situation in Scotland where, again, there, there are carbon stores, there are wind farms, there are fishing areas and environmental protection zones. And the question is whether wind and carbon storage and the other stakeholders can um, happily cohabit offshore or co-locate. It gets more and more complex the more you look at this. This diagram um, starts to weave in all the various elements for each of the main sedimentary basins that are currently being looked at um, for wind power as well as carbon storage and other uses like hydrogen and gravel extraction, um, all incorporated in, into this area, let alone then um, fishing on top. And I'll, I'll finish off with um, where we are in Scotland, because um, we have had what's called a National Marine Plan 1. Um, earlier this year, there was a forum here in Edinburgh, which kicked off National Marine Plan 2 which was basically a tacit admission by the Scottish Government that National Marine Plan 1 had failed, and it had failed because um, the fishing communities are not being consulted, and they, the Scottish Government had designated large areas of the offshore for environmental protection zones, uh, which were actually overlapping with uh, Scottish fishing grounds, uh, which led to a, a, a sort of political standoff and uh, the lady here shown in the picture, Mary M McCallan, is the current Just Transition Secretary. And in kicking off National Marine Plan 2, basically said, um, we're not going to make the same mistakes as we did last time. However, what was interesting was in the room, there were um, over 100 people. And I, I actually didn't recognize um, very many, if any. And, and the whole room was full of the fishing communities who basically said, this is going to be an interesting day for you, John, because we're actually going to go to Parliament, we're going to protest, um, because fishing has not had the, the voice and our communities are under threat. Um, they did indeed do that, and Mary McCullen, who is the Scottish National Party, um, uh, represents the Scottish National Party, in coalition government with the Greens, the Green Party, took the brave political decision to put on pause all the environmental protection zones and have... The, the fishing communities consulted for National Marine Plan 2. The reason I said that um, I didn't recognize many people in the room because I was surprised that offshore wind, carbon storage, and oil and gas uh, were not represented. So uh, I'm a little concerned that National Marine Plan 2 might include fisheries, but other stakeholders are left out. So what I hope I've been able to do here, um, and I realize it's, it's a confused picture that I'm portraying because that is the reality that we find in the UK at the moment. There are questions that are arising about whether carbon storage and wind farms can be co-located. It depends on really early engagement and spatial planning between the different uh, operators. The use of technologies that enable the measurement, monitoring and verification of the carbon dioxide plume uh, so what we need in, in terms to be compliant with European regulation for carbon storage uh, dictates that you, you have to have at least 3D seismic data currently. Uh, other technologies may exist, but they're expensive, like ocean bottom nodes, 10 times the cost to do that, um, to be compatible with offshore wind. And that means the commercial model for CO2 makes it less attractive in those areas. We have to factor in other stakeholders, take a holistic view. So fisheries, sand and gravel aggregates, oil and gas, environmental protection zones. And I don't, at the moment, see that happening in a, in a, a, a holistic way. We're about to kick off a project called Codacate with, with the Crown Estate and Crown Estate Scotland to look at ways to um, find solutions and um, identify areas where co-location can take place or to give primacy in, in those areas to one specific technique um, without detriment to another technique, which would go elsewhere so that the UK can get back on track to meet its net zero pathway. I hope that's useful to you and be very happy to answer 
any questions you might have. And I apologise for that little black box that hopefully wasn't too distracting. It wasn't, John, and thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Very, very much appreciated. Um, we do have some time for Q&A, and we got started a few minutes late, so I'll let us run over by just a couple of minutes as well. I'm going to turn first to Scott, who can barely stand oh, can waiting. John, I can barely stand it. I'm so excited by your talk. This has exceeded my expectations. I'm very pleased. Um, you, I, I love. Well, it was only because you teed up that question before. So uh, I, I, uh, I, I've been telling my colleagues here. I went to the um, uh, AAPG SEG national meeting here in Houston not too long ago, and I talked to a lot of. Uh, subsurface folks from the North Sea uh, who, who worked on this very issue you've been talking about. And I, what I was basically told was it's uh, ill-advised to try to co-locate CCS and wind wind energy projects in the same place. It even becomes more of a challenge if you not, don't just require 3D seismic, but you want to have 4D seismic, time-lapse seismic, to monitor Correct. how the boom moves through time. Essentially, um, it's a deal killer. Uh, with, yeah. Now, that was their advice. And I've passed that on to my colleagues here. Um, but uh, you got to hear the, the discussion. Did you sit in the discussion this morning? Did you were able to No, I, I just joined now at five, uh, six o'clock my time, one o'clock yours. So, so, so one of the interesting things about the Gulf of Mexico, which is where the marine spatial conflicts uh, issue is pressing right now, is, is it has been identified as one of the potentially largest CCS reservoir mm -hmm. areas we have in the U.S., particularly in the offshore, uh, anywhere from 300 to 500 gigatons of, of potential capacity, most of which, though, is probably in uh, saline reservoirs, not necessarily mm -hmm. in depleted fields, where it looks like your focus is almost entirely on depleted fields. Is that... Um... Uh, I, yeah, so I, I may have given you that impression, Chris. Um, the reason I, I have done so is that in early stages, proof of concept is, is simply to go to reservoir seal pairs in defined traps, which are well characterized. But the bigger prize, of course, is saline aquifers in terms of capacity and volume. And people are looking that, at that as well. Um, but wind farms equally impact those areas. And okay. one thing I, I might add is that we have 8,000 wells in total in the North Sea. Many of them were completed 30 or 40 years ago. And when they were completed, yes, they were done um, in compliance to the regulations for plugging and abandoning a dry hole, a water bearing hole for oil and gas, but never with the thought that 40 years later, they might be used for a different purpose, the areas. Right. And so have they used the right cement or right. plugged and abandoned accordingly? Some of these things are straws to the seabed. Exactly. And so they're largely in the saline aquifers, the failed right. areas. So right. um, one rogue well in the wrong place can be a, um, a, a basic game changer and, and showstopper for carbon storage. So we, we're still trying to work through some of those issues for saline aquifers as well. And, and given the nature of the subsurface geology, some of the saline aquifers come to seabed. Yeah. So we are also concerned that they're open systems and um, there are, there's, a, there's a whole sort of load of, of issues about pressure management and so on as well. So at the moment, we're focusing on, if you like, the known knowns of the um, closures, the depleted fields, which are really well characterized. Thank you. So that was, uh, but it sounds it sounds like though that the that there um, the potential when one looks at co-locating in the same area, CCS. And wind, wind, major wind farms, particularly on the shelf where they would be closely spaced uh, uh, turbines, you've got a real challenge there to put them in the same. Un undoubtedly, same. yes, yes. And in fact, to go one stage further, Chris, the work that we were doing um, informs the national uh, regulator, that is the North Sea Transition Authority. They had. 41 nominations for the first CCS licensing round for carbon storage. Only 13 appeared in the licensing round itself that was offered. And of course, I was curious, what happened to the other 28? So I, I spoke to the NSDA and their, their chief executive officer, 
And he said, it's like this, John, we had to go uh, along the path of least resistance, that it had to be a successful licensing round and any conflict at all, any hurdle, we took out those nominations. So in other words, 41 became 13 because 28 were affected by wind farms. Yeah. Thank you very much. No, very, very. We would dearly love to see that paper too, by the way. With okay. You. Love to see that. Uh, thanks, John. Les? Yeah, John, that was wonderful. Um, this is probably a bridge too far, but has there been a lot of thinking about how climate change might rearrange the spatial trade-offs? Um, so, and what to do about it, yeah. Yeah, so let, let me take two, that in two parts. First of all, uh, I, there was a question earlier about trade-off analysis. Um, this is desperately needed in the UK. It doesn't exist at the moment. Mm -hmm. There are 26 regulators, and um, some of them are effectively uh, championing the technology that they're looking after. And then, of course, you've got people working in silos saying carbon storage is all, or I want to do hydrogen, or wind. they're not talking to each other. And sometimes that's even within the same company, I have found, having a, 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 a a partnership within the wind farm and the carbon store and not even knowing they're talking about the same geography. Um, there are other trade-offs, of course, as you sort of imply, Les, and one of my, my colleagues, um, uh, Beth Scott uh, Aberdeen, has been doing some fantastic work at looking at um, how uh, some of the wind farms are affecting ecology, uh, productivity in the North Sea, and of course also working in forward projection models for climate change and some of the um, effects on weather patterns and what that will mean in the future as well. And and it, it in terms of productivity and the food chain and, and into um, fisheries and the communities, uh, we, we are seeing things changing as a result of wind farms going in and the weight that they produce or local currents um, around the structures, uh, which, which are not really being factored in very uh, in, in terms of horizon scanning of what the, the consequences, the unintended consequences of doing this might be. I, I don't know if that helps you, Les, in, in terms of answering the question, but uh, there, there are positive and negative feedback loops to, to this. No, it helps a lot. Um, I'd be grateful to be connected with Beth Scott. Yeah, just send me your email. I'll be delighted to do that. I was involved with a, um, a workshop yesterday with uh, uh, an offshore wind operator called Maram Wind, where these um, discussions came up and Beth presented, and it was absolutely stunning what, what she's doing. Thanks. Thank you. I'll turn next to Lori. Hi, John, thank you very much. Um, I was reading this morning about uh, Porthos and it just being approved offshore Rotterdam. Mm -hmm. And it looks to me, and just like a, a, a quick look, that there are some of the Dutch wind farms that are really close to that as well, but maybe not overlapping? Or do you know what consideration was given by the, the Dutch regulators? Um, so because of the... Uh, conflict between Orsted's Hornsey wind farm and the endurance structure in the North Sea, uh, people became very aware of this conflict. And so things like Porthos, um, Green Sands in Denmark, Northern Lights in Norway uh, have managed to say effectively this primacy to carbon storage. That's a driver to um, capture, transport, and safely secure emissions. And having identified that site, they've given that, that primacy. Um, that's not always the case everywhere, particularly away from depleted fields where saline aquifers occur and so on. But at least in Porthos, there is the, um, the, the, the overlap is, is not there. Thanks. That's important. Thank you. I have a question going back to, um to Michaela's presentation uh, that I wanted to make sure I, I had an opportunity to ask. And that is, 
I thought it was really interesting, the methodology of relying on um, representatives for the survey process to understand what these um, pro what, what these marine spatial planning processes are like in each country. And I'm wondering um, how, how much you think that influences the uh, perception or the or the uh, impression that that your group gets on what those processes actually are, depending on who you're speaking with, um, and if there's in the update in 2024, uh, if you are relying on the same survey respondents or if there is a new mix of people and not just individuals, but perhaps as importantly or more importantly, represent representation within. Uh, within that group? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'll invite Andrea to step in as well since she was part of that process for the chapter. Um, but it's a great point. Obviously, the information that we'll get could vary depending on who that representative that filled out the survey. As I mentioned, marine spatial planning is not a focus of the work that we do. So we were trying to include the information in the best way possible to us. And this has been a method we've used for several of these ocean energy system tasks, where we use the different countries that are part of ocean energy, for our case, ocean energy environmental, our initiative, and ask the country representatives to find the expert in their country who can fill out the survey and provide us with the best available information. And that allowed us to get information from 16 different countries that otherwise we might not have that capacity to get. So certainly some trade-offs there. For the 2024 report, we are not conducting the survey again. Um, Andrea, correct me if I'm wrong, but we did it for both the 2016 report, which was published the year I started at PNNL, and then also for the 2020 report. And so we feel at this point that the survey isn't necessarily needed to be completed again. We're not really seeing a ton of movement on marine spatial planning specifically for marine renewable energy. And so we don't think that it would be quite uh, as useful as maybe it was in the past, but our team is going through updates and trying to find additional information. Uh, and we will be uh, running that by our current country representatives to help make sure that information is the most up to date. I think I answered all of your questions, but if I forgot something, let me know. So I was just going to add to that, that um, Michaela has it exactly right. There hasn't been enough movement to, to do this over again. It was like squeezing blood out of a rock to get what we got the previous times. Um, however, I do want to point out that the representatives of the 16 countries are tasked as the country's contribution to this because the U.S. pays for the rest of the cost but there is a uh, required participation by these other countries in lieu of cash um, that they are required to consult and get the correct information. So they're not sort of random people that we've said, oh, would you give us your best shot? So while we can't guarantee it's absolutely correct, we do a certain amount of checking. And Anne-Marie O'Hagan, who was the primary author of that chapter, this is her field. So um, the, uh, we felt that we had pretty good um, uh, you know, uh, basis for the information we have. But she, uh, Michaela's right, it's not going to be our focus for a while. Maybe by 2028, there'll have been enough movement, but the changes haven't been great. Yeah. And I'll yeah. note that the 2020 chapter has all the references for everything that I noted. I did pull those out today, otherwise, those tables would be unbearable to look at. So if you're curious about like what actually the regulations were, where we got that information, that's all referenced in the chapter. Excellent. I'm looking around the room um, and also online for any raised hands. I encourage to if our if our bone participants have any questions or thoughts or um, you know uh, encourage their participation as well. So we'll give. I this think Chris has put a note in the uh, chat box about is it fair to say that European regulators are giving primacy to CCS in depleted fields. Actually, I would say it's the other way around, Chris. Um, wind farms are us, um, in the sense that the movement towards clean energy, um, if you think about CCS, it's effectively waste disposal and doesn't necessarily have a commercial model or basis. In the US, the introduction of the um, 45Q made a huge difference where you suddenly had tax credits given and, and I used to come to the States and present on some of this stuff. Um, and to be very frank with you, uh, 
maybe it was partly my personality or something, but people used to run for the doors um, when I stood up to talk about the North Sea and carbon storage. And there was tumbleweeds going through the, the lecture theatre until about 2018-19. Um, and, and I had to be sort of encouraged to come across. I thought, is it really worth coming across to an empty hall again? And, and when I presented in 2019-2020 on this stuff, suddenly the halls were full and there was standing room only. And I thought to myself, what on earth has happened? Um, and it was the 45Q, the tax credit. Suddenly anyone and everybody wanted to know as much as possible about carbon storage from this random academic from Scotland. And um, it changed everything. And we do not have a 45Q in the UK, uh, but we do have, um, and, and because it's waste disposal, that means there isn't a commercial model. In Norway and in Denmark, they have built what's called Green Sands and Northern Lights. And if you've ever watched the film um, Field of Dreams, this is sort of Kev Kevin Cosner writ large. They have built it on the assumption that people will come. And I'm often asked, do people come? Well, yes. What's happened is that a petrochemical um, works in Belgium, in order to have legitimacy and meet its net zero targets, it's basically, uh, it's called INEOS, is the chemical company, have um, driven the Green Sand project in record time. So it's overtaken the UK. And Northern Lights in Norway has uh, cement factories coal mines in Poland and, and power stations in Germany, basically saying, how much um, do we need to pay you to take our emissions off our hands? Because it allows them to meet their ESG goals and then um, actually raise money and have a legitimacy to keep their power stations going. We don't we don't actually have that in the UK. So very long answer to you, Chris, but in I would actually say in the UK, wind has got primacy um, and it very nearly knocked out that endurance CCS site until BP threw money at it to come to a commercial arrangement so that there wouldn't be overlap. So, so I have a follow-up qu qu question for you. Actually, it's uh, maybe it's a comparison. In in the in the U.S., our friends here at BOEM have the uh, lucky uh, uh, responsibility to not only be responsible for uh, oil and gas in the uh, on the outer continental shelf of the U.S., but uh, also wind energy, and eventually here we're going to hear about CCS. I think they're going to have responsibility for that, and they've got only 2,500 pages of regulations for us to look at. So can't wait for that. But it sounds like they have the ability then to mm -hmm. uh, make the trade-off choices them set within within their own context. You don't have anything like that in the UK, it sounds like. You don't have that. No, it, 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 it's grown organically. So um, effectively, the subsurface is managed by the North Sea Transition Authority. So they look after oil and gas and carbon dioxide storage and now hydrogen as of um, about a month ago. But the seabed and the shallow subsurface, that's handled by the Crown Estate in England and Wales. But Crown Estate Scotland, across the border, uh, whereas the NSTA is, is national, um, the seabed is actually the, the, the different um, parts of the United Kingdom. Um, then you've got the, the like the sea column and environmental agencies, so the, the things like Opred, Marine Scotland, I, I could just go on and on. There are so many regulators. There is no overarching independent, if you like, UK net zero authority. And if, as you're suggesting, that does exist in the states in one body, then I think you're in a, in a far better position because then you've got effectively one single point um, of entry to make a decision. There are so many different regulators, so many different operators and methods that it, 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 it's a really complex matrix, and I really like the idea of this sort of trade-off analysis um, to try and move the dial, because we've got to get to solutions and quickly. And as some of you may know, that in uh, recent days and months, um, no, no uh, wind farm operator bid for any licenses in the North Sea in the most recent round. And most people are saying, oh, that, that's terrible. I'm actually thinking, thank goodness, it buys us a bit of time to get this right, because the more you put these things 
um, out there, then the less space you've got to do other things. And, and the, they're not necessarily being put in places which are have no other use. Thank you very much for that. I, I, I trust our friends from BOM heard that, particularly with re regard to the second round of uh, uh, decision on second round of leasing and wind leasing in the Gulf of Mexico. John, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. I think uh, you gave us a, a spectacular presentation and obviously there was a lot of interest in it. And uh, to Michaela and her team as well, very much appreciated. I think Michaela maybe had to hop off already, but um, really grateful for the time today, for the contributions to our thinking and to our um, meeting and discussion. We're running a, a few minutes behind, um, but we are on to the last item of our agenda for today. Uh, and I'm going to turn to Brad Blythe. Brad, thank you for your patience. Um, I know you you gave us a few teasers yesterday um, about this topic that you're going to be talking about, and uh, it has us all, uh, you know, on the edge of our seats waiting. Well, to you hear. know, it's it's uh, uh, it's not it's not everyone that can follow uh, a, a spectacular presentation, as I heard it just referred to, with uh, a presentation about bureaucratic minutia. Uh, okay. So I'm super excited and. Uh, it's all downhill from here. Well, we, we appreciate you joining us again today and uh, we will not spend any more time. Um, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Uh, so I, I apologize for not being there in uh, person. Uh, I love you all, but uh, in a shameless plug, my daughter is uh, the, the female lead in the show at Herndon High School uh, later this afternoon. And so I need to make sure I'm close and uh, ready to get over there and uh, help out with all the pre-show stuff and then be proud dad probably not crying in the uh in the auditorium so uh yeah so let's uh on a, a friday afternoon talk about uh bureaucratic minutiae and how bohm uh coordinates studies across different programs uh within the esp and outside of the esp uh, so i'm going to share my screen hopefully correctly and appropriately All right, can everybody see that? Yep, it just came up. All right, cool. Oh, go back. That looks down. great. Settle down, settle down. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm realizing that uh, there's a little bit of nuance to this, this conversation based on uh, the first couple of days we had this week at our retreat. Uh, out in Shepherdstown. Uh, we had our first environmental retreat in a couple of years. And that was really great. Uh, and one of the things we talked about was obviously studies coordination. Um, and one of the questions that uh, I know we've, we've talked about, we previewed a little bit yesterday, like Carrie said, was um, how do we coordinate studies across the agency, uh, specifically studies that may not be uh, conducted through the environmental studies program. Uh, to which my response is environmental studies outside of the ESP? No, uh, we don't want that. Uh, and th there's there's a reason for that. Uh, there have been issues in the past where environmental studies, and I'm putting that in, in quotation marks, were conducted outside of the ESP without knowledge of, of folks in, in headquarters, office of environmental programs, uh, and PES, the folks who manage the environmental studies program. Generally not a huge deal, potentially not a big deal, but one of the issues that you see when that happens is that uh, a lot of times in those cases, studies are managed by a single individual. You have one person who is taking that from idea to inception to final product, um, and that's really not enough eyes on on something uh, for, especially if we're going to be using that uh, for decision making processes. You know, BOEM is an applied science organization. We have uh, science informed decisions, right? Uh, we want to make sure that we're clear about what that means. Uh, mm -hmm. They're informed by science. Science doesn't always win the day, but it is a piece that goes into all of our decisions. Sometimes science does win. Sometimes environmental issues do take primacy. Sometimes 
economics, politics, whatever do as well. And that's fine. Uh, we just, you know, we need to make sure we're, we're honest about what is driving our decision-making process. Um, so we need to talk about two things. First, we need to all be on the same page when we're having this type of conversation about what is an environmental study. And we need to know what happens if a research need arises outside of the national studies list process, right? This is our nine month process ish, where we go from study profile, which is a one to two page outline. Of, so, what are the research needs? Basically, you know, what do we think we need? What kind of research do we think we need to get it? Uh, and when do we need it, Bob? Uh, all the way to a couple years later, you know, until, sorry, we're just like the NSL process, but nine months later. Uh, that final list of things we're actually going to fund in the next fiscal year gets signed by the director of the agency, whoever that may be at the time. Okay. So that's a long process. We are well aware that study needs come up outside of that process. Right. So how do we handle that? Um, I know we have a lot of new people, so I'm actually going to pause here and ask uh, the, the COSA folks, if it would be helpful for me to give sort of the elevator speech version of the National Studies List process. I think, yeah, you, I'm seeing some nods around the room. So maybe an abbreviated version, yeah, would be awesome. great. All right. So right about this time of year, shortly after the new fiscal year starts, Rodney and uh, our lovely public affairs support send out a notification to the public and to internal folks, all of our scientists across uh, BOEM. I apologize, I keep touching my nose because I'm about to sneeze, I'm trying not to. Uh, so that call goes out. And from here on out for the next couple of months, apologies. There we go. Uh, folks start developing ideas for studies for the next fiscal year. Those get put into what we call study profiles. And over the next probably two to three months, those study profiles are developed, refined, and then collected into what we call our studies development plan, right? This is the big wish list of what all of our uh, scientists, and I'm including all our analysts in those because they are scientists as well, what they see as their research needs. We spend another couple of months going through reviewing those, tightening them up, making sure that those profiles are as clear as they can be so that folks understand what those needs are. Then we go through a process working all the way through the studies coordinators and chiefs, the regional supervisors for environment or their equivalent, uh, up to the regional directors, and then up to the directorship of the agency refining that list based on the needs of each office and program to get to a list uh, roughly, hopefully by the end of the fiscal year of the things that are that there is consensus around as being, what are the research needs of the agency for the next fiscal year? What studies do we need to get started? And then those hopefully get signed by the end of the fiscal year by the director. And we start the process over again. It's about a nine month process, right? But it's pretty, it's it's step by step. There's lovely Gantt charts that John Lilly can, can show folks. Uh, but that's basically how it how that works. But it is a process. You start at the beginning. If you don't get it at the beginning, you're sort of not in. And you end up at the end with the national studies list. Now, of course, you can't dictate when a study need arises, right? So we have to have some process for how to get things funded and started uh, to identify those information needs outside of that process, All right? So is that, any questions on that? That's a very brief overview. I don't see any questions or any hands raised. So go right ahead, okay. Brad. All right. All right, so to start with, we all need to be on the same page of what is an environmental study and uh, we actually didn't have this until a couple of years ago, where we had a team, so a cross bone team that was put together to define what an environmental study was. And so what kicked off the need for this 
was these studies that were being funded outside of the ESP without awareness of the folks who are managing the ESP, right? That caused a couple of problems. Uh, it's not a great place or a great feeling when uh, you know the director or the deputy director calls Rodney or or me or or Yoko or Bill and says, "Hey, what's going on with this study?" And we say, "Well, that's not a bone study." And they send us a link, and it it is it's a bone study, uh, but it hasn't gone through the environmental studies program, uh, so it's conducted with operational funds, and we weren't notified of that. Obviously, that's a problem. We look silly, so uh, we put a team together cross bone team to define what is an environmental study uh, with the understanding that anything that met that criteria must go through the ESP processes and be tracked just as any other ESP study would be. With those things, these studies originating outside of this the process itself, uh, there is a cost sharing involved. Generally, when that comes up, the originating office of that need will find operational funds to uh, to pay for that. The Environmental Studies Program, uh, Division of Environmental Sciences, and OEP, will share roughly $5,000 to give that uh, what we call uh, an NSL number, National Studies List number, that also has it assigned. So and just instead of just having a, uh, a lead within the agency, which is our contracting officer's representative, uh, we also assign something called an Environmental Studies Program representative. And that gives you another SME to help you through that process, to help you with all of sort of the bureaucratic stuff of putting the study uh, package together, getting it through procurement, all that sort of fun stuff. Uh, but it also helps with the review of, review of everything from the uh, procurement package itself, the RFP or RFQ or the IA doc, interagency agreement documents, cooperative documents, cooperative agreement documents, contract documents, another set of eyes with an SME. Uh, and then that gets it into the ESP process writ large. So what is an environmental study for BOEM? Is any research effort, like if there's any, anything that meets that, like I said, meets that definition has to come through our processes and procedures. And so how do we define that? We define that as any oceanographic, ecological, biological, socioeconomic, or sociocultural research that, and this is where, you know, if I had a drum roll, I would do it but I don't. Collects data. And so this is where I am going to do what you should never do for a presentation, which is do a lot of reading of things on the slide. Uh, basically collecting new data, including baseline information, anything that helps you gain an, an improved understanding of what's going on, uh, not just of the areas themselves, but potentially impacted areas, right? Because the OCS LA, says we have to understand impacts to the human coastal and marine environment, right? So not just what's happening in that spot where the study is being done, but where the work that that study aims to understand its potential impacts, where those impacts could be felt. Monitoring, obviously monitoring is a big thing uh, that we do, environmental monitoring, new tools to monitor, all those kind of things. I'll leave that up for a second for folks to read and I will share this later. Anything collecting or synthesizing new data to inform NEPA analyses or consultations, right? So if we are, if we need to do sort of a, a real small effort, you know, in the you know fifty hundred thousand dollar effort to just like, hey, collect a little bit of information, synthesize it, put that together for our NEPA analyses or consultations. That is new information being gathered. That is an environmental study. Anything that develops or improves models to help us uh, with analyses, decision making, uh, technology development, things like that, uh, that help us collect better information, work more effectively, cheaply, all that fun kind of stuff. Uh, happy to talk about innovation at some other time as well. Uh, the efforts that would take information from environmental studies, share those with stakeholders, the public, get that information out there. Uh, if it is specifically talking about ESP research, and you want to go out and do that, uh, that's something that should be tracked by the ESP. Technical reports of new data information. Any socioeconomic efforts uh, used in NEPA 
or associated compliance should be tracked as well. Uh, and that includes some of the, the analyses for the national program or uh, similar analyses for specific projects. All right, so I'm gonna stop there for a second and ask if there are any questions about what is an environmental study for BOEM. Looking around the room, I don't see any tent cards up and no awesome. hands online. Go right that ahead. means I'm doing a great job. <laughs> I was going to tell myself anyway. All right, so now let's talk about things that aren't an environmental study, right? So this group that was put together didn't just talk about what is, right? But we didn't want there to be a black hole. Uh, and we didn't want to have to answer every, every sort of nuanced question. But like, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? So we said, all right, well, what isn't? You know, what, what can we definitively categorize as not an ESP study? So internally facing white papers for NEPA support, they're just, you know, hey, uh, we need someone to put together, you know, summarize these 10 papers so that someone can cite the summary instead, or basically not even cite the summary, understand what's in there, right? Just summary documents. Uh, renewable, sorry, resource evaluation studies and modeling uh, for uh, offshore uh, energy and sediment. Uh, E&D scenario work, so exploration and development scenarios are things that go into our economic analyses and other analyses for the national program. That doesn't count in here. We don't want to. We don't want to get involved in that. Uh, tools or applications designed to collect information from lessees. Right. We develop tools. We develop applications uh, for environmental purposes. Uh, but if it's just to take in information from the folks that we regulate, we don't. We don't need to be involved in that. General data management. Does the ESP pay for data management? Yes. It's just a data management thing. We don't need to get involved in that. Geologic sample storage, scoping for public meetings, general outreach, kind of stuff. We don't we don't need to be involved in that if it's not directly uh coming out of, of ESP work or directly related to ESP work. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other economic activity that the agency does that uh is handled through uh, a different office things like fiscal terms royalty rates auction formats uh, rias uh, other economic products that's not environmental that's we're, we're, we're happy to leave that sort of in the the realm of of the econ team they do a great job uh then it's a very well formed uh team across the bureau uh and uh, they, they keep each other well informed of what's going on so it's not a, a concern there all right, I'm actually going to drop back a second. Any questions on what isn't an ESP study? Yes. <laughs> Let's go. Two, you've got Jeremy and then Scott. Uh, yeah, what about studies that are done by developers? So, uh, you know, they may do a avian study. They may do a right whale study. They, they obviously do geophysical and geotechnical studies. Um, I, I take it those are, wouldn't be considered to be environmental studies, but they somehow get into the overall BOEM mix. So, uh, and then how do you integrate yeah. that knowledge into the wider environmental studies program? Okay. So so I, I would say those are environmental studies. Those are not BOEM environmental studies, right? So if we require them to do a study or if they do it voluntarily, uh, to meet some need that that BOEM has as a regulator, and we're going to take that information in uh, to to help us with with our analyses of those projects. Um, we don't really have a mechanism to dictate how they do that study, right? They're spending their money uh, to meet that need. Uh, we do not impose ourselves into that process, right? We do. We would want those to be obviously appropriately peer reviewed and reviewed before we take them in. We would review those and judge whether or not uh, those are adequate and appropriate for us to to use in our decision making processes. And that's up to the subject matter experts within the agency. Uh, but because we are not, uh, we're not funding that. We didn't come up with the idea for that study um we're not tracking that within the environmental studies program in terms of something that bohm has conducted 
and funded. How do you then decide whether, if that knowledge already may exist out there, how do you then incorporate that into your decisions on what to fund in the environmental studies program? I, I mean, if you don't know that it's out there, it seems that you can't incorporate it into your uh, decision-making on what the best to fund. Oh, I, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, we have to know that it's, that it's out there. And so th I have a whole, uh, I can, I can bust out my scientific integrity slides uh, if we want later. Um, the integrity of our decisions as an agency depends on sort of the integrity of everything from uh, the data and information that we use and the staff that we have and their professionalism, uh, their scientific integrity, their how up-to-date are they in their field, all those things, right? So that is something that we really push uh, through the Department of the Interior Scientific Integrity Policy that our staff at all levels, especially our analysts, really need to be engaged in their field as subject matter experts. They need to know the research that is out there uh, for the types of things that you are, are talking about. And generally, those are things that the folks who are uh, writing those NEPA analyses, those consultations, um, they're very aware of that work that is going on. If it's something that uh, and uh, anyone else, Bill or anyone else can jump in, if it is something that is being done as sort of a condition of a lease or something like that, um, we're not just going to take that blindly. We're going to review that, make sure it meets uh, meets our information and quality needs. But but does the environmental studies program staff have knowledge of those studies that are done in the leasing area? Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And the, the idea is that uh, really what we're talking about here, Jeremy, is just within BOEM and in the environmental studies program, studying the human, marine, and coastal environment and spending our $30 million. Now, anytime an analyst is proposing a new study, anytime a scientist is doing a section of a NEPA document, as a good scientist, you consider everything that's out there. You talk to everybody. You consider all the literature. You consider dissertations. You consider any kind of information analysis you come up with. What we're talking yeah. about here is tracking within BOEM uh, and our agency. This has nothing to do – I mean, we're not trying to define an environmental study for the world. We're trying to define what an environmental study is within our process. So, yeah. uh, you know – yeah, of course, we would look at those broader broader things. Yeah, and if I could jump in, this this ties back to the feedback loop study that, that Jake and, and IEC talked about, right? So uh, those analyses, those, those NEPA analyses, environmental analyses, cite hundreds to thousands of, of documents, right? And comparatively, a, a small number of those are ESP documents, right? Things that we have identified, a research gap, funded it through the ESP, gotten that final report and incorporated that in, right? And the reason for that is that we're not looking to recreate the wheel every time we do an analysis, right? So our, as Rodney was saying, uh, our folks, you know, the expectation is that, that our folks are gonna know what is out there. What is the state of that science and where those research gaps are? And if there is a gap there that no one else is filling, that's that's what we're gonna fund. Right. We're going to fill those gaps and in information needs that our analysts have. We're not just going to do research for research's sake. If it's already been done, if it's already out there, the expectation is that, that that's going to be to be brought in. And we're going to fill in the gaps through the ESP. I, I so just, the, and oh, I, I, and no, and Jeremy, <clears throat> thanks for the comment. I would also add that uh, the COSESH has been very helpful in developing, there were seven criteria that are part of our decision-making framework, and one of them, one of the criterion, is the, you know, the, the need to know this that information that's not otherwise available. So it's mm -hmm. right there as a criterion. It's an important point. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, the environmental studies program is is a resource and a tool for BOEM analysts and BOEM scientists. Right? If you don't have the information you need, if it's not out there, if no one else is doing it. This is your tool. We provide that service to help you get that information, right? 
Pat? All right, there's another question. Yeah, I, so I have a question. Uh, this is a very helpful t talk, by the way. Uh, so uh, I'm thinking about studies that uh, were modeling specifically for the evaluation of resource potential for the OCS energy and sed sedimentary in inventories. I'm, yeah. I'm wondering how things that come up that might pertain to the uh, potential impacts of geohazards and or climate uh, event impacts. Uh, and I'll give you a specific example, a study uh, BOM report 2020 slash or dash 040 potential earthquake landslide tsunami and geohazards for the Pacific offshore or, or US Pacific US offshore Pacific wind farms. I think it's the only study you've done on that. It has it's relevant not just for the geohazards, but also for hazards associated more generally uh, and issues re related to floating wind. Um, is that in your inventory? Uh, of, yeah, so, so that would be in the inventory. So as long as it, so if it's the impact of those events on okay. the work that we're doing, that's uh, interesting. That would be there. If it is just solely resource evaluation, right? What is the potential? What okay. is the energy potential of this area? How much sand is in this area okay. that meets uh, the criteria for whatever thing that uh, the resource evaluation about, is not? Definitely about impacts, you know, yeah. lives at risk, assets at risk. Yes. Um, this was funded, I think, by ORP or, or yeah, uh, renewable energy. So that, that it wouldn't be funded by you. It wouldn't wouldn't have been funded by you. I think it was funded by even, but it would appear on your. You you'd be tracking it though, right? It's funded by others. I yeah, I can check to, on that one specifically, but I that is something that should be tracked. That I would love yeah. it if you do that. That was not funded directly by EFP. I don't think it was. Fun. And whether we're tracking it or not, I don't. No, uh, I would but, like to uh, know the answer to that. But that, I don't know if we did a that cost share on that or not. I'd I would be look. much appreciative. This is a study I've referred to several times, and I've, I'm frustrated that I, 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 I don't know more about it. So <laughs> what is that? What is that? What is that number again? Huh? What is uh, that number again? 20, 2020 040. And I understand there is an update that was supposedly done, but it was too secure for me to get access to when last time I asked. So I'm, I'm intrigued about that one. Well, the, again, this is one reason we're doing this process because we're not because that was funded outside of the yeah, environmental I, I, studies yeah, program. Okay. That's why I would have heard thought if it was from you guys. We would have it would have gone through the study development plan, and you would have seen it yeah. if it right. had been. Yeah, and so and so so that's one of those things, right? So the reason one of the reasons we were tasked with putting this group together to to try to figure that out is that if it, it. if it's an unknown unknown, like if if the ESP is not informed that this study is happening, we don't know about it, right? That's an unknown unknown to us. And that's that's not great. That's not a great look, right? Thank you. Thanks, Brad. All right. So, um, what I'm going to go to next is uh, really bureaucratic minutia, but it's really just there to kick off a conversation. Uh, so, again, we have this sort of nine to, to ten month process to go from the inception of a study idea to getting the national studies list signed. And then obviously we go into the procurement process for those things. What happens if something comes up outside of that process? What happens if say a governor calls and says, hey, uh, my you know, office of uh, natural resources has you know, $200,000 to do a study on this. It's not quite enough to do what we want, Boom, can you, you know, can you partner with us? Uh, when NOAA invariably calls somebody in the third quarter uh and say hey we got all this money we need to spend uh can we partner on this type of of study uh how do we handle that is there a process for that and there is a process for that and it's very dry and bureaucratic and we have you know a 300 page uh procedural desk reference uh that everybody hates because it's 300 pages long but the reality is most of the time when you need something from that it's only you know a couple of paragraphs long Right. So it is really, it is a pretty simple process to add a study to the national studies list. Right. So if you have a need and there's funding available, either through uh, what we lovingly call our PQA or Program Quality Assurance. Uh, so whenever we, whenever we have our ESP budget, we hold back a certain amount for things like cost overruns uh, or these sort of late you know, late in the year or unexpected uh, study needs that come up at some point in the year. Uh, so we can we can do that, or you can use programmatic funds as well, and then you have that 
you know, that $5,000 cost share. But it's a pretty simple process. We can do this in a couple of days and then get it moving. Uh, and what this does is that assigns uh, an ESP representative, right? That second person that we talked about, that second SME to help you through that process. And then it kicks it into all of our processes that track all of your you know, process deliverables, interim deliverables, final deliverables, data deliverables, all that kind of stuff. Um, so this is the process to do that. And anything this, that meets that definition that we talked about earlier of the environmental studies program study, environmental study, needs to be conducted through the ESP if you want to fund it with your own money from some other office or program. Here's how we do that. Uh, there's a bigger question that I think that you all are interested in. It's not so much, you know, who sends the email to who kind of thing like we have on the page right now. But generally speaking, how as an agency do we coordinate those needs? Uh, and there are a couple of ways that, that we do that. Um, obviously, regular communication between, you know, from Rodney, myself, Yoko, uh, the studies chiefs in, in headquarter OEP to our uh, our colleagues in all our regions and programs. So we know when these needs are arising, when they're coming up, uh, so we can you know plan for them as, as well as we can, or at least be aware of them. Uh, we have monthly meetings with all of the studies chiefs and coordinators as well uh, to talk about emerging issues, things like that. Uh, staff to staff communications. Uh, we have communities of practices within the agency. So we do have all of those, those things. And again, you know, we, we are a small agency. Um, so I'm going to take this off the screen because it's boring. Um, but so that's the big picture uh, and really just sets the stage for whatever conversations you all want to have about this issue. Coordination of research across the agency. Brad, thank you so much. I think it's really valuable that we have these uh, discussions periodically. Um, and it certainly, <clears throat> I think, helped clarify a lot of things that were buzzing around in the committee conversations. Um, just to sort of summarize what I think I heard and sort of the, the big picture um, while I wait for hands to go up, it sounds to me like there's a recognition that study needs may arise outside of the regular SDP yeah. process, whereby you do the call, you solicit the profiles, there's an internal review process, it gets on our radar, it gets mm -hmm. into the SDP, and um, eventually onto the national studies list. And that you all would consider it sort of going through the SDP process, um, even if sort of in a abbreviated fashion, so long as you all are um, <clears throat> notified and then that the whomever it is that's initiating the study is willing to go through those steps that you have in the desk uh, reference. So, so that- uh, Yeah, so, so just to right clarify, there. right? So if you have, so, so say you are, you know, in the Pacific region, uh, and you have a research need that comes up. When you identify that and bring that to us, that doesn't kick off a nine month process, start to finish, right? What that does is that says, hey, I have a research need. It needs to be tracked through the environmental studies program, right? And there are, there are requirements for that, right? So we need to have a cost sharing. We need to assign an ESP representative uh, and then all of the requisitions and sort of business side of that are then conducted through and tracked by the ESP, right? So that, so you can kick that off. I mean, I've seen it happen, you know, within a couple of weeks going from our notification to getting it added to the NSL to being down into procurement and awarded. So that um, that is consistent with with what I was trying to articulate, I guess. My question that arises is, um, and you, you're highlighting how quickly that can be done further um, enforces my question, I guess, which is what, what criteria, how, how or are the seven criteria that are in 
uh, the, the studies development plan, how are those applied or how are other criteria and metrics applied in terms of determining whether or not, even in the cost sharing model, it is a good investment of BOEM's funds to move forward with that study? Uh, so realistically, most of those things, so when we're, when we're talking about these types of things, you have had, you know, basically at the uh, regional director level or program director level saying, we've looked at this, we need this. And that can be for a whole host of reasons from, you know, so either, you know, I talked about the state saying like, hey, we have money, we want to do this to, hey, uh, you know, something just went sideways. You know, there is now litigation risk unless we fill this data gap. All right, now let's go ahead and do this. Um, there can be a whole host of reasons as to why someone would come to us. But generally, if they're coming to the ESP to say that they need it, that legitimate business case has already been made for Excellent. needing to have that study. And we're not gonna we're not gonna fight you on that, right? Like we're not gonna say, all right, well, let's go back through and like, no, you've already gone through your process, you've identified the funds, you've said this is necessary for XYZ. You know, we're going to provide that service to you. So essentially, Stacey, it would be the same criteria because you have, you have the need yep. to know and it would go through those same criteria if it's an environmental study. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. We don't fund fair market value macroeconomic studies for the economics division. Understood. It's not an environmental study. Yeah. Scott, is your, t is your turn? No, right no, I'm currently? sorry. It, it's okay. left over. Are there any other uh, folks on the line that had questions? All right. Uh, we had on the, oh, I'm sorry, Bill, go right ahead, please. Well, actually, I had a, a comment on the previous point, the previous uh, presentation, and something Professor Underhill was saying that that I thought might be useful for people to uh, be aware of. And, and Professor Underhill uh, uh, said, if, if I, I believe, that there's a, a binding requirement to in the United Kingdom for uh, zero carbon emissions by net emit by 2050. And and then we talked about the complexity of the system there and and the uh, and the Bohm situation, I think, was was laid out in a way that people might think is uh, much simpler in the sense that, yeah, oh, well, then this is the point we it's indeed we you know, we do regulate these all these things that were mentioned. And so it it is it is simpler in that the leasing you know, uh, uh, authority is with BOEM. but for example, for for oil and gas, uh, actually let me step back. Al although although the president of the United States uh, has has set the the goal of zero net, and we've we've let the Paris Agreement parties know that's our objective, we're still constrained by the different statutes, the different agencies, and. So for oil and gas, there's the five-year program, and there are these eight balancing uh, uh, considerations, one of which is environmental. And, and someone could argue that because of climate, the environmental uh, per, uh, necessity is such that uh, you know you have to like set up a system to get to zero net. But no one has really, no one has really uh, uh, advanced that in a significant way for us. And what, what we did and what we ended up doing in the five-year program document was just noting what it would take. So there's an analysis in the document about what it would take to get to 0. 050. But uh, but the, man, the basic mandate is to make the continental shelf available for development subject to environmental safeguards with those. So, 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 we, uh, I think, I think it would be safe to say that uh, that Boehm or really the Interior Department of the administration is not not comfortable, or certainly not the way it's proceeding now, uh, to to, uh, to treat zero net by 2050 as the regulatory objective of the oil and gas uh, program. Um, and then the other thing that complicates it that I think you're aware of is that uh, the the uh, Current legislation requires a uh, an oil and gas lease sale covering at least sixty million acres, at least at, at least that to occur in the year before any off offshore wind lease sale. So there's 
call it a poison pill or which. So, so I, I guess the point I'm trying to make to maybe it's some of the other the folks that were commenting is, you know, we have uh, we have a lot of complications too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We, I want to just take a moment to thank Brad for his presentation. I don't see, Rod, is your question for Brad? Yeah. Okay, well then we'll continue that conversation and I'll turn to you next. Quick question, Brad. So I think you said that the monies for um, research needs studies, environmental studies, sat in something called the PQA. Is that, did I get that right? So we have, so we have, so well, let's just do a little hypothetical here. Uh, so say on a good year lately, we get $35 million for ESP research, right? And just and that's all for that extramarital research that the agency does. Uh, we will hold back somewhere between probably five hundred dollars to $750,000 and not assign those to studies. Uh, and basically hold that back because we know we're going to have cost overruns. We know somebody's going to want to do uh, an, uh, you know, an optional part of a study. Um, we may have these, these off cycle needs that we're talking about. Uh, so we want to make sure that we have some funding available to cover those unknown needs, right? So we don't want to spend all, you know, $35 million dollars right at the beginning of the year and not have any money left over for any of those sort of contingencies. Okay. And that money sits centrally or Correct. does that money? Okay. All right. That, All that the answer... money is central. Yeah. So I was, that was really my question. I was trying to get a sense of how many dollars we're talking about and where it was sitting. Okay. Yeah, Thank it's, you. it's, it's been 500 and 750 usually. And the entire environmental studies program budget is managed centrally by uh, DES, right? By Rodney's group right so we manage that we control those funds and rod there's not there's not a line item from congress for the environmental studies program there's a an item which is environmental program so it includes assessment etc but but there is a mandate in the outer continental shelf lands like that there be an environmental studies program to understand the impacts of energy mineral development on the human coastal marine environment blah blah, blah. so if the agency goes away well you know the ESP will live on in some shape or form. We'll still have a job. I don't know about the rest of the folks. <laughs> Less? Yeah, Brad, I know I know that there's good reason that up until now everything's been oriented toward permitting. But um I know I sound like a broken record on this, but uh, is there a way is there a plan for a pot of funds? to just learn everything we can from the installations that are going out there so that there is an opportunity for learning and adaptation. So so I, I would respectfully challenge that a little bit, right? So we had that conversation yesterday about, you know, uh, not all of BOEM studies get cited in these environmental documents, right? These things that go toward toward permitting, right? And that makes sense to me. The environmental studies program doesn't just support leasing, right? It doesn't just support of course, of course not, doing yeah. EISs, EAs. It supports consultation processes. Uh, it supports, uh, you know, just the agency writ large, you know, trying to protect us against litigation, doing certain things like that. So there, there are a whole bunch of things that are not environmental analyses that are not directly related to permitting that the ESP funds science to help inform those processes. Um, so there's not, we don't apportion. So if you look at uh, um, sort of that, that specific issue of sort of monitoring installations, I mean, we don't say, you know, 25% of our budget is going to go toward that. Do we wanna make sure that that's a part of our portfolio? <laughs> yes. Um, but at the end of the day, the folks of us sitting, and I'm, I'm speaking about this in terms of the folks sitting in, in, uh, OEP, right? So the folks sort of managing that, that central program, um, we try to be agnostic about 
what those funds go towards, right? So we have regions and programs. We have the folks who are doing the operations. We have folks who are doing the consultations. We have folks who are working with the states, with the tribes, uh, doing all of the all of the work, right? So when we were reorganized a bunch of years ago, the environmental studies program was pulled out of the operational side of, of BOEM, right? We used to report through the leasing program. We got pulled out and put into our own place, right? So we don't have to report through that. Yes, we look across. Rodney looks across, you know, and that's one of his the things that he does. And Bill looks across. We used to make sure that we have sort of that balanced portfolio of things, right? And that those are the conversations that happen at the higher levels of the agency as we're going through trying to get consensus all the way from the study chiefs to the director, you know, going through that process uh, through the regional directors, regional leadership, program leadership, up to the director. Yeah, Brent, uh, Brent I, if I can interrupt just quickly, yeah. I think I think Bohm is doing a great job on the balance. I, I don't think that's the issue. Well, thank you. I think the issue is, I think the issue is that Bohm doesn't have enough money. And oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I... I <laughs> I would I would agree with that right. So and so they showed the the uh, the graph the other day, right? So that was the nominal level of funding for the environmental studies program from its inception. First year we were fully funded was I believe nineteen seventy three. We had roughly thirty two million dollars. In twenty twenty three we have roughly thirty two million dollars. <laughs> okay, so just to keep pace with inflation, and I've done it, and I've had my economists check me on my math. We should have somewhere between like one hundred and fifty and one hundred and twenty million dollars just to keep right. pace for inflation. We don't have that. So is there a way to run this up the flagpole? It's probably not the job of this committee. I'm not sure, but I, I would say. Uh, it's really, yeah, but Stacey's going, no, no. <laughs> well, I, yeah, you know, we, uh, we certainly can't do that, right? So we certainly well. <laughs> can't do that, right? So we can't go to BOEM as an agency or us as the environmental studies program folks. We can't go to Congress and say, hey, give us more money. Uh, could we do a better job of informing appropriators what we're doing, the importance of our work? You know how we are being, you know, fiscally responsible with what we have and the great work that we're getting from. Absolutely, we could do we could do more of that. We could be better about that. Uh, and that I believe that is in talking with uh, some of our congressional folks and public affairs folks that they have plans for that. But again, remember we're a small agency. Uh, guess how many people we have in our congressional affairs shop? Two. Right, it's better than one. But when you only have two, that makes you more sort of responsive. So, um, thanks. I'd love more money, but yeah. So if you have some less, we'll take it. Uh, I'm going to go to Jim and then to Rodney. Okay, this will be really quick, just a real world example. Uh, I don't have all the details. Ari's sitting in the back. She can keep me honest. But at one time, I sat in the studies chief job in the Gulf. Then I sat in Rodney's chair and a similar chair to Bill, kind of similar, not exactly the same. Now I'm the regional director for the Gulf. For example, the end of the year comes up. There's money left. I get approached by Ari and the studies folks and say, we have a study that's ending. But wait a minute, we could really use one more season of data collection with these cruises. They're expensive and it's an critical area. And so literally I say, that's where we're putting money. I give uh, Ari the thumbs up. Ari and her, her team contacts Rodney and Brad. And magically, I've got 700,000 K to keep a study going for a year or so to get more information. It's an ESP study, mm -hmm. but we had leftover operational funds to get another year of incredibly valuable data. Because if we had to go out and recompete it and line things up again, we couldn't afford it. Yeah. So yeah. the program has got a lot of flexibility and it's very nimble. In fact, I was at one meeting at the other NAS building and the chair of the Ocean Studies Board pointed at one of our sister agencies and said, you ought to do it like Bohm does it because they're flexible and nimble. And so it's really a good process. And with the regions working with our headquarters office, we make sure the money is spent in the right place. And occasionally we do get a few extra dollars of operational funds that we can supplement an environmental study. And get really a lot of bang for our bucks. Did I say that right, Ari, for your study? Okay. Yeah, and that's and that and that's another pathway, and that's even more simpler than adding a study to the NSL, right? That's just a cost increase request. Hey, we want to put some more money on this. Here's what we want to spend it on. We're getting good results. We sort of look at what we've, you know, the the, the SME in charge of it. 
agrees. Yeah, we're getting good results. We need more. We need another season. Great. Let's do it. Perfect. That takes days. That can take place in just a couple of days to get that moving. But I mean, that can, yeah. I mean, the adding the study can take, you know, hours. And then it's just the the procurement piece to extend the uh extend the completion date of the project. Rodney. Yeah, there's one more thing I wanted to make the committee aware of, and I'm not sure you are. Uh, perhaps you are. Uh, ESP has contribution authority. Uh, that means we can take in funds from the private sector, um, like a developer. We've used it in the past and cost shared with companies like Shell, for example, uh, in, in the Arctic to do various types of science. Uh, there's usually been in the past a one-off study, like would be in our study development plan. We conduct the study, we get the final report, the data done. Um, the contemplation now, and it kind of goes back to what Les was saying earlier, and one thing that keeps me up at night <laughs> is long-term monitoring, how we're going to monitor over the lifetime of, of projects and really understand cumulative effects uh, in the Atlantic, in the Gulf, in the Pacific in the Arctic, in the territories, among all the activities that we oversee. So one area we're exploring and the possibility um, is using our contribution authority, looking at what's required uh, you know, uh, for a company in their, for example, for offshore wind in their construction op operation plan. Um, let me give you an example of this passive acoustic monitoring. A company uh, need to, needs to do that passive acoustic monitoring as part of their requirement. Uh, the environmental studies program could work with them uh, and use some of our uh, uh, our appropriated funding to leverage that. Uh, the reason we're looking at passive acoustic monitoring and, that, and why that's a good example is because we did get, I believe it was six million from the IRA uh, to construct or, or begin the construction of, a, of an array in the Atlantic for passive acoustic monitoring. So it's enticing, I think. Uh, for developers to actually add to that broader regional array, which one could build it more on the basis of science rather than uh, you know arbitrary lease lines, I think. So the contribution authority, I know this is quite a bit to think about, but the contribution authority is a uh, an avenue um, to, you know to pursue in in the future that again could perhaps get us a little bit closer to uh, the longer term monitoring and really create, again, kind of what uh, I think Les said earlier as, as well. I mean, I, I see this as, you know, where we could really create with each array or even with each turbine or with each activity, even if we see if it's carbon sequestration or um, various other green hydrogen. Uh, I mean, I think we could create uh, laboratories for learning, you know, across the outer continental shelf. Um, you know, if again, if, if those are kind of uh, uh, requirements anyway that a developer must do. And now it's not going to be across the board, right? Um, but, you know, I think where possible, the Environmental Studies Program could uh, work with that contribution authority to actually enhance that monitoring. Something to think about. I haven't really done it yet. Like I said, in the past, it's been kind of a one off, but I did want to sh share that with the committee um, before we talk about it too much publicly. So. Thanks. Thank you all. We are a couple minutes past the hour, but I want to um, still take a few moments just to um, share some closing remarks and give our uh, co-chairs an opportunity for any final thoughts as well. Um, and before I turn it over to them, uh, while we still have folks in the room, my primary closing remark, in addition to thanking, of course, all of the contributors to this meeting over the last two days, um, the primary thing that I really want to communicate is my personal gratitude to our outgoing members. We have five folks that are rotating off of our committee at the end of this calendar year for whom this is their last meeting. Um, three in the room with us, Carrie, Scott, Rod, your contributions to this committee um, are, are uh, you know, have been remarkable over the last several years and um, your dedication of time, thoughtfulness, um, it has not gone unnoticed. And on top of it all, you all serve as volunteers, which is so, so greatly appreciated. 
Um, and the two others that will be rotating off that are not on the line currently, Susan Parks, who has really, um, she has been our point person on all things marine mammals for the on behalf of the committee. Um, and Mary Louise Timmermans, uh, we owe her a congratulations in addition to our gratitude. She's taken a new position at her university, uh, which requires that she rotate off of the committee. Um, but again, I just wanna take a moment to sincerely thank each of you and to recognize that some of you, Rod, um, have not only served BOEM through COSA, but through the FACA committee um, and uh, it, for as a representative of a pretty narrow field, um, and I think you have served them well. Scott, you served as a liaison before joining as a member and becoming a chair, um, and your willingness to still join the committee after having been a liaison, I think it's is tough, is quite remarkable. Um, and and Carrie, you have um, constantly provided us the the human dimension and social. Mm -hmm reminders that I think uh, this committee and BOEM have, have really benefited from. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to Scott and Rod. Um, I'm going to go first. I'm going to go first. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, and I want to thank everybody for their participation in this meeting. I thought it was, we had another good day. So I thought yesterday was a good day. Today was a very good day too. Some, a lot of food for thought. I, I want to thank our invited guests. You really made major contributions and I, I and I hope we can continue to to build on uh, uh, on the relationships we started today. Um, so this is my swan song. I'm out of here after this. Um, I've been working in the OCS for 42 years, uh, working with first with MMS folks and then with BOEM. When I came in, uh, it was a time of huge challenge. Uh, we were in the oil crisis. The mandate, the charge to all of us was go find some more energy for the United States, strategic imperative. And I had the pleasure to, to do that for 32 years with Shell, uh, work, working closely with, with not only the folks at Bone, but the, their predecessors at MMS. Many of those pictures you showed today, Jim, of installations in the Gulf of Mexico, they were projects I was involved in and my, and my teams, and I'm uh, very proud of that effort. But now we face another big challenge. It's not go find oil, let's get ready for the energy transition. And once again, Boehm, you're going to have to uh, dive back in. It's a huge challenge, not just for, for you, but for all the folks who work in the various uh, industries uh, and, and, the, and the academic groups that, the, that train our people and support us. Uh, making that transition is no small uh, challenge. I I think there may be, in the course of the day's sessions here, I think I want to highlight three areas where I, I thought there might be opportunities for National Academy, we're here to help, to, uh, you know, through COSA and or other efforts to try to assist Bowman in meeting some of these challenges. The first um, is in the area, well, first of all, let me come, go to the, uh, 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 the area of uh, CCS, uh, it's a new frontier for you. It's a new frontier for everybody. We are not, not in the lead on this. So there's lear lessons to be learned from our friends across the Atlantic uh, and uh, I, I, particularly for offshore operations. I think we, we should avail ourselves of that opportunity. I would encourage that there be uh, some efforts to, to try to have a workshop or a, a study of some sort but probably including also our friends in the National Academy of Engineering um, to, to, to look at the challenges and opportunities around offshore CCS to do it right. It's, it's a big uh, challenge in, in sorting out the difference between putting uh, CO2 in depleted fields versus putting them in saline aquifers. The resource potential difference between the two is huge. And I, I think we wanna make sure we get that right. I do really believe uh, the U.S. could be the Saudi Arabia of, of uh, uh, for um, uh, CCS if we if we get our heads around it and, and tackle it appropriately. But that's an opportunity. Another one is in offshore wind, particularly floating wind. So uh, we didn't get to hear uh, everything that uh, Jim shared in his uh, or uh, John, Dr. Underhill shared in his. Uh, in his paper that we, we looked at, but uh, uh, they've done a quite a bit of work looking at comparing 
uh, economics around things like uh, fixed platforms and floating wind in the North Sea, where they've got a lot more experience than we do. Uh, they've got installations they're putting out there. I think it would be very useful to, to learn more about what they have learned so far to bring it to bear on our side of the Atlantic. A very significant part of our resource potential in wind is tied up with floating wind. Essentially, everything on the on the Pacific coast and, and some of the most prospective areas on the Atlantic coast uh, are going to require floating uh, technology. I think we need to understand uh, not only the economics, but some of the risks associated with it. And this brings me to another study area that I think would be uh, where I think the Academy could help you. I would encourage you to avail yourself of the Academy to help you redo the report that I talked about to to, uh, to Brad. I, I think it needs uh, it needs a, a third party look uh, from the from the the experts to look at the uh, geohazards associated with floating wind. Uh, particularly that's going to be relevant on the Pacific coast because we have seismic hazards, but it's not without some risk in other places like the Caribbean, if you want to put it there. Um, so that's that's another one. And the last thing I'd like to uh, identify, and we talked about this is the subject of much of today's discussion, is this whole area of marine spatial planning and trying to come up with uh, some approach to handle the, the, the trade-offs. You, you know, you you're the ones who are going to have to deal with the trade-offs, and we really need to get it right. And and I think, uh, uh, you know, we, I'm not sure necessarily the first one there is, is is should be the one we put everything on. I'm not sure that's that may necessarily be the right answer everywhere. So I think a systematic approach to how we're going to um, s sort through that going forward, particularly with all your program programs that, as as Dr. Underhill talked about, compete for the same space of ocean uh, and many of them you can't put the same thing can't put more than one of them in the same place it's going to be important that we we figure out how to tackle that systematically i think the academy can help you there i think this group can help you there so i hope you'll take advantage of that resource so uh best wishes and and rest fellow fellow committee members i i, I wish you all the best and, and we you welcome a, you back anytime <laughs> Go ahead, Rod. and please have a chocolate <laughs> Um, I think I would echo everything that Scott said. Um, the last couple of days have been um, extremely interesting. Um, we covered a huge amount of territory. The um, They've been ex uh, very, very productive. Um, and so I'm grateful to everybody for, for, for contributing to that. Scott and I were keen to promote a model in which we thought about different ways of engaging with BOA, different mechanisms that the National Academies and this committee has of engaging with BOA. Um, I would encourage everybody to continue to think outside the box and different ways in which um, that exchange can take place, whether it's uh, individual COSA members working with yeah. SMEs to provide advice, to workshops with future National Academy studies. I think all of those things are good, and I think we're seeing some of the of the fruits of those different kinds of ways of thinking and engagement. I think we're also seeing um, a model in which it's less a case of Boehm reporting out to us on things and more of an exchange of information and thinking about ways that COSA can be um, very can be more more useful because that's the objective of the committee. Um, as uh, Stacy pointed out, I've been involved with Bone for a long time. When I first started, I had different colored hair. And Rodney had a different colored beard. Um, and when I first met Bill and Susan, it was at a FACA meeting where you came and said, we're going to do this in a different way. And I think that decision that you made at that time has been both useful and fruitful for BOEM. I've had experience of both, and there were certainly great things that happened at the FACA, but I think that it's clear that this has been a useful partnership and a good decision, um, and it's been fruitful for BOEM. I would like to, um, I guess, thank, as I step aside from, from this committee, I'd like to thank um, the leadership of BOEM and also um, all of the SMEs that have come and um, uh, presented to us and all the, and the knowledge and the hard work that they've done. And, and, and that work is, is a lot. They take on a lot of work um, and... Uh, and I'm continually impressed with, with that work that, that they do. Um, the National Academies, um, 
have done a tremendous job. Stacy and Jonathan and Eric and Susan and Deb, and there's been others as well. So I'd like to thank all of those folks. Um, all of the fellow COSA members in the room, on the line, and previous ones, um, uh, I've learned a, a tremendous <clears throat> amount from you all. Scott, you've had um, uh, an ending amount of energy for for doing work for mm -hmm. for COSA. And, uh, uh, and Carrie, I've enjoyed the conversations we have. We're kind of fighting our corner sometimes. So, um, and all the outside experts, um, the capacity for the National Academies to draw people in and draw expertise in is tremendously um, useful for Boehm. Um, and so thank you all for that. Um, and the, I think that there have been um, real improvements um, I think the relationships with the tribes are never going to be perfect, but there have been tremendous improvements in the relationship with the tribes, um, environmental justice communities, outreach, and I think all of those things um, I've seen in the time that I've been involved. So thank you, everybody. Um, it has been a, a pleasure to work with you all, and good luck in the future. You know, and I just would... Uh... I'd I'd like to join Stacy in in uh, in in thanking uh, uh, Scott, Rod, the other Carrie, and the other departing members. Um, uh, you do this for free, and uh, you don't have to do it. And and uh, it's I mean I think your contributions have been incredibly helpful. And uh, don't you know? Don't forget us. Just you know we can. We could we could still benefit from your advice, but um, and I and I and I think I don't, I, th I really think I agree with you. Of course, I'm biased. I like this committee, but uh, you know, I think I think in in good part because of the contributions of the outgoing members, and don't go anyone else. Don't don't leave the place uh, until you have to. Uh, but I'm confident that you've greatly strengthened uh, this small agency. And, uh, you know, a lot of it, I, I've always thought from the beginning, actually, that the, 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 there were two reasons for Baum to have an, the National Academy as an advisor. One of them is sort of the substantive technical uh, uh, advice, which has gotten gotten better and better over time kind of like what you were saying rod i mean we're really in the groove now but the other is for the agency to be prepared to expose itself to you openly in a you know get on the mics recorded the world looking in whatever and uh and that's been very valuable too and it's i mean and and i, I appreciate all the tough questions that have come our way uh, you know, and I, Rona was definitely homed in on a couple things today, and I thought she was right on the point. So, uh, uh, so anyway, but thank you very much for your time. You didn't have to do it, and it's it's very helpful. Thanks, Bill. With that, I will adjourn our open session.